And so it begins. <sighs> wow. Here we are, 10 years in the making. It's been 10 years since I first wanted to do this. Here we go. This is an idea that I had originally come up with all the way back in 2013 when I had quote unquote rediscovered the Powerpuff Girls after having forgotten about it for nearly a decade. Powerpuff Girls is a series that I've been attached to since I was maybe three or definitely four years old, and I've been a fan of it for most of my life. It is my personal favorite animated series of all time and is in my top three favorite media franchises of all time as well. It is a cartoon that speaks to me on a level that no other animated series ever has. It's got perfect action, hilarious comedy, endearing characters, charismatic villains, stellar writing, impressive animation techniques, and a next level outpouring of effort that I haven't seen in any other show. Now, I realize that not everybody sees what I see in it, but that's that's sort of the purpose of this video series. My ultimate goal here is to bring a newfound appreciation, a new level of recognition for all of the amazing and incredible things that this cartoon achieved when it was in its prime on Cartoon Network back in the late 90s and early 2000s. Speaking of, my interest in the Powerpuff Girls was first sparked somewhere in between 1999 and the year 2000. I couldn't tell you exactly when, unfortunately, but I know it was prior to when my parents and I had moved from my first house to my second in 2002. I was still in preschool at the time and was into a few different things, mostly. Sonic, Legos, Humongous Entertainment, Disney movies, Hot Wheels, and quickly following all of that, Cartoon Network. I still remember vividly my first time watching a non-PBS cartoon on live television. Somewhere in the middle of the night or early morning, I couldn't sleep. So I went to my parents' room where they turned the TV on and stumbled upon Nickelodeon, which is where I distinctly remember seeing an advertisement for Two Angry Beavers. I never watched the show, just saw a commercial for it. The new season of Angry Beavers is here. It's a whole batch of brand new adventures with those two, 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 the Nicktoons. Yep, that was my first exposure to the Big Three Kid Networks. Probably not the story you were expecting to hear, but there's more to it. Despite Two Angry Beavers being the first thing I had ever seen, the clearest memory I have of that moment was when they flipped on Cartoon Network. I don't remember what show was playing, and I really wish I could, but I do remember one thing, the vanity plate that came after. This exact clip, right here. I remember it crystal clear, playing in my parents' bedroom in the middle of the night on our small 10-inch cube of a television that we had back then. The following morning, I woke up and my first thing I said was, I want to watch Cartoon Network again. So my parents took me out to the living room and of all shows, I kid you not, it was the 1983 Alvin and the Chipmunks cartoon. I remember nothing more of that day or morning, anything I watched, but this specific shot right here from the intro of them playing baseball has never left my brain. Even though I can't remember a single thing that happened in the two episodes I probably ever watched of it. Anyways, tangent aside, that's how I started watching Cartoon Network. Pretty soon I discovered Dexter's Lab, and that show in particular I really latched onto. Later came other shows like Courage the Cowardly Dog and Ed and Nettie, and most importantly, as it is the subject of this video, the Powerpuff Girls. The first time I saw the Powerpuff Girls was in my grandparents' house when I was staying there one time for a number of days. I don't remember exactly when or how I ended up watching the show while I was there, but one way or another I found myself in their bedroom watching Cartoon Network on their mini TV because my grandfather would always be watching western movies downstairs on the main television set and those never really interested me as a kid. Long story short, Powerpuff Girls was on at that time, which exposed me to my very first episode of the series which just so happens to be a season one episode I'll be covering in this video. I'm curious what people's guesses might be as to what episode it is, but I'll be revealing that answer when we get to it in particular, so no need to worry if you're curious, I'll reveal the answer in time. I'll probably tell more stories about my history with the show in future seasonal reviews as well, that way I don't front load this one, because I don't want to spend too much time on this and just get to the point. This video is the first of several in which I will be reviewing every single episode of the Powerpuff Girls season by season in explicit detail until I've reviewed them 
all. Some of you may be familiar with my format from videos such as when I reviewed every Spongebob video game or backyard sports video game, which I recommend you also check out at some point because I put a lot of work into those videos as well. That being said, there aren't too many rules I need to go over with this one, seeing as I'm just going to be reviewing every single episode of the show's first season in the order that they premiered for the first time. This means that Monkey See Doggy Do is the first episode I'm covering, and I'll get more into the significance of that decision here in a moment. I do, however, However, want to quickly address a lot of people by name and face here in the intro because I will be bringing them up a lot throughout this video, and for those of you who may be unfamiliar, this serves as a brief introduction to a lot of this show's most prominent figures who I will be referring to sporadically throughout. First and foremost, the show was created and headed by Craig McCracken who came up with the idea one day while making a birthday card. But. That's a story for another video. Then there's Gendy Tartakovsky. Gendy and Craig were an unstoppable force back in the 90s as the two had been roommates together with Rob Renzetti after college. Gendy, of course, being the creator of Dexter's Lab, which Craig also worked on, as well as Samurai Jack, Symbionic Titan, Primal, and several other projects. And Rob Renzetti being creator of My Life as a Teenage Robot. You'll quickly learn I'm a big Gendy fan and praise practically everything that man's ever created except for Hotel Transylvania, which I'm personally not too big on. The show's cast consists of Blossom, played by Kathy Cavadini, Bubbles, played by Tara Strong, Buttercup, played by E.G. Daly, the narrator and mayor, played by Tom Kenny, most famously known for Spongebob, but this show came first, Professor Utonium and Him, by Tom Kane, Miss Keen and Princess Morbucks by Jennifer Hale, although the latter character doesn't show up until season two, Mojo Jojo, played by Roger L. Jackson, also known as the voice of screen, and Miss Bellum, played by Jennifer Martin. Of course, these folk also play a bunch of other characters in the show, but these are their main roles, and the show's cast also extends to other prominent voice actors like Jeff Bennett, Kevin Michael Richardson, and Dee Bradley Baker, who play a ton of background and side characters, as well as Jim Cummings, Rob Paulson, and Chuck McCann, who play the villains of Fuzzy Lumpkins, Brick and Boomer, and the Amoeba Boys, respectively. The third Rowdy Rough Boy, Butch, is played by Roger L. Jackson, who I've already mentioned. Another side note is this was a storyboard-driven show, which consisted of a whole team of storyboard artists and writers, which I can't really name all of them, so for the purposes of this video, I'll be acknowledging them by name in their respective episodes as need be. With introductions out of the way now, there are 24 episodes that I'm going to be covering today in exquisite detail, so let's go ahead and get started with my reviews of every single episode of The Powerpuff Girls Season 1. The city of Townsville is the setting for this fine cartoon and will be acknowledged as such from here on out. Now, in order to keep things flowing and so the first episode review of the series isn't like four times as long as the rest, I will be making a point to acknowledge more of the show's generalized and reoccurring tropes across various episodes, that way I'm not just like dumping everything on the table here at once. That being said, I do want to start by acknowledging our very first character ever introduced in the series, the narrator. City of Townsville. A city that sleeps, a tired town with an early, early bedtime. Sure, you've got your villains, and you've got the girls, and you've got the professor and Ms. Bellum amongst other adult figures, but the narrator is almost always left out of everybody's acknowledgements towards the show's cast, and I really think that's a damn shame because the narrator has a lot of great one-liners scattered throughout the entire series that never cease to crack me up. Obviously, part of the issue is that he's a faceless character. He never appears on screen, so of course he's going to be left out of pretty much any possible artwork unless the artists themselves are simply superimposing what they envision him to look like. But yeah, I love the narrator, and he deserves to get a lot more respect than he does. In this episode in particular, he basically introduces us to the full cast, which, while conveniently convenient, that's redundant, why did I write that? Uh, conveniently convenient that it's the first episode of the series to air, it's not actually the first episode of the series in terms of production order. Now, that's something I want to get into, like I mentioned just a few minutes ago. The true first episode of the Powerpuff Girls is actually an episode that's not too far off, Insect Inside, 
at least based on the behind the scenes production codes of the episodes that list the order in which they were produced. Most TV series assign codes to episodes as a way of tracking them without necessarily referring to them as a title because, well, let's face it, it's easier for people that are less involved with the show to refer to an episode by its code rather than its name. Ultimately, it doesn't really matter which episode is first because I both think they're fine as a first episode, but I suppose Monkey See Doggy Do does get the advantage of having the narrator run through and introduce us, albeit briefly to the characters like the girls and the professor and mojo who are all at the end of the day the core five characters of the series and so that's exactly what we get the narrator runs through and introduces us to the quiet peaceful setting of townsville only to take us across the city to a specific location where somebody is not asleep the museum. One interesting piece of trivia is that the plot of this episode is actually based on a short episode that series creator Craig McCracken had started making while he was in college, titled with the same name. See, the original premise for this show was actually a cartoon by the name of Whoop Ass Stew, but after a series of events and several years later and an obvious name change that needed to happen, it ended up becoming The Powerpuff Girls. Whoop Ass Stew was originally intended to have four shorts completed, however due to various constraints only the first was ever fully finished. The story of this episode in particular is basically summed up as this. Mojo Jojo sneaks into Townsville's museum to steal the Anubis dog head and the Anubial jewels, which, when combined, create this magic shape-shifting mind control device that basically turns every limping person within its vicinity into a dog and forces them to obey the wielder. With a canine army at his heels, Mojo then commands said army that he builds to run amok and steal from all the fine establishments in the city, rob stores, and gather as many precious jewels as possible while he plans his next step. Which sounds pretty great, right? Total supervillain scheme for sure. Now, allow me to show you what the original short was like. The game's up, Mojo Jojo! That's what you think! Oh no, he's turned them into dogs! And now to conquer the world! Yowch! Yeah, bet you never thought you'd hear what Mojo Jojo voiced by Rob Renzetti would sound like, did ya? Well, there you go. Needless to say, Craig made major strides between this and the episode we got. Now, there are several things I'd like to highlight here in the first half of the episode, namely, everything Mojo does. The Powerpuff Girls has such a brilliant level of humor, not only in its dialogue, but in its visuals, the latter of which usually goes unacknowledged by the show itself because it's up to the viewer to pay attention to what they're perceiving and catch small subtleties that the average person probably won't recognize or notice. In the museum scene, Mojo goes through this elaborate plan of sneaking in and avoiding security traps by disabling these safety protocols with his own evil wit. He places a photo in front of a camera. He uses some aerosol spray to reveal lasers he needs to avoid. It really shows how much care and detail he'll put into the lengths he's going to go to in order to secure what he wants. It really emphasizes the genius aspect of his character. And then, he does this. <laughs> Museum robbed. I just love that. He takes his time to carefully steal the Anubis head with total precision and then in a moment of haste smashes the glass containing the jewels without a second thought. It's comedic and yet it perfectly exemplifies the two sides of Mojo's character without even so much as saying a word about it. He's a strong evil chimpanzee with a galaxy brain. Two sides of the same mind. He's intelligent when he needs to be but he has tendencies that revert back to his more primal animalistic traits on occasion, completely communicated without ever having to acknowledge itself. And it doesn't stop there, because next we get a scene of the Powerpuff Girls trying to find clues on who could have committed the crime, and my words don't do it enough justice. Okay girls, spread and search. perfectly illustrates the damage that the recklessness of the girls can cause. It fully demonstrates not only their childish focus solely on the task at hand without really being aware of the premises around them, but their sheer raw power that they can just fly through a building in record time and utterly decimate everything in the vicinity because they're just that strong. 
This is very much a recurring event in the show as the girls love to barge into pretty much every facility without ever using the door and every time somebody's gotta fix it. So I can guarantee you that Townsville's roofing company is the most profitable company in the entire city with the amount of money they must make in repairing these damages on a daily basis. From there, the girls fly on over to Mouth's, a grocery store in the show's setting, and quickly begin discovering that the people of Townsville have all started getting turned into dogs as they come across one trapped in a car. A dog's trapped! <gasps> Poor puppy! He must be one hot dog. Don't worry, we'll let you out! Okay, yeah, not every joke in the show is a winner, but the musical cue that accompanies Buttercup's line here at least hints at the self-awareness of throwing in such a cheeky line. The girls also get called to the mayor's office by the Powerpuff signal, which was always funny to me because this thing only appears in two episodes in the entire series. Yeah two of them. The first episode of the series to ever air, and the season 4 episode Super Friends which really just appeared because of a song that was featured in it. The mayor scene doesn't have much to add here because just like with the other dogs the girls found, the mayor isn't quite able to spit out the name of the person responsible before going full on dog mode, and Miss Bellum unfortunately isn't of very much help either. Anyways, the next scene is adorable, when the girls head on home and come to find the professor who has been turned into this really small pup that, despite being a four-legged creature, still manages to keep a pipe in his mouth. Seriously, puppy professor is best dog. Yeah, it's amusing to watch the girls trying to figure out what the professor is trying to say, meanwhile he's just demanding things from them like water and playing fetch like a dog would. It's fitting and again shows the sense of humor this show has. And while that's going on, Mojo has his dog army hot wiring convertibles and making getaways which go about as well as you'd expect for a dog to drive a car. There's all sorts of references to stuff here too, such as the famous dogs playing poker painting or his master's voice, which is really neat. Pretty soon the dogs manage to bring the jewels to Mojo and he begins to enact the final phase of his plan, turning the entire planet into dogs to do his bidding. But the Powerpuff Girls are hot on his trail. Unfortunately, they get there a little too late and Mojo ends up turning them into dogs too, preventing them from being easily able to defeat him and end his scheme. Pretty smart idea if you ask me, especially considering we're coming into the show with him already having experience with battling against the Powerpuff Girls, so this certainly isn't his first rodeo. Mojo even goes so far as to sick his own dogs on them, leading to a full-blown dog fight that serves as the big action set piece for the episode, with the girls and the evil dogs chomping down on each other back and forth, back and forth. It's a fun fight though, I mean, sure as a first fight for the series it's not the greatest because we don't actually get to see any of the girls use their powers here, but comparing it to all the fights across the show, it is a nice difference that strays away from the norm to deliver us with something interesting. Luckily, the girls manage to defeat these hounds and Mojo resorts to plan B. An ingenious plan if I do say so myself. Don't force me to show you my influence. <laughs> Can't get me now. <laughs> Somebody give this chimp an award because no ordinary mind could have ever thought of that. Once again, this is the brilliance of Mojo's character shining through here. Yeah, he has this super elaborate plan to steal this artifact and transform people into a dog army and take over the world, and then plan B is just step up a little bit so they can't reach him. Unfortunately for Mojo, Buttercup quickly catches on that she can just go around the other way to get to him, and so she does just that, causing Mojo to drop the Anubis head, breaking it, and destroying the curse, reverting everybody on the planet back to normal, except this one guy here who gets turned back without his clothes on. Hey, what gives? All the other people got their clothes back, but this one guy just doesn't? Anywho, that pretty much brings our story to a close, because Mojo gets turned into a dog himself, and the girls peg the professor to keep him in their backyard, ending the episode. And what a start that was. As an introduction to both the girls, Mojo, and the professor, I think the episode does a fine job, and it's a pretty wacky scheme that only scratches the surface of the creative potential that was just waiting to be exhibited in later episodes of the show. Now, in all of my reviews, I intend to highlight the title of the episode, probably towards the beginning, because while you shouldn't judge a book by its cover, I think that titles are important, and with the Powerpuff Girls in particular, a lot of the episode titles that Craig and his team came up with were absolute strokes of genius, usually either being a clever construction of verbiage that acts as a play on words or being indicative of two and sometimes three meanings of significance behind the events conveyed in the episode. This is one of my all-time 
favorite aspects of the series, and it would be a shame not to acknowledge them. Of course, the episode I've already discussed here is Monkey See Doggy Do, which is a play on words of the phrase Monkey See Monkey Do, typically used as a sometimes derogatory manner of calling somebody a copycat, someone who imitates something, or someone else simply because they witness it. And given it's an episode where Mojo forms an army of dogs who do the bidding that they perceive, it's a pretty fitting title that gets a thumbs up from me. As Mojo's first episode is our signature villain, this is a pretty good introduction that not only gives us a taste of what's to come, the more nuanced gags, however, were top-notch, even for this being such an early episode in the show's run. I know most of the time people will always say, oh, just wait until episode 10, or wait until season 2, or after the first 8 hours the show gets really good, and while the same can be said for Powerpuff Girls to an extent, because I think seasons 2, 3, and 4 are easily the best of the series, still has a lot of hits and a handful of home runs batted in too. Monkey See Doggy Do definitely isn't anywhere near my favorite episode of the series, but I'd still call it a good episode, especially for one of the earliest. Couldn't think of a better way to kick off the series given the first handful of episodes to choose from based on the production codes. It does make sense for Mojo to be the first villain featured instead of a one-off that's never been seen again after the one episode he's in anyways, but I'm getting ahead of myself. We actually have another episode to get to first, so let's switch topics now shall we? So once again, the day is saved, thanks to the Powerpuff Girls. Next, with episode 1B, aka episode 2, we've got Mommy Fearest, a title that acts as a play on words, taking inspiration from the title of a cult 1981 docudrama film, Mommy Dearest, and perfectly encapsulates the core theme of the episode in question. I mean, when you hear the title Mommy Fearest, what does it invoke? You instantly think of a mother figure who's probably threatening or overpowering or borderline abusive in some way that would elicit the emotional response of fear. It's right there in the title, and yet it ties into the film that it's based on so, so remarkably well that it was just a perfect choice. One of the Powerpuff Girls' most shining attributes to reiterate is the cleverness behind the episode titles. I really can't think of another cartoon that has better names for its episodes than this one, and I will die on that hill. The film that this episode is based on is a biographical take on Christina Crawford's autobiography that she had released in 1978, depicting the life that her and her brother had endured under their abusive and manipulative adoptive mother, Joan Crawford. The film was panned across the board by critics, although it certainly garnered a cult following thanks to its absolutely outlandish performances and presentation, some even going so far as to say it's one of the worst films ever made. And considering it ended up winning 5 out of 9 nominations for the Razzies at the second ever Golden Raspberry Awards show, and considering Faye Dunaway herself went on record saying she regretted her portrayal of the character in the film, yeah, I'd say that's probably a lot of good criteria for classifying it as such. I think one of the weirdest things to me about Mommy Fierce, though, is that as far as episodes go, this isn't anywhere near the top of most people's lists, and yet, I've seen references to this episode everywhere, all the time. I mean, there were so many gifts made out of this episode, Bubbles' his eyes watering, the girls sleeping by the TV, the girls helping the professor get ready, etc. The list just goes on. I see these gifts all over the place, and they all stem from the same episode. It's wild to me. This episode is so prevalent that it's even featured in the background of M. Night Shyamalan's film Un breakable, and it appears in an episode of Everwood, and who knows, it's probably even appeared elsewhere that I don't even know about too. Either way, Mommy Fearest is a prevalent episode and definitely one of the most standout episodes of season one, even if it's not at the top of my list. Mommy Fearest opens to the Powerpuff Girls and the Professor spending some quality family time together watching TV Puppet Pals, a classic hit comedy series that's fun for the whole family. A lot of people immediately take this as a confirmation that this means that the Powerpuff Girls and Dexter's lab actually take place in the same universe, but the people who worked on the show have pretty much come out and said that this wasn't the intent at all and it was just meant to be a fun reference or something. It's usually not that deep. Both shows were made by the same team of people, so if anything it was just an homage to their previous work. Anyways, the intro of this episode is nice because it basically establishes what the typical family dynamic of the Powerpuff Girls is like. The four all spending time together watching TV and then getting ready for bed, where the professor helps them get tucked in, even going so far as to leave the hall light on for Bubbles, who tends to have more prominent fears than the other two given her sensitivities. But there are two sides to every coin, and even though the girls are the light of the professor's life as we clearly see here, 
He quickly changes his mood as he slumps off to bed all by his lonesome, foreshadowing to the turn of events that are about to occur. Where the girls are begging the professor for various snacks and goodies at the grocery store before he unintentionally bumps into our antagonist for the episode, Miss I'm a Good Lady. I'm a good lady, huh? Isn't that a little too on the nose? Perhaps, but the lack of subtlety doesn't seem to phase the girls or the professor who's caught in one of those 10 hour dialogue loops because he's absolutely love struck at first sight in seeing this woman. And due to the professor's dumbfounded inability to communicate, the girls take it upon themselves to set the professor up with the date. Saturday night then? No, Sunday. I like Friday. Friday it is. Say, eight o'clock? No, 10. I like it was always amusing to me that the girls here basically just keep suggesting things to Ima like what day and what time with Blossom and Buttercup just being like, how about Saturday? No, Sunday or 8 p.m., 10 p.m. And then Bubbles just comes in like, I like Friday, I like seven. And then Ima just goes with Bubbles completely glossing over the other two. But they make it a date. And so later that week, the girls help the professor get ready for his big night by giving him all of the necessities. And your hair gel, and cologne, breast mints, and cufflinks, and some of these. Oh my gosh, did you know what Buttercup put in the professor's pocket just now? How did the 90s get away with this? All right, that's another thing I want to address really quick. Did the Powerpuff Girls get away with some adult jokes that probably wouldn't fly by today's standards? Yeah. It did. But of all the things that the show did do, this is far from the most shocking thing. This is nothing. Kids aren't going to know what these are until they either get older or they literally have someone older spell it out for them. Like, I just... When episodes like Members Only and Something's a Miz exist, which are far more raunchy in its adult humor than this, it's so incredibly inconsequential. I don't know. It's not really that big of a deal, but I always see people flip out over this. It's like, I think it's blown out of proportion. <laughs> uh, anyways, I, I just had to get that off my chest. What I really do want to talk about, though, is the transition from before the professor is leaving to after he gets home. Have fun! Now, maybe I'm crazy. Maybe it's just me, but that melody sounds exactly like the first of the eight melodies from Mother One. This was probably unintentional, I'm like 95% certain, but ever since I noticed that similarity in like 2013, I've never been able to unhear this. But I feel like it's probably just coincidence because Mother One was never released outside of Japan at the time this episode would have premiered, so... Tangent aside, shoutouts to the mayor for his one major line in this episode. Mayor, I'm back. Uh, you can go home now. Ah! My life is a lie! Also, can we talk about the fact that the professor just has the mayor of the freaking city on speed dial to come babysit the girls? Like, there's literally nobody else capable of watching these kids that the leading politician is his go-to contact? I mean, don't get me wrong, the mayor doesn't do much anyways, but that's just funny to me. I'm so excited to be helping out around here with you girls. Helping out? What? And here we have the girls discovering the consequences of their actions, as well as the theme of the episode beginning to sprout up from the ground. Ima is beginning to enter the picture as the stepmother around the house, and the girls are beginning to regret their decision. Perhaps there is an argument out there about something like, how did the girls not see that coming? I at least tried to consider this perspective as the thought did pop up in my head, but my simple retort to that is the girls didn't know any better. I mean, they're like five years old. They probably didn't realize that things could escalate further than just their dad going out on a date, you know? I think the bigger concern here, however, is how easily the professor is swayed by Imo without even so much as a second thought. His infatuation with her is so prominent that he's lost all rationale and logical thought about how his daughters might be handling the situation. Why don't you let me explain to them? Oh, okay. Uh, sure. Alone. I'm at your command, I'm a. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> oh, you. Also, I love how the professor just became Count Von Count for a second there for some reason. I don't know why, I just love the chuckle delivery that Tom Kane gives. It's phenomenal. And so, the episode pretty much spirals into the girls being mistreated by an abusive stepmother who forces them to clean the house and go to bed early and pretty much sap all of the fun out of their lives by preventing them from using their superpowers. She smashes vases and photos and so on to go out of her way to create more messes for the girls to clean up to basically keep them preoccupied
occupied with the menial household chores that would take normal kids hours to complete. It's pretty cruel, especially considering the girls could have literally all of those tasks done in mere minutes thanks to their super speed, strength, and agility. Countdown's in trouble! And just where do you think you're going? We're going to fight crime! That's what we do! Duh! Ah, Bubble said the thing! Yep, this is the episode I grabbed that sound effect from. It's like I mentioned earlier, this episode is prominent for more things than I first realized. I mean, it's the perfect summation for the Powerpuff Girls whole existence in a nutshell. How could anybody in Townsville know who the Powerpuff Girls are and not know that they fight all the crime that takes place in the city? Apparently, Ima is the one exception here. Or rather, she's just doing it on purpose. Also, another key proponent to this episode's success, and a lot of episodes for that matter, as this attribute is highly consistent for much of the series, is the score of the episode. Very seldom do I ever see anyone acknowledge the genius or brilliance behind James Venable's scoring of Powerpuff Girls. The entire OST in general is an incredible compilation of cute, charming bliss and high-octane drum and bass. The range on the show's instruments shift between classic instruments like strings, wind instruments, brass instruments, piano during the calmer, less intense scenes, but then shifts into more electronic rock and drum and bass when the action kicks in. Sometimes on a whim as I'll share one such instance momentarily. But seriously, the soundtrack to Powerpuff Girls has so many memorable melodies and motifs to them that I could spend hours complimenting them all. The reason I bring this up is that because, despite this only being the second episode of the entire series production code-wise, the soundtrack is doing its job perfectly. The entire score of this episode is centered around Aima and what her mood or actions currently have her doing. When she's being sweet, the music compliments it. When she cranks up her intensity, the music does the same. I'm no music theorist, so I don't have the experience nor perspective nor vocabulary of somebody more invested in this stuff as a living or anything like that, but I always try to be more aware of the score of the episode than anything else. Sound always goes under-recognized despite it being the most critical part of the work. Sound is responsible for setting tones, mood, and atmosphere in ways that visual imagery cannot convey on their own. There's a quote from director Danny Boyle where he's talking about sound in film and states that it makes up like 70 or 80% of the film experience and I couldn't agree more with that. Anywho, after the girls get ready for bed, they get a call on the hotline phone and sneak out, only to return home and sneak through the front door instead of just flying back into their bedroom windows, causing them to get caught by Ima, who's currently waiting for them in the living room. And just where have you three been? Well? We were out fighting crime! That's what we do! Duh. Bubbles only says it twice in the episode, but both times it's just so perfect. I love it. What I love even more, though, is how overdramatic the next scene is with Ima grounding the girls for going out past their curfew and disobeying her. You three are grounded! Mm, what's going on down here? Oh, Professor! I was so worried! And again, that soundtrack complements it so well. The turnaround is just like that. Now, one argument against this episode that I definitely have seen is the argument that the professor just willingly sides with Ima here instead of hearing his daughters out, which is incredibly unjust given that he should have a stronger connection to them, so he should be more willing to side with them. However, speaking from experience and having seen some of my friends choose their new romantic partner over those that they had years and years of friendship with, infatuation makes people do stupid things and tends to have them always favor the person they're interested in because they tend to either view them as infallible or place them on a pedestal. The professor is clearly infatuated with Ima's charm and so he only sees her as having the purest of intentions, especially because she presents her ideas to him in such a sweet and innocent manner when she's doing much different things behind his back. Yeah, it sucks that people fall for this, but it makes sense. I've experienced it firsthand. Ima has him wrapped around her finger, and she is at liberty to instill pretty much whatever punishment she wants without consequence, and that's exactly what she does. And I love how this episode has the super dramatic pose of the professor with this really exaggerated frown as he holds her at an angle while she's fainted in his arms. It's so silly, but I love it regardless. Now, this next part is where the twist of the episode gets interesting, because after the girls are grounded, they get a call from the mayor exclaiming that Sedusa is robbing his vault and making off with a bunch of prize jewels. So, I guess the mayor actually had two lines in this episode. My mistake. Well, you picked a fine night to be grounded. Sedusa is robbing my safe of its jewels as we speak. Hey, put those back! 
And this explains how everything falls into place. The disguise, the mistreatment, the grounding, all a ploy that Sedusa put on in order to make off with some valuable gemstones without so much as a small breeze to stand in her way. It honestly was a solid plan, and it perfectly lives up to her name. I mean, can we talk about that for a second? Sedusa, a female supervillain that uses her charm, good looks, and sweet talking to seduce men like the professor into enabling her to get what she wants, while also being a play on the ancient Greek mythological creature who was said to petrify all that stared into her eyes. This is supported by her wild snake-like hair, which she appears to have control over, almost as if they were extra limbs, and uses as her primary method of attacking in combat. It's such a great name and a great idea for a villain. It's just a shame that she only gets brought back for two more major appearances after this one because I truly feel like there's so much more potential they could have done with her character. But hey, I think all three of her plans are pretty solid, so I can at least say she doesn't have a bad episode. Jennifer Hale also does a phenomenal job voicing the character, and you really get a sense of how much range she has with just this one role. Between her lighter, softer, smooth talk and voice she uses on that sap of a professor to the harder, grittier aggression that comes out when attacking the girls, it's really impressive and dynamic, so kudos to her. Also, I really love that song that plays when she's stealing the jewels. I honestly can't recall if it even shows up again in the series after this to off the top of my head, but it's got such a dark and ominous undertone to it that I'd typically only associate with another villain in the show we haven't seen yet. But that being said, upon her return, the roles are reversed, and now the Powerpuff Girls are left sitting in the chair awaiting her arrival. Another aspect I'll definitely be talking about with the Powerpuff Girls at some point in different episodes is also the show's use of color. Not gonna get into it right now, but there is a lot to be said, so I'll just leave it at, I love the red lighting and tone that it sets when it's both the girls or Sedusa sitting in the chair when they turn the light on. It creates such an unsettling feeling for whoever is sneaking in through the door, but it works so well. It perfectly encapsulates that feeling of getting caught. And then they fight. All right, yeah, this is the action I wanna see when I watch this show. Three five-year-olds beating up this woman, presumably in her 20s or 30s. Ah, it's just so refreshing to watch this show again and get to partake in the greatness that made it what it was. It's so, so satisfying to see Sedusa get what she deserves for coming in and torturing the girls' lives as a manipulative stepmother figure. My favorite bit of this entire fight, however, is when the professor walks in the room again after skinning the groceries and Bubbles is just seen gnawing on Sedusa's left calf. Like... <laughs> what is she doing? She's just chomping away here, like, I love that. But yeah, the episode has pretty much come to a close as the professor sees Seducer reach out to him, and him being the boss fatherly figure that he is, restrains her and has the girls call the police so that she can get reprimanded for her crimes. With that, the girls and the professor return back to their daily lives as they were before, but not before they hear somebody else arrive at the door. I lived down the street and I heard all about your apprehension of that vicious criminal, and so I baked you a pie. Oh boy, what flavor! Pie flavor. Thus ends Mommy Fearest. Honestly, as I've already said and made very apparent, I like the episode. It's nowhere near the top of my list, but considering I find it to be this good and it's only the second episode of the first season, man does that speak volumes as to what the rest of this series will entail. Once again, I find Seducer to be a great idea for a villain, and for her first scheme, it's a pretty good start. The episode's score is one of the most notable attributes of the entire episode, and even if it does paint the professor as a little bit of a love-struck fool, he was probably lulled into a false sense of love just simply due to his lonely nature as heavily emphasized in the opening act of the episode. It makes sense within the context and ultimately plays out successfully. This episode gets a good score from me. Minimal complaints here. Let's move on to the next one. Here we go again. Better nip this one in the bud, girls. And so once again, the day is saved. Thanks to the Powerpuff Girls.
Well, with the first pair of the season completed, it's time for me to move on to the next pair of episodes, starting with Season 1, Episode 2A, Insect Inside. Also, I want to go on a quick tangent here because this is something I've wanted to share my thoughts on for a long time now. Remember when 11 minute episodes like this used to air in pairs together? Like an episode was considered 22 minutes and it was just split into two different halves labeled A and B appropriately? Somewhere along the way it just seems like this whole pairing idea got split up because a lot of newer series that came in decades after classic Powerpuff Girls just had standalone 11 minute cartoons and that was that. Some shows probably still do it but I stopped watching 11 minute cartoons after Steven Universe ended so I don't really know what kids these days are into nor do I care. Anyways, back to my nostalgia. So Insect Inside, as with almost all episodes of the series, is a play on words, or rather, one word in this case, insecticide. I think it's clever at least. Anyway, yeah, if the title of the episode didn't give it away, the premise of this episode features the Powerpuff Girls fighting bugs, more specifically, cockroaches. The city of Townsville. But enough about that. I don't know why, but I always love quoting the narrator's, but enough about that, for whatever reason. Seriously, every time I change topics in a conversation, I find myself wanting to use that phrase and convey it in the exact same way because it's fun. But enough about that. Insect Inside begins with the girls flying through the house chasing after a cockroach that must have somehow snuck its way inside as an immediate way of thrusting us into the action. I like that. Now keep in mind this is the first episode of the series in terms of production order, so that being said, I find that this opening hallway sequence is an excellently planned scenario that perfectly introduces us to all three of the girls by showing us how they react to a scenario of a bug in the house. Bubbles is scared of the roach chasing her, screaming as she flies away from it out of pure terror. This immediately indicates fear. She's scared of the insect, so we know she doesn't like bugs. Her voice is higher pitched than the other two as well, indicating she's probably younger, more naive, more childish. Then you have Buttercup chasing after the roach, trying to smash it with her fist, symbolizing aggression, toughness, abrasiveness. She's more retaliatory than her sister, violent even. And then lastly comes Blossom, the moral authority. She's calm, collected, and trying to reason with the more emotional outbursts of her two sisters by applying logic, ethics, rationality to the scenario. She speaks in a more mature, relaxed tone compared to her sisters. She's more concerned about what they're doing rather than the roach itself. These all indicate that she must be the oldest of the three, intellectually speaking. All of this is communicated to us in a quick 30 second hallway scene that manages to not only paint an entire picture of our three main characters and how they interact not only with each other, but also with themselves. And it gives us a pretty fun action sequence to boot. What a solid introduction. I know I said I think Monkey See Doggy Do is a great introduction to the series as well, and while that's certainly true, I feel that upon rewatching this one, that episode does a solid job of introducing introducing Mojo's character to us, not so much the girls themselves. Sure, we get a little bit here and there, but we'll quickly see there are a lot of moments presented in Insect Inside that introduce us to several of the other mainstay characters of the series, such as this one right here. You see, the Blatter Odia, or more commonly known as the Cockroach, may be ugly and disgusting, but, well, they're also strong and focused creatures, and are very important to the balance of nature. Ah, Professor Utonium, one of the absolute best characters in the show. Mommy Fierce wasn't exactly the ideal first episode for him, seeing as he spent most of the episode off screen, while the primary fixation of the episode was revolved around Sedusa instead, and it was all about him wanting a relationship, which really isn't a mainstay aspect of his character, but his opening spiel here about the history of cockroaches being stepped on really emphasizes his knowledge. He educates the girls on the foul creature and teaches them what appears to be the lesson of the episode at first glance. But as the episode goes on, we'll see it's not quite that strong straightforward. Now, my memory of this next statement is a bit hazy, and I could be entirely wrong in saying this because I just don't remember for certain. I think Insect Inside is the second episode of the series I ever saw. I know for a fact what the first episode was, and like I said, I'll get to that when I get to it because I never forget how I got introduced to the show, but my second episode is unclear. I strongly feel like Insect Inside was second though because I just have a vivid memory of me sitting in my first house's living room and witnessing this scene of the professor 
professor monologuing on about cockroaches and how they get stepped on all the time, but they can survive nuclear radiation and all that. So as far as I'm concerned, this was my second episode of the show that basically cemented me in it as a fan, but I really have no way of knowing for sure, unfortunately. Anywho, the girls and professor let it go, but that quickly becomes the worst mistake they could have made because this cockroach manages to launch itself up in the air in an admittedly cool perspective shot and hitch a ride aboard this vehicle traveling deeper into the city. Seriously, that shot was really cool. I've always loved that. And so it is here where we meet the main antagonist of the episode, Roach Coach. He's a rather unhygienic middle-aged man who hates the world and all who inhabit it, plotting the demise of Townsville from his top floor empty apartment unbeknownst to the citizens below. Stupid people. Look at them. What incompetent, unorganized, filthy, dirty creatures. They've been infesting this planet for too long. Roach Coach is the first of a new type of villain that I like to categorize as the one-off. As in, this is his only episode appearance in the whole show where he's the main antagonist and for the rest of the series he'll make either a brief appearance as a cameo or never show up again at all. Now whether that's because he was just forgotten about or there were no additional episode ideas that he could have been used for, who's to say? But that being said, his whole gimmick is exactly what you would guess. He's the leader that wants to rise up, take over the world, and crush humans that have been infesting the planet for far too long. The only thing that stands in his way, however, is those blasted Powerpuff Girls, but thanks to the intel gathered by his trusty Lieutenant Skippy, he discovers that the girls are afraid of them, that they wouldn't want to touch them because of how icky, gross, and disgusting they think they are. This vital information grants Roach Coach some newfound confidence to do the most logical thing and plot with his army to enact their evil plan the next day. Here's your dog, enjoy! Oh, I shall! Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy! And oh my god, that's horrifying. Insects infesting people's food? My god, Roach Coach truly is a vile individual. Like, ugh. The more I think about it, the more I'm starting to feel a little queasy. Like, ugh. Yeah. <laughs> but there's more to his plan than just that. The roaches infest people's clothes, cars, buildings. Basically, the whole entire city is just covered under this endless layer of cockroaches crawling and scurrying all over everything. And no matter how hard this policeman attempts to shoot them with his dinky little pistol, nothing seems to be able to contain these roaches. No, seriously, I love that. There's this one police officer that's just like firing his gun at these roaches over and over again. Like, yeah, that's totally gonna be able to stop an army of bugs. Well, well, either way, the infestation grows and grows until it becomes such an issue that two new characters get their introduction, the mayor and Ms. Bellum. Yes, I know we saw them in Monkey See, Doggy Do, but again, this was the first produced episode, so I'm treating this like the first real introduction, which in my eyes is a better way of introducing them anyways. And this clip right here really says it all. Don't you think you should make the call? Oh, yes, yes, good thinking, Miss Cerebellum. Call the exterminator. Ms. Bellum is the brains and the mayor is... the mayor, I guess. I honestly can't wait for later episodes in the season where I really get to dig into these two and discuss some of their shining moments, but seeing as this episode is not one of those, I'm gonna have to save that for another time. Next, we get our first establishing shot of Pokey Oaks, introducing us to the fact that the girls do, indeed, go to school. Although we don't see their teacher or any of the other kids here yet, so that will have to wait. The mayor ends up making the call and the hotline rings right into the nick of time. And this is why Bubbles rarely ever gets to answer the hotline. Also, once again, can we talk about how horrifying the current scenario is? Not only were these cockroaches powerful enough to smash through a glass window, they managed to begin filling the room up to the ceiling with their small, prickly bodies. I mean, the mayor and Ms. Bellum are literally drowning in roaches. Can you imagine that? Being trapped in a room that's filling up with an endless sea of cockroaches crawling up and down all over you to the point that you get buried underneath all of them with no chance of escape. As a kid, I never even gave this situation so much as a second thought, but now as an adult, I'm just thinking about how terrifying this is. Wow, this just makes me appreciate the series so much more. Gaining new perspectives on the show every time I watch it just proves how valuable and timeless the series really is to me. Something's bug in the town! Let's roll! 
And with the girls flying into town, they quickly come to discover the chaos that is amassed in the streets, leading to Blossom doing the only logical thing that anybody would think to do in the given situation. She goes to get a giant jar. Where did she get the jar from? I don't know. But remember this for later, because it will become relevant again someday. Now, if I may, I'd like to take a moment to compliment the score once again here, because the combination of feelings that get created here by the choice of instrumentation perfectly captures two different feelings at the same time. The use of the higher tone string instruments perfectly emulates the tiny yet terrifying cockroaches that are gross, disgusting, and skittish in the way they move around, while the music is also backed by the deeper, more menacing sound that implicates the sheer sense of force and power that an army of these bugs is posing on the city. It's such a great combo. Also, this whole giant jar thing highlights another thing I love about the show. Just how ridiculous it can be sometimes. I mean, honestly, the fact that Blossom just flies off and finds this giant jar out of nowhere and then scoops everything up and everyone's like, oh yeah. Yay, the day is saved. It's just a silly scenario that cracks me up. Roach Coach ain't laughing though, so he comes rushing in and blows his whistle to cause the roaches to break right through the jar, which, as we've already established at the mayor's office, glass doesn't stop these things, so makes sense. And the roaches all envelop his body, forming a gigantic bug creature that poses a rather large threat to the girls themselves as they fly up towards it and it chomps down on them in one fell swoop. Didn't even stand a chance. The shot that follows this is easily, I feel, the most iconic screen cap of the the entire episode. Blossom, Bubbles, and Buttercup just being buried within this vast expanse of black and brown roaches is such a striking visual that never leaves my mind. It gives off a sense of claustrophobia. This is the result of the girls essentially holding themselves back, limiting their powers because they're following what their father told them about insects being yucky on the outside when it's the insect inside that counts. However, I've always loved the justification that basically unleashes the girls' true fighting spirit here by them being swallowed up by it. The gigantic bug is gross on the inside, just as it is on the outside, so that must make it okay, right? Well, I guess so, even though the being is still comprised of these smaller roaches, but hey, I see it as more or less a couple of kids still abiding by the moral standards that were taught to them by their parents while also doing the right thing via a loophole. I don't know, some would call this weak writing, but for me personally, I always saw this as Blossom upholding her ethics while finding justification in this exception. Either way, the girls retaliate and we get some pretty awesome action shots as they fly through and smash these roaches to bits until the giant form is no more, leaving Roach Coach to fall to the ground from hundreds of feet in the air to his death. Admittedly, it was kind of short-sighted on his part to not have a backup plan in case the girls did decide to, oh, I don't know, retaliate, but hey, that's what he gets, I suppose. Also, the fact that the episode genuinely pulls a fake out with the villain basically falling to his death and hitting the street below is so raw. Like, damn straight the episode just made it look like the Roach Coach freaking died based on the girl's pure reactions. Of course, that faint metallic sound does throw it off a bit, but it's still mind-boggling that the team got to portray that. Season 1 really seemed to push the limits in terms of the kinds of things being shown. The show still had violence in all successive seasons, of course, but Season 1 really pushed those boundaries in ways that still surprise me to this day. Of course, as a kid, I thought nothing of it because it was a silly cartoon that I knew wasn't real. But hey, soccer moms be paranoid, you know? As it turns out, he didn't die because Roach Coach was actually a robot all along, being controlled from the inside by another cockroach named Roach Coach. They're the same person. But yeah, basically this one roach controlled this human body to lead the rest of these roaches, which was an admittedly clever twist you probably wouldn't expect upon a first viewing. I really like it. That about wraps up the episode though, as the girls subdue the roach by trapping him in a jar behind bars, and the crew celebrates another victory to close things out. It's all in a day's work. It doesn't bug us. <laughs> Professor, you just squished that spider. Oh, I get it. Better safe than sorry, right? No, spiders just creep me out. Oh, that professor. Gotta love him. And yeah, that does it for Insect Inside. I think this episode is memorable for being the first episode of the entire series. That much goes without saying. But oddly enough, even despite how much of a presence Roach Coach has outside of the show itself, like I said, this is the only appearance he ever made in the series aside from some cameos in later episodes. It's super ironic because if you look at a lot of the promo material for the Powerpuff Girls during season one, you'll see Roach Coach all over the place. He's in bumpers, he's acknowledged in commercials, he's one of the main three villains mentioned in the girl's theme song for goodness sake.
I don't know if the writers just forgot about him or if they tried to bring him back for another episode, like I said, and they just didn't have any good ideas or what, but it's funny seeing him all over the place at the beginning of the series' run, treating him like he was going to be a mainstay villain or something, when in reality, he was a one and done. I don't know if other people outside the core writers' room thought he was the main antagonist because he was the villain of the first episode and so they just assumed, or if the writing team told people to put Roach Coach in promos and stuff, I don't know. I feel like they would have at least wanted to push him a bit more, but that didn't happen until later seasons started coming about. Oh well, either way, yeah, that does it for Insect Inside. Good intro to the series in a lot of ways and really gets the ball rolling on what PPG is all about. I always like returning back to this one because it gets me in the mood for the rest of the season, you know? Speaking of which... The day is saved, thanks to the Powerpuff Girls! <laughs> Spiders just creep me out, he says. Oh, Jiminy. Next up, we have Powerpuff Bluff, the first episode title that I think just relies more on the name having catchy assonance to it because aside from Blind Man's Buff or Bluff, which some people mistranslate it to, kind of sounding similar to Powerpuff Bluff, I can't really put anything else to it. I mean, I guess it works, but it's definitely one of the weaker titles of season one, which is saying a heck of a lot because it still has a ring to it, thanks to that repeated last syllable, which makes it not bad. Either way, I'm rambling about it. This episode doesn't have a whole lot to it compared to the other others that I've already talked about when it comes to the villains because this time around we're dealing with three ordinary average everyday crooks that just want to get away with robbing a bunch of stores so that they can be rich. They're probably some of, if not the most generic main villains in the series considering most of the others tend to be more creative creatures or entities and let's not forget the giant monsters of course, but this is one of those earliest episodes of season one so I can't blame the show too much since it was still figuring some things out. Besides, having one episode with your stereotypical run of the mill bank robbers, it ain't hurting anything. Just a hold up, everybody! Freeze! <laughs> I said freeze! I've always loved that freeze joke, by the way, especially with the crowd remaining completely motionless as the three crooks walk through the building and there's just this mass of people frozen in the foreground and background. As such, the episode begins with the robbers attempting to steal from the bank, complete with real guns, which is something you hardly ever see in cartoons nowadays. Ah man, the good old 90s, of which I had been consciously aware of my childhood existence for a whopping one and a half years. <laughs> But I still remember the first time I saw the show, as I've said, which was in 1999, so that's gotta count for something, right? I'm a 90s kid. I mean, in all truth and honesty, I had cassette tapes. I had a Furby in my grandfather's house. I remember landline phones. I remember Britney Spears and the Backstreet Boys. I saw The Emperor's New Groove in theaters and remember it vividly. Oh, wait, that was 2000. Dang it. Just because the year 2000 hit didn't mean that all the trends from the 90s just vanished in an instant. They carried into the first years of the 2000s, whether or not people want to accept that fact. Also, being born in 96 means I just qualify as a millennial, but I've got experience in both Gen Y and Gen Z being in the cutoff year, but honestly, given the state of today's culture, I certainly identify more with Gen Y and... Why did I go on this tangent again? Oh yeah, because in the 90s, things were more lax and guns were allowed to be shown on TV compared to the decades that followed where things got way more strict as time went on, yet people continue to let their kids play violent M-rated video games where the primary objective is to kill your opponents with guns. Yeah, this uh, TV show censorship seems almost kind of silly, doesn't it? But you know, it's not really the show's fault or the game's fault, it's bad parenting. So. Anyways, getting all of that out of the way, the robbers hold up the bank and then the Powerpuff Girls beat them up and send them to prison, but it must not have been a very long sentencing because the next thing we know, they're stealing from a jewelry store. And the Powerpuff Girls beat them up and send them to prison. And then they rob the mayor's house. And the Powerpuff Girls beat them up and send them to prison. Just rob me and go away. Take my money, some fine art maybe, my wife. Perhaps the key to the city, my wife. This scene of the episode is probably the first sign of the mayor being a cleverly written character under the farce of his idiocy, because the way he responds to the robbers in this moment is 
pretty witty every single time. Between being willing to just give his wife away to his sheer obliviousness while Blossom hucks him through the air in time to catch his porcelain poodle, it just exemplifies his absent-minded yet pure ego that makes the character such an entertaining addition to the main cast. It seems our criminals of the week have yet to figure out the pattern here though, but thankfully after thinking through their predicament, their boss comes up with a brilliant idea. It's time for them to... And after the guys think of ways that they could get away with their crimes without the Powerpuff Girls stopping them, they realize they could just be the Powerpuff Girls, and then the whole town would love them, and there's nothing standing in their way. Heck, the city would practically give all of their wealth away to them because of how beloved they are. If only they had a way of... How are we gonna look like them Powerpuff Girls? Hmm. Let's see. We're gonna have to use every resource in this joint. Guys, this is gonna be tougher than I thought. Oh. Well, that's convenient. Yeah, this basically reveals that the entire premise of this episode is centered around comedy rather than action, as the sheer silliness of this scenario is meant to be taken far less seriously compared to the abject horror of having an entire city infested with roaches, or the entire world being turned into dogs. Sometimes you need smaller scale crimes for the characters to deal with, and this certainly fits that bill. That said, it is pretty silly all around, but it really plays on the sheer stupidity of the entire city of Townsville. This is a running trend that will permeate the rest of the show, by the way. It was very early on in the show's development that I guess it was decided that all of Townsville's citizens were just abnormally stupid. It kind of explains why the mayor gets elected now that I think about it. I'm not sure if this was Craig's idea or if it spawned from somebody else on his writing team, but the thing I really like about their portrayal in the first four seasons is that almost always the crowd is portrayed as stupid out of innocence rather than out of malice. I'll be getting into that argument much, much later though. This of course shines in all of the examples of the criminals pretending to be the Powerpuff Girls though, and the townsfolk reacting to them as if they were the girls, as seen here. Can you let us out? <laughs> well, sure I can. <laughs> be my pleasure. <laughs> oh, thanks. You girls are great. Oh no. Imposter Powerpuffs? What a drag. I never got that joke behind the what a drag comment for years. <laughs> I remember having a caption image of this scene saved in like 2013, and it took me until like 2019 to finally figure out that it was referring to the fact that guys were quote unquote dressed in drag. But see, this is the cleverness that's buried so deep within the Powerpuff Girls that I literally never noticed it until two decades later. I mean, you can find wordplay like this everywhere. The show is honestly a language arts teacher's paradise. Hell, I'm sure there are plenty of clever asides made like this that I've never even picked up on before, and hopefully I get to catch a few more while I'm going through reviewing the entire series like this. Meanwhile, at Pokey Oaks, we've got a Dexter's Laboratory reference on our hands, which I realize as an adult was just intended to be a cool cameo, seeing as Dexter and Powerpuff were made by the same team of people, which is awesome. Now, of course I know this is just one of many references inside not only the Powerpuff Girls, but across the entire Cartoon Network mythos that lead many to theorize that all Cartoon Network shows exist within the same universe, and while I myself also hold that theory as basically 100% valid given the circumstances of things like the CN City and the whole 20th anniversary celebration plus the sheer number of crossovers over the years, ultimately, it's all fantasy, and we can believe what we want to believe. It's just funny because the original creators under most circumstances never really considered this idea of the cartoon characters all living in this world together, and just intended for it to be a quick cameo, but it's honestly incredible how much the idea of crossovers exploded within the past few decades. Sure, they weren't unheard of before, but people sure love crossovers, and I, for one, am not removed from that crowd. Ah, oh, man, this just makes me miss the good old days, you know? Back when it was a network in its prime that I actually cared about. Not to be the whole, oh, back in my day, but, you know, they were really good times. As we drift further and further away from that time period, those eras of the channel feel like a distant memory. I mean, it's been like, what, several years since I made that CN City retrospective video? Time flies, man. Where was I? Oh yeah, the three crooks roam around Townsville and basically just ask the citizens to hand the money over to them, which they do. Then they head to the jeweler's store and ask them to hand over the jewels, which they do. Then they go to the mayor's house and plan to wreck the place, which they do. Ha <laughs> ha, that is so true. 
I mean, yeah, he's not wrong. Honestly, I appreciate repetition and the way it's used here with putting the three crooks through the same scenarios they attempted at the beginning of the show when they were criminals and seeing how it's so easy for them to succeed now that they're the Powerpuff Girls. Of course, this is at the expense of the PPG's reputations because not long after their visit to the mayor's office, Miss Bella mentions to him that the girls were a little off in their behavior. And by that, she means that they weren't the girls at all kind of reinforces the idea that Ms. Bellum is pretty much the smartest person in all of Townsville, even more so than the professor in some cases, given that she's able to see right through this scheme unlike literally everybody else. I mean, her name is Sarah Bellum. Like, Sarah Bellum, that one part of your brain? There's more than just a pun behind the significance of that name. She's incredibly intelligent. Say, sweet cheeks, what's your sign? Stop. Also, that was brilliant. <laughs> Remember just a few minutes ago when I said there would be new one-liners I would notice for the first time while reviewing this episode? <laughs> well, sure enough, here's an example. That response is brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. I can't believe it took me 25 years to figure out the joke behind that response. Eventually, the goons get tired of messing around with the mayor's things and beat him up a bunch before walking out and leaving. With the mayor spasming in the fetal position on the floor in response, once again brushing it off as harmless fun despite this being nothing like how the girls would normally treat him. So, where does it go from here? Well, like I mentioned, Ms. Bellum tells the mayor about what's going on, so he does the exact thing you'd expect him to do. We can feed the homeless, help abused animals find good homes, or adopt a child from a third world country. Freeze! He arrests the Powerpuff Girls in the most sudden, spontaneous, and quite honestly, horrifying way possible, especially for a kindergarten class. I mean, this would be traumatizing on somebody, I'm sure. It's just so extra, and now the girls are in prison while the real criminals are out and about continuing to rob places. Thankfully, that doesn't last too long before Ms. Bellum shows up and lets them know what's going on from within their cell. And before Blossom has time to describe why it would be wrong of them to break out of prison, her sisters have already made it halfway to the bad guys' locations. And it is here where the climax of the episode occurs, at this Chinese restaurant where the goons are currently chowing down before the girls bust in and they all begin battling each other. It's a decent fight, but horribly unbalanced in favor of the girls, seeing as these three crooks don't have any powers of any kind to really defend themselves, hence the girls giving them a good whooping in the first half of the fight. Of course, because everybody except for Bellum are blind, the distinctions between the girls and the men dressed up as the girls, everyone devolves into bonking their own teammates on the head, but that's quickly resolved when everyone agrees to just fight their counterpart, allowing the girls to take the upper hand and defeat them once and for all. That pretty much ends things off, aside from the mayor telling the girls they have to go back to prison because they broke the law by breaking out in the first place, even though it was the mayor's fault for falsely imprisoning them, but hey, for the sake of the joke at the end, I won't bat an eye to it. It's not a big deal. And honestly, it kind of exposes a major area of corruption in the American justice system anyways, so, you know. And so, yeah, Powerpuff Bluff. Honestly, the episode's just fine. It doesn't really stand tall as one of the best of the season, and it's not anywhere near as memorable as some of the others, but, you know, not every episode is going to stand out, and this one just happens to get the job done and leave it at that. I think the writing is great as always, and of course the soundtrack is phenomenal, especially with the variant of the girls theme that plays whenever the criminals are on screen dressed up as them. It's just fantastic attention to detail, and we've still got 20 more episodes to go. I'm about ready to move on, though. Not much else to say, so let's do that. So once again, the day is saved, thanks to the Powerpuff Girls. See you on visiting day, girls. So now for our next episode, Octi Evil, one of the top three weakest titles in the entirety of season one. I will come completely clean and say I have no idea what this is meant to be a play on, if anything at all. I mean, maybe there's some really obscure reference that I just don't know, or maybe there isn't anything here and it really is just saying Octi is evil. I mean, it's gotta be a pun on something, right? The PPG wiki claims it's a play on quasi evil, but the only thing that I see quasi evil ever being mentioned in is Austin Powers the Spy Who Shagged Me, which was released in theaters the year after this episode aired, so that couldn't be it. 
So, that being said, this right here is something I don't know for certain and would love to hear what other people might interpret this as meaning because it's one of the very few episodes where I can't find any sort of significance behind the name. That being said, this does not speak for the quality of the episode as a whole because overall, it's a good one. The main draw of Octi Evil is the introduction of one of the most iconic villains, and my personal favorite, in the entire series. Him. Claim to have a name so evil, vicious, and vile that there's no other way to refer to his infernal majesty. And I love him. The sheer imagination that had to go into both him's concept and design is so admirable. The idea to take the literal devil and give him a Santa Claus-esque outfit with crab pincers for hands and the sinister snake head shape with bright rosy cheeks and a curly goatee. Him is very off-putting, truly the most threatening villain the girls ever face. And that voice, don't even get me started on that voice. Well, I love it when you girls fight. I think you should fight more often. <laughs> What's cool is that him is actually heavily inspired by the Blue Meanies from the Beatles film Yellow Submarine. I've never seen the film myself, but I can definitely see where the inspiration came from. I also love him's theme too. It's so haunting, so chilling, so dark. Between the ominous moans fading in and out and the hard industrial sounding percussion, sound is such a powerful ally to this show that I barely see in any other animated series. I mean, loads and loads of cartoons will usually just fill generic background music in, but this show had significance, had meaning. There is an elegant attention to detail masterfully immersed into the atmosphere of the show. Sound is quintessential to the success of the episode, imprinting symbolism, imagery, allegory into the viewer's mind, and I cannot stress that enough. This episode is only the beginning, an introduction, if you will, of him's ultimate potential as an antagonist, and I can't wait to dive into more of his schemes. But for the purposes of this episode, episode, he starts things off by monitoring this giant snake beast who is currently attacking the city of Townsville. The girls, of course, make quick work of him and end up using the mangled, twisted body of the creature to play games like jump rope or catch. But Buttercup goes a little too hard and ends up sending Blossom straight through a building and right into the mayor's office, leading to our first instance of conflict seen between the girls. Up to this point, the girls have been pretty cooperative with each other, but just like all human beings, the differences between the girls' personalities are finally allowed to shine through in this episode. Blossom and Buttercup are at each other's throats for believing that their method of crime fighting is the superior way to handle these giant monsters, while Bubbles sits there on the sideline upset because she doesn't enjoy seeing it. Ah yes, a weakness. Just the vulnerability that him was looking for. And so, not being one to miss out on seizing an opportunity, he quickly hatches a plan to manipulate Bubbles into splitting her sisters apart even more than they already are because of their arguing. And I mean, yeah, when you get down to it, splitting up a family in this manner is a pretty sinister scheme. I mean, destroying the city or robbing stores is one thing, but messing with people's relationships, bonds, and by extension, minds, it's a whole other level of targeted evil. This scene of Bubbles crying alone in her bedroom always made me feel so bad for her, but the sheer excessiveness of Buttercup and Blossom yelling shut up at each other over and over again, it just cracks me up. You, you, you. <laughs> I just, oh man. And then him just goes in on Bubbles at her most susceptible moment, talking to her with a semi-comforting words in order to get her on his side. I mean, Octi's her favorite stuffed toy, why wouldn't she trust him? The fact that him uses Bubbles' most personal prized possession as a vessel to get to her and achieve what he wants, I mean, that's exactly what a devil would do. He's being deceptive, deceitful, and he's saying all the right things as a master manipulator who would earn her trust so that he can break it later on after it's far too late and the damage is done. It's honestly scary, especially because there are people like this out there in the real world that do this sort of thing all the time. I mean, not through a doll, but you get what I mean. Also, can I just point out how smooth Him's mouth animations are? Like seriously, compliments to the animators for this whole shot, because that mouth movement is so silky smooth, it almost feels like I'm watching the show in 60 FPS. 
Major kudos are deserved here because this is extraordinary. Like, I don't know if somebody went above and beyond or if they were just that talented, but bravo, it's great and I love it. Regardless, the girls end up getting called out to fight another monster the next day, with him persuading Bubbles into telling Buttercup to fight the monster the way she wants rather than follow Blossom's instructions the whole time. So she does just that and ends up drowning a bunch of people with the whole city's water supply, so that'll be a fun few weeks to months of the entire population dying of thirst, being being unable to bathe and so on and so forth, but hey, at least she got to hit the monster really hard. Worth it. Either way, the tensions are getting higher now, with Blossom and Buttercup just getting into a full-on fight with each other while the professor stands in the way and tries to mediate. They're blasting heat vision and lasers at each other, all the while him just sits in his little room and gets all giddy and excited because he can finally act. That's another thing, by the way. I love how him just exists in this one little room as if it's some kind of studio apartment. I mean, you can like see the wall panels and the carpet on the floor, and he's got his little TV sitting there, which is very old school looking, especially watching the show all these years later, but I love it regardless. I wouldn't want to meet him in real life necessarily, but looking at his room, I wouldn't mind just kind of hanging out there, like laying on the carpet and taking a nap. Honestly, it kind of reminds me of my grandmother's house's basement, especially with the side paneling and such. But next, we get one of my all-time favorite him quotes. Tell me what to do. <laughs> Octi, why don't you say something? Stupid little girl. Huh? I always love the way Tom Kane says that. Fantastic line delivery there. This whole reveal scene with him admitting to Bubbles that it was him the whole time and Bubbles accepting that she was used is a pretty great turning point. And I especially love how the scene goes from purple to red in color choice. There's a ton of purple and red used all over this episode. Obviously with the red representing him and the evil that surrounds him, but the shades of purple that are used not only in the dark room because a lot of the episode is set at night, but the city itself as well as Octi are all different shades of purple. I'm no color theorist, so I'm not going to get deep into a whole the curtains were blue and this represents the character's sadness lecture or anything, but I can clearly identify there is some thematic cohesion going on here. Everything that is purple in the episode is corrupted by red, aka evil. Townsville is corrupted by the snake bees. Octi is corrupted by him, and by extension, so is the girl's dark bedroom. Bubbles, of the three girls, is the most vulnerable. She's gullible. She's emotional. She's more likely to fall victim to trusting somebody her sisters wouldn't, and him sees this vulnerability and runs with it. He's a snake in the grass waiting for an opportunity to bite, and when he does, it completely takes Bubbles off guard, but by then it's too late. And so we're brought to the major climax of the episode, with him possessing Bubbles' doll and destroying the city with his giant octopus form. Bubbles gives chase all on her own in an attempt to stop him with an admittedly cool shot of her flying up this bridge while Octi him rises in the background. It's a really awesome visual scrolling effect that takes advantage of the different layers that would have been used in the cell animation process. Unfortunately though, Bubbles really wasn't prepared to battle him, and so he captures her pretty easily, causing her to scream out and catch her sister's attention, who both zoom off in different directions to rescue her. By the time they both arrive at the same time, we get yet another awesome moment. Dude, I love drum and bass so much, and I love this progression. Pendulum's like one of my favorite bands, and I think I have Powerpuff Girls to thank for getting me into the genre as a whole. The shifting between the two different beats here representing Blossom and Buttercup, which are both relatively barren aside from the stressful impending brass note that quiets briefly before building back up to Bubbles' screen of terror, which then collide into a brand new beat as the two characters realize they're being petty and set aside their disagreement to save what's more important to them. Then the music transitions into the main power Powerpuff theme as the characters have this epiphany and they fulfill the heroic duties by saving their sister. All done without a single utterance of dialogue. It's phenomenal, a truly well-crafted composition on James Venable's part, for sure. Nobody ever gives this credit for things like music or color choice, so damn it, I'm gonna do that wherever possible. I rarely see anyone ever compliment the music composition of the show, which is doing it a huge disservice because the music makes the show. In the end, the only major criticism I really have of Octi Evil is the ending, in which Blossom and Buttercup just fly up, pick Bubbles up, and then him lights himself on fire, explodes, and fades away into thin air. I'm not sure why this happened, or why he did this. 
why couldn't he maintain the Octi form? Like, sure, there's the bond of sisterhood, or he can't handle the goodness of the situation, but he doesn't have this problem in future episodes, so that ain't it. I don't know. It's kind of corny and comes off as though the resolution was deemed more important than resolving the villain attack, which is fine because it's good Bubbles' sisters came to her rescue and set aside their differences, but him just sort of checks out. I don't know. But either way, Octi Evil is another one of those, I like it, episodes. It's still very much an early season one episode in look, writing, and feel, but it's good. Him only goes up from here though, that's for sure. A decent introduction to the character, but far from showing his full potential as a threat. So once again, the day is saved, thanks to the Powerpuff Girls. Representing side B on the third pairing of episodes here in season one is none other than Gazooned Fight, with a pretty obvious pun that shouldn't need explaining. Short and sweet, yet very reflective of the episode's plot. Yep, once again we've got an effective name designated here because this episode is the first appearance of the absolutely least intelligent villains, the Amoeba Boys. I love these guys. Whether they lack common sense or not, they're pretty hysterical villains and great vessels for showcasing the creative sense of humor that these writers truly have. Had. Comedy is a craft that requires a lot of skill and proper execution, and lucky for us, Gazoon Fight has some pretty great moments that are enhanced by this. The city of Townsville, a place filled with some of the most brilliant, clever, and ingenious criminal masterminds ever to hatch an evil scheme. Then there's the Amoeba Boys. The episode begins strong, serious, almost threatening in a way. Like we're about to see the most violent criminals in Townsville commit a heinous act or something. And then the narrator transitions into the complete antithesis of that. Right out the gate, the narrator plays his Uno reverse card and establishes exactly what we're in for. The villains we are about to witness are the most pathetic, harmless, inconsequential creatures that couldn't harm a flea even if they tried. That's how low of a threat threat they pose to this city. It's a great contrast to all the serious villains we've encountered thus far. To finally witness the exact opposite of that makes for an excellent change of pace that I welcome with open arms. Series creator Craig McCracken has said in past interviews that he always had a scale of supervillains for the show. Mojo was in the middle, being able to sway into either serious threat or harmless jokester whenever the situation required it. On the far side of the threatening spectrum stood him, a villain that was easily the most vile of all the girls' foes. And on the far opposite side of said spectrum lies the Amoeba Boys. So, you know whenever we get to an episode starring these guys as the main characters, we're in for some pretty light-hearted comedy the whole Whole way through. Which is great, because again, this series' greatest strength is its balance between the two. So, that being said, what on earth could the Amoeba Boy's evil scheme of the episode be? Stealing an orange. A singular orange. Petty theft is the best they've got. Which like, don't get me wrong, theft is still a crime no matter the item in question, but we've got to remember that this is Townsville we're talking about here. This city is overrun with crooks robbing banks and jewelry stores, villains who turn their residents into dogs, monster attacks on occasion, stealing an orange is, by all comparison, small potatoes and not really worth anybody's time when there's bigger fish to fry, as is evident with the way the girls react to this. Now I'll be completely honest when I say that back when I rediscovered the Powerpuff Girls in 2013, this was the first joke to actually get me to laugh out loud because I just wasn't expecting it. This gag right here. As a kid, I didn't really get the joke, or care, because I just liked the pretty colors that moved on screen, but now that I was in high school at that time and had matured a lot more, I could see this for what it was. This gag, right here, is what sealed the deal for me. I knew I had stumbled upon a gold mine on that first rewatch after nearly a decade of absence from my life, and I was locked in for the rest of the series. Obviously the girls see this as a waste of their time, but what really sells it is how the Amoeba Boys attempt to one-up this crime.
except this time it's in a clean public park, as cleanly emphasized by the clean narrator. Yeah, they really thought that one was gonna work, didn't they? But then, lo and behold, the girls leave and the Amoeba Boys are left to saunter away in defeat when they could come across this keep off the grass sign and come up with the most genius plan for a crime ever. They're gonna stay on the grass. And that's just what they do. These guys are so sad, it's laughable. Their idea of a crime is a minor inconvenience. And like, again, in the real world, yeah, this would be more of an issue. But by comparison in a superhero fantasy, this is nothing more than a nuisance at best. Now, I've made this clear before in the past, but I'm not really a big fan of gross out. And unfortunately, this next bit of episode kind of steers in that direction. But thankfully, not to an excessive degree. Like, yeah, we get sequences where all these healthy people become sick over a short Short period in a rapid progression and thankfully the grossness is kept to a minimum. I honestly prefer that it's not super grotesque or overly detailed because it just ain't my thing and causing all of the character skin tones to become this pale bluish green with these spots sporadically on them I feel is a more interesting and less disgusting way of representing illness. Plus of course it's a pretty good visual representation of showcasing just how easily and quickly viruses or bacteria can spread. I mean Townsville is thrown into a full-blown pandemic and depending on when you're watching this you yourself have probably lived through one to know how crazy society can get when one breaks out. That being said, while I think this sequence is fine, I'm just going to skip past a lot of it because there's not a lot of points of interest here with this one. Long story short, eventually the girls realize this is going on and rush into the city to save people and the Amoeba Boys just so happen to be there. Wow, Bubbles. I love how you literally just crush that guy and all you have to say for yourself is, oops. <laughs> This section is also the first buttercup flip out sequence we get in the series because the Amoeba Boys just continue getting in the way and on her nerves. So she just lets them have it and in response they basically get the memo and decide to leave Townsville because they clearly aren't liked. Kinda showcases how Buttercup's temper can sometimes get the better of her, a weakness that will definitely rear its ugly head in the future. Although she won't be the only one. That being said, shortly after this occurs the girls end up getting sick and so they head home to meet the professor and yeesh! Okay, yeah, there's the gross close up I wasn't looking forward to. This is just one of those things I'll never understand, I don't know. Apparently a lot of people like this sort of thing because it happens in cartoons a lot, but for me, it was never appealing, I don't know. People have gotten upset at me for not liking disgusting facial close ups and I'm just like, okay, I'm sorry for having a rational response to something unappealing, but whatever, I'm not gonna get into the subject anymore. I don't care if other people like this sort of thing personally, so I don't see why it's such a big deal if I don't like it, but that's the internet, I guess. Anyways, the professor's whole spiel here is a long and drawn out explanation that basically just recaps what we already know. It's a bit redundant, and this part of the episode is definitely the most unnecessary because it acts like an exposition dump, but again, we already witnessed the exposition firsthand, so from an audience perspective, it wasn't really necessary, but it does eventually arrive at how to achieve the solution of the predicament that they're in. The antidote resides within the Amoeba Boy's single celled DNA, and the professor needs to collect a sample from them in order to cure the sickness but unfortunately Buttercup chased them out of town and so now the girls have no idea where to look. I do want to point out some more attention to detail here. I love how the sky and color tone of the city are also reflective of the sickly tone that the episode has taken, while with the clouds being replaced with this virus-shaped imagery that permeates the skyline, compared to that of earlier in the episode where the city was full of extravagant color. Now not only are the characters suffering, but the city itself is feeling blue. Honestly, the city very much feels like its own character in the show sometimes, and at this point in the episode it's barren empty, not a single sign of life exemplifying the hopelessness and sheer threat that a life-threatening outbreak could impose on the human race should one ever occur. People are too weak to move, too weak to drive, society basically crumpled up into a ghost town as everyone was likely moved inside their homes in some form of quarantine. And again, this episode aired in 1998, and yet I'm sure most people watching this episode could easily identify similarities between this and real life events that took place decades later. It just goes to show how timeless the Powerpuff Girls can be. Like, yeah, sure, they might portray archaic technology, but the themes, ideas, and scenarios are all persistent things that will likely never go away. Secondly, how can I go without mentioning the score? And so the Powerpuff Girls began to search for the host of one of the most deadly viruses ever to befall mankind.
Firstly, I love how the main theme has been adapted into this, I don't know if off-key is the right word, but poorly played rendition where it feels much more all over the place. That coupled with the narrator's sickness as well as describing it as events play out is just awesome. Dude, I've said it once already, but I'm saying it again. This show is a language arts teacher's paradise. Seriously. The complementary components in play right now are constructed so well and like, okay, here's the thing. A lot of these small details I'm pointing out probably seem insignificant or inconsequential to most viewers. Most viewers will probably watch this show and fixate on the characters or the writing or the action or the comedy and it's like, yeah, all those things are great. But what sets Powerpuff Girls apart from the vast majority of other animated series is the inner workings, which I've been highlighting. The details I never see anybody point out. The little things that, by and large, a lot of shows never pay attention to or completely ignore. A lot of animated series don't put as much time and thought into small things like this. Sure, some do. In Powerpuff, every episode city is different. Until season 5 when it went digital. There were so many unique instrumentals made for individual episodes, some of which persist for one episode and then never even come back again. Like, you can't say these things for the majority of shows. People sleep on these aspects all the time with Powerpuff Girls, and it's my goal to make this known, to make it apparent. There is so much thought, so much meaning, so much artistic integrity nestled in every nook and cranny that even with sequences like the professor's overly long monologue spiel, I'm still paying attention to every minuscule facet of what I'm watching. Some may say, bro, it's just a cartoon, chill. But I just don't think those people get it, to be honest with you. It's not just a cartoon, it's art. I just love this show, okay? Anyways, the girls are found laying on the ground by the Amoeba Boys after passing out and they try to convince them to come home with them so they can cure everyone. But of course the Amoeba Boys see this as their prime opportunity and refuse to go with them without a fight. This is the battle that ensues. Yeah. Quite the fight to behold, I must say. Regardless, they get taken in, the professor manages to somehow stick this needle in Boss Man despite them supposedly being quarantined inside this container, so I really have no idea how this is even possible. Is there not a barrier here? Because it kind of defeats the purpose, and also the professor is shown shortly after opening a door for them to get out, so like, it, it doesn't make sense, I don't know. But that silliness aside, with an enthusiastic great from the professor and the girls, they create the antidote and the cure the whole town in a matter of minutes, and then the Amoeba Boys are free to go ending the episode. It's a pretty brisk ending in all seriousness. I mean, they just skip past the cure like it's nothing. I'm not sure if the episode didn't realize how much time was left and so it rushed through the ending, but the last minute or so of the episode does, admittedly, feel a bit rushed here. It's not detrimental by any means, just kind of gives off the whole, we gotta wrap this up quick vibe, but it's fine. I guess we didn't really need a drawn out part of all these citizens being cured anyway, so the line works just as well. That said, Gazoon fight as a whole, great introduction for the Amoeba Boys as villains. They were one of Craig's first villains he came up with, seeing as they appeared in a couple of the pilots, so that was awesome to see them fully realized in the main show. I think Chuck McCann does a phenomenal job voicing the characters throughout it. He brings them to life in such a fun, silly way seeing as these guys are supposed to be mobsters essentially, just super incompetent. But yes, overall I appreciate this episode a lot as a season 1 episode. Even if a lot of these episodes in this season aren't my personal favorites, I admire almost all of them so so greatly. Craig and his team came out swinging with these, and they kept getting hit after hit. That being said, why don't I move on to the next episode now? Great. Well, don't sound too excited. Once again, the day is saved, thanks to the Powerpuff Girls. Excuse me. Well, with episode 3 already out of the way and episode 4 up to bat, let's go ahead and dive into the next episode of the season, Butter Crush. And let me just start this one off by saying that I don't think this episode is aged particularly well, but I think it's always important to remember intent and view the episode through both lenses to truly attempt to evaluate how this episode ultimately holds up years later. Either way, this episode here is centered all around Buttercup and her first crush on one of the primary antagonists of the episode 
episode, hence the choosing of the title. Admittedly, this is another one of the weakest of the season, but I promise this short streak is not indicative of everything that has yet to come, because trust me, they do get better again. Unfortunately, this one just so happened to be a case where Cup was replaced with Crush in the character's name and then they called it a day. I don't know if there is some sort of deeper meaning here that I just don't know about, but I scoured the internet far and wide trying to get an answer and couldn't get anywhere, but oh well. Either way, I'll get into the Crush aspect of the episode momentarily. First things first, I actually want to dive into the antagonists of the episode, the Gangrene Gang. I love these guys. As a kid, not so much. But but as an adult, I appreciate them so much more. Every single one of them has a unique design and personality that really make them all stand out from one another. Little Arturo is short and talks faster than the rest of the group and has more angular hairstyle, while Big Billy is the roundest and a lot slower. Interestingly enough, for this episode and this episode only, Arturo actually has a different voice actor, portrayed by Carlos Alas Rocky. Following this episode, he was replaced by Tom Kenny for the rest of the show. Then of course there's Grubber, who really struck me as a kid for having a design that looks a lot like it was inspired by Ed Roth, the artist behind those famous hot rod characters of highly exaggerated rats and monsters of sorts. You know, with the eyes popping out and the tongue dangling out. I don't know, I just always had this feeling as a kid that they were the inspiration for Grubber. My grandfather had actually gotten me a rat fink shirt that I would wear at their house as a child, and I always remembered seeing Grubber and thinking he looked similar to the rat on that shirt. I actually reached out to Craig about this a while back, asking him, and he actually responded, confirming that the entire Gangrene gang was inspired by him, not just Grubber. This is like the first time I ever attempted contacting Craig online, and to have him confirm that was really cool. Either way, I'm just a little excited that I was correct about this connection I made as a kid. It was cool that he acknowledged me, but even cooler than that is this shout out that fellow viewer and supporter of the channel, Sinoshroob, got for me. Craig McCracken here, I want to give a big shout out to Shadow Streak for being one of the biggest Powerpuff Girl fans out there. Thanks for all the support. Not only that, but he got Craig and Lauren to sign this exclusive print and sent it to me, which I now have framed in my house and will cherish forever. Seriously, this is truly one of the most meaningful gifts somebody has ever gotten me, and I will treasure it for many years to come as one of my most personally prized possessions. And to top that all off, all of this occurred completely unbeknownst to Sinnoh on the exact 10 year anniversary of my rediscovering the Powerpuff Girls. So thank you, Sinnoh. I truly appreciate this more than you could ever know. But yes, back to the episode at hand. We of course also have Snake, who is a slender, snake-like body, and out of all the characters, his design change from Whoopass Stew to Powerpuff Girls is probably the most dramatic. And then of course, lastly, there's Ace, the leader of the crew. Not only are these guys' designs rad, but their theme song also slaps harder than these kids getting their faces smashed in with a dodgeball. Heck yeah, I could jam to this for ages. Seriously, the Gang Green Gang has one of the best theme songs in the entire franchise. It's fantastic. Anyhow, these guys are up to no good, and of course, before long, the Powerpuff Girls begin to save the day. But what's interesting about this particular villain interaction is revealed in Buttercup's reaction to Ace punching Snake in the face. Laughter, a cheerful giggle, as it were. Blossom calls her out on this, but not before Ace catches on, and immediately finds an out. Disingenuous apologies. Shockingly, Blossom actually caters to this pretty transparent attempt at getting out of trouble, but it's all in service of the episode, and hey, it's never confirmed if this is the canonical first time the girls have encountered these guys or not. Yes, I know the movie kinda retcons this because the girls fight them there briefly, but considering this was A, made before the movie and thus didn't have that to think about, and B, they encountered the guys twice in the film, once in the rain at night, where they might not have been able to see them very well, and then again at the end of the film, both of which were very brief glimpses without any dialogue and thus could have been vague enough that they didn't really have time to get to know them. But hey, that's just speculation. Who's to say the girls haven't seen these guys before? Besides, compared to some of their other enemies, the Gang Green Gang pose a much smaller threat and are kinda seen more of as a nuisance than an endangerment to the city. But hey, what do I know? Either way, the girls let them go and we skip ahead to some time later where they are on a field trip and the gang also just so happens to be there. 
Now this has got to be worth at least one soda. I mean, can you really blame them for trying? They're not wrong. But yeah, as one would probably guess, the episode begins to follow this pattern of Ace and the gang getting into trouble, but using Buttercup as their get out of jail free card. Ace knows Buttercup seems to have a thing for him, and he's using it to his advantage. And I guess now is as good a time as any to really talk about the implications that this episode kind of has, depending on how you read it. Yes, on one hand, it is really weird that the show would depict a five-year-old girl having a romantic interest in a male teenager. Obviously, if this were occurring in real life, there would be major red flags going off because that sort of thing is not okay if that older party is reciprocating. But see, that's the key identifier here. Ace is not reciprocating anything. Not once does he do anything out of line. He never acts in a disturbing way. All he does is get his boys out of trouble. An important thing to remember here is that kids develop crushes on older people all the time. Maybe it's a teacher, maybe it's a celebrity, maybe it's a fictional character, just to name a few examples. I knew plenty of other kids my age in elementary school that also had crushes on characters or people. Heck, my next door neighbor had a crush on Brett Favre and she was very open about it. We were kids. It is something that kids do. The important thing here is that the older party never reciprocates. So when you look at this episode through the lens of the original intent, that of course being that this was just a way to have Ace befriend Buttercup so that the gang could defeat her sisters and then rule Townsville with Buttercup on their side, yeah, it works. There was nothing romantic about his plan. He strictly wanted the strength and superpowers that Buttercup possessed to allow them to get away with things. Even if you do view this episode from the other point of view, I still think this episode succeeds because of its conclusion. I'll elaborate. In the middle of the episode, Buttercup ends up sneaking out of her room and goes to hang out with the guys for the night, much to the chagrin of the gang at first. Well, well, what, what she's doing here, boss? Back up! Relax! Also, I always love that, just how the guys rapidly go from being stressed out to just chilling there. It's amusing, to say the least. But yeah, they spend the night destroying cars and hanging out, basically securing Buttercup a spot within the gang and promising her she can come back and hang out with them again the next night. This is, of course, where Ace enacts his plan and manages to have Grubber trick Blossom and Bubbles into coming to the junkyard to rescue Buttercup, whose foot is stuck. Not sure how she even called the hotline in the first place since she need access to their phone number, but but hey, Bubbles answered the phone, which is a less common occurrence. I'm guessing that was actually an intentional choice here, because had Blossom answered the phone, she probably would have questioned the logistics of the situation and even berated Buttercup for leaving in the middle of the night. But since it was Bubbles who, again, is more emotional and spontaneous rather than rational, she wasn't going to question it and just jump straight into going to save her. So hey, I mean, considering the writers probably saw this flaw in the scheme had Blossom answered the phone, I think they had written it this way on purpose. They found a way to have it so that the way it plays out would make more sense in the context of the show. And I can appreciate that. It's good writing. Sometimes it's important to remember, especially when it comes to plot holes. And this is something I've only learned after years and years of experience myself because I used to make this mistake all the time. Characters are allowed to act less rationally depending on their situation, personality, or intellect. Obviously, we can look on the surface and be like, well, hey, if they just blew up the droids and a new hope right there, then the problem is solved and the Empire wins. But A, that ruins the point of the movie existing. B, we already know the context based on the fact that we've seen the entire film, so going back to criticize it after the fact just shows you already know how it turns out. There was no guarantee that it was going to turn out that way, but because we know how it ends, we can just say, oh, well now this wouldn't happen if that... It's dumb. And C, the dude is a normal guy and very well could have just had a poor lapse in judgment at that moment. People make mistakes all the time in real life, and so if the situation that the character has been written into calls for them to overlook something or respond a certain way because it's how they would react to those circumstances, it is good writing. It adheres to the character, even if a more rational person wouldn't respond in that manner or do a more logical thing. It's easy to say this when you're not the person in the position, and the same is true for characters. Of course, this is all subjective and what I consider to be reasonable in one scenario for a character might not necessarily align with someone else's interpretation because we all interpret things differently. Either way, it sets up the point that I'm trying to make, which is that it's a good call for Bubbles to answer the phone because the girls do end up getting tricked and crushed into these demolished 
demolished car boxes while Ace distracts Buttercup with heavy rock and roll blasting so loud she can't hear her sister's screams. That's pretty dark if you think about it. It kinda reminds me of what the boss does to Marrow's girlfriend in Saints Row 2 if anyone's played that game. Just imagine being five feet away from the person you love without ever realizing that they are about to perish, and if you'd only known that information, you could have stopped it. But ugh, that's true dark horror right there. Ugh, it's making me shudder. Anyway, Saints Row 2 is a great game, and so is this ending sequence where Buttercup just goes ballistic on them for realizing she was tricked. The boys, they put me up to it, honest. Dude, the music just goes so hard. I love it. Buttercup is my favorite Powerpuff Girl, by the way, for those wondering. I get this question a million times, and nobody ever seems to remember, so I'm establishing it now. Buttercup is my favorite, was my favorite as a kid, and still is today. Although I identify my personality more with Blossom, seeing as I'm very studious and very much live by plans and organization, that I operate my entire life on a schedule. I literally plan out every single day, and when things go awry and drift off course, it throws everything off for me. So I very much see myself in Blossom more. But with Buttercup, I've always just sympathized with her getting the short end of the stick. I find her temper endearing, and she was always the coolest because of how tough she was. I mean, this moment where she goes berserk on the gang is a testament to that. Not only that, but it also communicates the idea that, hey, yeah, taking advantage of people is wrong. You shouldn't manipulate people by being friendly towards them, because if they find out the truth the way Ace's plan crumbled apart, you'll get what's coming to you. And he does, so even if the episode does come off as a little strange again when it comes to the whole age dynamic thing, the older characters get the ever-loving blood beat out of them. Literally. Season 1 was so hardcore sometimes. Powerpuff never shows blood in most of its episodes outside of the intro, but this here is one of the exceptions, and it's truly glorious, satisfying to see, and just accentuates how much impact that blow has. It's a huge character moment for Buttercup, learning her lesson the hard way and accepting that. Her beating them up is her accepting her own foolishness. So the fact that she gets the honor of making Ace bleed just empowers that retaliation even more. One final detail I want to acknowledge as a key component of the entire episode, that being that Buttercup never utters a single ounce of dialogue throughout the entire 11 minutes until the very end, where she simply utters the words to her sisters, I'm sorry. It really just packs that extra extra punch of requesting forgiveness for an honest mistake that she had made, and that makes me love this episode for her even more. It really is an eye-opening lesson that she learns. At the end of the day, these guys are villains that aren't to be trusted, and she was making a foolish mistake in aiding them with their petty schemes. Truthfully, I really like this episode because it communicates all the right ideas, even if Again, the concept may look very discomforting at first glance. It handles the subject matter in a proper way and still effectively illustrates how this sort of dynamic is wrong. Great episode for Buttercup, great introductory episode for some of the most recurring villains in the whole series, and yeah, I really enjoy it. And so, once again, the day is saved, thanks to the Powerpuff Girls. On the B side of episode 4 comes Fuzzy Logic, our very first Fuzzy Lumpkins episode that introduces us to yet another one of the most recurring Powerpuff Girls villains characters. And sadly, this is the first episode of the season that I genuinely don't like. Simply put, as an introduction of Fuzzy, it's fine, because it gets the idea across that he's this country bumpkin that lives as a loner and doesn't want anyone else encroaching on his property. It's just that the way events in the episode play out don't really come together as well as all of the other episodes we've talked about up to this point, so I'm just gonna dive into it now and show you what I mean as we go along. Oh, and obviously the title is another play on words, Fuzzy being the villain character's name and tying it to the principle of fuzzy logic, a method of solving problems by answering prompts in various degrees of truth 
truth rather than the standard Boolean true or false. There's more nuance to it. For example, take the traditional question of, is an object cold? Typical Boolean logic gives you the options of yes or no, true or false, that's it. There's no nuance, no gray area, no in-between, and both is never an option either. With fuzzy logic, you could answer mostly yes, 90%, a little bit, 25%, or barely at 10%. This is used more in computational settings than everyday life, but the point of it is to essentially consider the potential of partial truths rather than simply true trues, because sometimes small true true different than the big true true. And yeah, the principle does apply to this episode, but if anything, it sort of highlights the negatives I have with it. That being said, how does the episode begin? The city of Townsville, a community where random acts of kindness are an everyday occurrence, except some people. Some people who've decided to be far, far away. Some people who don't like visitors. Some people like... Hey, you! Get off of my property! Now. Fuzzy Lumpkins, first seen in the special pilot episode of Whoop Ass Stew named Meet Fuzzy Lumpkins, has his first appearance in the official series here and retains almost the same design that was seen there, albeit a bit more compacted with the updated animation that the Greenlit series has. Plus, of course he's not trying to turn the entire city into meat this time around, unlike before. Instead, he's just a fuzzy creature living out in the country by himself, enjoying the nice peace and quiet and absence of all other life. Honestly, this is a pretty slow sequence, but I do like the quaintness of it. Just Fuzzy chilling in his cabin with wilderness sounds in the background echoing throughout the forest. He's got his hat, his pipe, his jug of water, and his trusty banjo. Everything he needs for him to enjoy his lonely, private paradise. Well, until a squirrel shows up and upsets him enough to warrant chasing it all the way into Townsville, that is. Honestly, as a kid, I actually despised this episode, if I'm being honest. I didn't like the way he shot at the harmless creatures that weren't doing anything out of the ordinary, because it actually upset me. Of course, that was me as a kid, I'm not really bothered by that anymore, but I think Fuzzy is a way better character in most of his other appearances than this one, and it just sort of made him unlikable for him to be shooting at butterflies and squirrels in the first place. In fact, I also detested this scene as a kid specifically because there was one Cartoon Network bumper that I cannot find for the life of me, but I swear they would play from time to time that was just an endless loop of Fuzzy rocking back and forth on this chair over and and over again for like 20 seconds straight of nothing happening. It wasn't an interesting bumper and I tried searching for it for this video, scouring compilations of promos and whatnot, but I've ultimately been unsuccessful in finding it. I swear for a fact it exists though, I'm certain I remember it, but it was literally just this loop extended and then the, I think the CN logo popped up over top of it at the end or something, but I can't remember for sure, I'm just, I feel so confident that I remember that. Or maybe it's just a Mandela effect on me or something. Either way, Fuzzy runs into town chasing after this here varmint, only for it to lure him into the middle of the road where he proceeds to get run over by a truck. Now, as the episode had established in the very beginning, Townsville citizens are very considerate and go out of their way to help Fuzzy by picking up his things and trying to give them back to him, but little do they realize that they're in for a rude awakening. And of course, because Fuzzy is antisocial, as has been established by the first few opening minutes, he doesn't seem to have a basic comprehension of the helpfulness that these citizens are trying to provide and ends up overreacting because all of these people are touching his stuff and he can't have that. So rage mode ensues. Admittedly, the way Fuzzy not only turns red, but the entire city background as well to reflect this change in tone really emphasizes the anger and frustration that the character is feeling, while the citizens become these pure white outlines after Fuzzy decks them right in the face. To emphasize he hit them so hard that they basically lost all color is a great choice. This rage-induced scene is easily the best part of the entire episode, and Jim Cummings absolutely nails it in the voice acting department. I'm 
I mean, would you expect any less? It's Jim freaking Cummings. The dude's a master of his craft, and for him to just flip-flop between the calm, collected, soothing hillbilly fuzzy to a raging monster going berserk on the flip of a dime, it just shows how dynamic his range can get. Of course, the Powerpuff Girls catch wind of this and Blossom collects her sisters to head into town. But before this occurs, there is a very brief scene of Bubbles and Buttercup fighting over Octi. Don't! Don't what? Just don't! Oh, you mean this! Ow! Yes! And as charming as this is, it's actually some pretty clever foreshadowing for later. It also ties somewhat into the moral of the episode, but I'll get into explaining all of that very soon. Anyways, the girls head into town and question all of the citizens, which gets them nowhere along with a reference to the original pilot episode of Woof-Ass Stew. Hurry girls, hurry! You've gotta get downtown! It's a mess! Hurry girls, hurry! You've gotta get downtown! It's a mess! So that was cool, but what's really cool about all of this is that it actually leads into the very first special power that is established to exist amongst one of the three Powerpuff Girls that the other two do not possess. That of course being Bubbles' ability to communicate with animals, particularly the squirrel that Fuzzy had chased into the city a while back who tells Bubbles everything. I think I found someone who can help. Okay, now just tell them what you told me. She's talking to squirrels again. I love the idea of the girls each having special abilities that the others don't possess. It sets them apart more and really enhances the differences in their personalities and characters. We'll see another case of this occurring before the end of the season, which is also probably the most well-known special power of all the abilities the girls have, but we're not quite there yet. Bubbles cheeps and squeaks with the squirrel here to lead them right on back to Fuzzy's place of residence, which of course results in him flipping out when he sees the girls and squirrel barge in on his property and so a pretty brief combat encounter ensues, although it really highlights just how strong Fuzzy can be when he enters his rage. What's weird though, is that this is like the only time in the entire series where Fuzzy really loses his cool and rages as much as he does. I'm not sure if the original intent of this rage was to continue on in future seasons, but then they dropped it because they thought it was one note or didn't really need it to tell his stories, or if it was supposed to be a one-off thing for this episode all along, but it'd be really cool to find out more of an answer about that. This does ultimately bring me to the discussion I want to have regarding the episode's moral, however, because this is the key reason why I don't find this episode to be as well executed as the others, or even really all that endearing for that matter. See, Fuzzy gets beat up on here and the entire episode portrays him as a bad guy, which like, yes, admittedly running into town and beating up old ladies, destroying cars and mailboxes, and more, all of which bring harm to the innocent townsfolk, is certainly bad and shouldn't go unpunished, but like, it's the squirrel's fault for bugging him in the first place? And yeah, I totally know there's a a counter argument here where you could say, well, Fuzzy should have had more control of his temper and not chased the squirrel with a gun into the city, but the episode highly implies that he's not the sharpest tool in the shed. Dude might just have a bad temper and he struggles to control it. Yeah, it's no excuse to beat up other people, but I get why he reacts the way that he does here. This episode seems to have some kind of idea thrown in here about sharing being important. I mean, going back to the scene with Bubbles and Buttercup, we see those two fighting over Octi and Blossom ultimately demands Bubbles should share, which ends up just giving Buttercup a way to bash her in the head in a mean older sibling sort of way. But then at the end of the episode, the narrator also makes a comment about Fuzzy not sharing with others. My property. <laughs> How do you like that, Mr. No Share? But like, the issue with the episode isn't that Fuzzy isn't sharing. His cabin is his private property. Obviously the squirrel is a squirrel and doesn't abide by laws in the way that the citizens of the city would, but he has the right to claim total ownership of his belongings. He doesn't have to share his gun or hat or pipe if he doesn't want to. The girls arrived uninvited at his cabin and his response was anger because it's his property. That's, that's valid. The episode almost unintentionally conveys this idea that you're not entitled to your privacy and that you should have to share your belongings with others even if you don't want to. Like, yes, obviously sharing is a good thing in circumstances where the thing being shared is either a public resource or service or item that multiple people have access to. Yes, you should share those things. But if it's a personal belonging that you own that nobody else can claim as theirs, then no, it's okay to be possessive of your things. They're yours. Expanding on this, the town citizens weren't just trying to share Fuzzy's belongings. All they ever did was give them back to him and Fuzzy just overreacted because they were touching the item. 
items. There was no sharing going on here. Nothing Fuzzy did had anything to do with him being selfish in not sharing the items because nobody wanted them. They just wanted to give them back to him, and he misinterpreted that. It's a very weak connection here, and even bringing in the idea of fuzzy logic to the episode, from Fuzzy's point of view, everything is black and white. Either everyone else is possessing his property, or they aren't regardless of their intent a very Boolean perspective. However, the town citizens aren't trying to possess the property. They are returning it, so their possession of his items when they are holding it is only a partial truth, hence the fuzzy logic. They're there because they are justified by their duty as superheroes to protect the greater good of the city by putting down the threat that Fuzzy poses to it. To them, Fuzzy is being selfish 100%, whereas there's more nuance at play here in that yes, Fuzzy is being somewhat selfish, but he's justified. He's not doing it out of wanting to harm other people, he's doing it to protect his things and by extension, himself. Almost like a natural instinct that a lot of animals have with the way they defend their territory. So in a sense, the fuzzy logic of this scenario kind of contradicts the moral the episode tries to push about not sharing being the reason that Fuzzy winds up in prison at the end of the episode. But even then, he does end up sharing his banjo with one of the inmates, albeit likely against his will because Fuzzy probably doesn't stand a chance against this hulking mass of muscle. But still, I just don't think a lot of what the episode is going for comes together very well in comparison to all of the other episodes we've seen up to this point. And I just don't find the episode all that funny either, to be honest. Again, I can compliment Fuzzy rage scene, and I can also compliment the grand climax of the episode where Buttercup brings things full circle by holding the banjo in front of the fire and slowly luring him towards it, only to smack him in the head in the same way that she smacked Bubbles with Octi earlier on. It's a clever way to bring that back around, and I guess kind of illustrates that the character being selfishly fixated on the item blinds them from the intent of others around them, I guess? Maybe? I mean, I see it, but again, it just doesn't tie together as well as it could've. I truly think Fuzzy Logic could've used some revisions or even another go around with one more draft or something, because I see the ideas here that it wants to communicate, but it just isn't very effective in the end. That's just me though. Even with a show like Powerpuff Girls that I like more than anything else, I can admit that it's not perfect. Even this show has flaws from time to time, and this here is one of those cases of that. But that being said, it's nowhere close to my least favorites of the entire series. Fuzzy Logic just ain't a standout episode at the end of the day, for better or for worse. So once again, the day is saved, thanks to the Powerpuff Girls. I get a warm, fuzzy feeling just saying that. But the next episode we're talking about here absolutely rocks. I love Boogie Frights so much, one of my absolute favorite episodes from the entirety of season one, and I can't wait to get into why. Let's start with that title, Boogie Frights, a reference to Boogie Nights, which is either referring to the Heat Wave song from 1977, which is a funk disco track that peaked at number two on the Billboard Top 100, and was relatively successful in those latter 70s years after its release. Or it's a reference to the 1997 film, which is about a completely different subject matter, but did release just over over a year before the Powerpuff Girls premiered on Cartoon Network and was fresh in the minds of a lot of people at that time. The film does take place in 1977, the same year that the original song was released, but again it's about a completely different subject matter, whereas the original song is very much in line with disco, the genre of choice for the episode, as we'll see. Then again, it is likely it's referencing the film because Boogie Nights was directed by then up-and-coming film director Paul Thomas Anderson, who at the time had only created Hard 8 one year prior and has since directed directed other films including Punch Drunk Love, There Will Be Blood, Phantom Thread, and Licorice Pizza. As it happens, Paul Thomas Anderson's father was none other than Ernie Anderson, a man primarily known for his portrayal of Goulardi, a host character that would commentate over various B sci-fi and horror movies, and later on would become the recognizable voice for ABC Television Network from the 1970s through the 1990s until he passed away in 1997. You're probably wondering why I'm even bringing him up because this may not seem all that relevant at first, until I tell you that he provided the voice for the original narrator in both the Crime 101 and Meet Fuzzy Lumpkin shorts for Cartoon Network what a cartoon series near the very end of his career. In fact, this is the last role he is credited for according to IMDb. So therein lies yet another connection between Powerpuff Girls and Boogie Nights. 
Plus, the episode also contains Star Wars references, which also came out in 1977. Needless to say, 1977 was a major influence for the episode. So, yeah, let's go ahead and dive into the premise of this one. Girl, it'll be awesome once we're old enough to go out after dark. Right, Bubbles? Uh, no. What do you mean, no? I don't know. The girls are scared of the dark because of the monsters that lurk within it. Well, at least two of them seem to be, as Buttercup actually eggs them on and seems to encourage the nightlife that she so desperately wishes she was old enough to enjoy. Blossom, meanwhile, seems to keep her cool but is still scared to a degree, and Bubbles is burying herself in a huge pile of stuffed animals to keep her calm. Again, illustrating the strongest dynamic between the three girls that just works so, so well. Of course, Buttercup terrorizing her sisters isn't going to end well as you'd expect, and the professor comes in to put a stop to it, showcasing our wonderful foreshadowing of of the episode in which the professor tells his daughters that while their fears are reasonable emotions to have and it's okay to be scared of them, true bravery is owning up to those fears and overcoming them through willpower. Wise words from a parent teaching their kids lessons, if I do say so myself. The professor is easily the greatest cartoon dad I've ever witnessed, and the way he comes in just to support his daughters and teach them life lessons like this, it's so heartwarming to see. There's some especially touching scenes he has later throughout the series that I absolutely cannot wait to get to, though. This is only the tip of the iceberg. This is an element of role modeling and leadership that you don't see too often coming from a single father figure in most media in general, which truly makes him feel like a one-of-a-kind character. It's just so genuine and thoughtful and really shows how much care was put into writing and developing the professor not only as a character, but as a responsible parent. Trust me, there are a lot of people out there that should aspire to be as great of a parent as the professor is to his kids, because he truly cares about them and would give anything in the world to make them happy. But where the episode directs us to next is where the real interesting aspects come into play, because this episode takes the concept of the boogeyman and completely turns it on its head, taking his super evil fairy tale persona and meshing it with that of a disco superstar to create one of the best one-off villains the Powerpuff Girls ever had. Voiced by the one and only Kevin Michael Richardson. But I, your boogeyman, have just completed step one of my grand master plan that will ensure an end to this problem once and for all. Yep, that's KMR's voice right there, that's for certain. And man, does it just fit the character design so well. I love how the boogeyman has these extremely ripped biceps, like he's got hulking upper arm strength. And the fact that the dude actually builds his own machines and devices himself instead of having a bunch of lackeys construct it for him, it really shows off his dedication to his goals. As he puts it in his speech, he and the other monsters living under the beds of the kids of Townsville have been threatened by light sources for far too long. Hall lights, night lights, and most especially the sun have prevented them from being able to leave this underground disco nightclub, restraining them from the freedom of partying in the outside world. They've had it bad for this long and now the boogeyman is here to put a stop to it, incite a change that will finally allow them to roam free. This leads him to enact his four-step plan that will ensure they rule the surface world forever. Step 1. Cut all power to the city so that electricity cannot be used to generate light. Step 2. Have all the monsters under the beds head out and roam free, terrorize the city and claim the domain as their own. Step 3. Is step 3 really all that? It ain't no step for a stepper. As the sun rises, launch a giant disco ball into space that will eclipse the sun and block its intense rays from touching Earth's surface in a locked orbit that prevents this area of the globe from ever receiving direct sunlight again. Step four, dance for the rest of time while the environment around them slowly decays due to the lack of sunlight that permeates the Earth's surface. And, you know, that's a fine plan that works for a good minute. All of these vile, sinister, creepy monsters rising up from the underground and infesting the city streets for their own amusement. I gotta say, some of the monster designs are fantastic to observe. A lot of them pass by in only a matter of seconds, but you can tell the character designers were having a field day with this one. Just this first shot with all the creatures emerging from this one kid's bed has such a diverse range of monsters with all sorts of differing sizes, appendages, features, and traits that are all just fun to marvel at. Looking in the background of the streets and even in the nightclub scenes, we can see some pretty nifty designs that you may not have noticed before. It's kind of like an I Spy book in a sense, where you can try and hunt for the weirdest looking monster design of them all. Of course, this party doesn't last forever because before long the loud dance music resonates its way over to the Utonium residence where the girls are having trouble sleeping. Buttercup's all into it, Blossom's skeptical that something may be wrong, and Bubbles just wants to remain curled up in her bed rather than go investigate. But much to her dismay, 
day, her sisters head on out to see what's up, only to be met with this really awesome shot where they stand at the base of the city looking up at the giant disco ball in the sky and the monsters dancing all around them. It's easily the most memorable shot of the entire episode. I just love the composition and framing here because it really emanates this sense of scale and the sheer multitude of giant monster creatures that are surrounding them. It doesn't take long for monsters to dogpile on them either. Sure, this feline monster gets a walloping from Buttercup, but other than that, they're pretty outmatched in numbers. But with the Boogeyman being the ego-inflated leader that he is being unable to resist revealing himself, he indirectly gives the girls the idea to take out that giant disco ball. Now that I've blocked out the accursed sun, we're gonna make this night last forever. A victim of his own hubris, something that's sort of hinted at in the episode with how much the other monsters hype him up and worship him like he's some sort of prodigy that will wash all their problems away. Also, I really dig the white suit and cane look. It really goes with the vibe he's going for, although I prefer the muscle shirt outfit just because, again, this guy just doesn't look like he's messing around. Oh, and did I mention how I love this groove and background music whenever he pops by? I know I'm a broken record at this point, but season one continues to wow me with its standout backing tracks to all of these episodes. Another memorable tune from James Venable? What a surprise! <laughs> and yes, remember how I said there were Star Wars references in this episode? Well, with the girls flying up into space to a giant dark spherical object, you can pretty much tell where the episode is going with it. And the boogeyman gives chase in his white limousine turned starfighter. Rather than go through and point out all of the references myself, allow me to treat you to a side-by-side -side comparison. I'll do it myself. Accelerate to attack formation to follow me in. Good to go, kid. Now all about this goes on, so we can go back to bed. And now you're mine. If you can just face your fears, then I know you can find the courage to beat a bit. Yep, it's a pretty great homage that replicates the events of the Death Star Trench Run, one of the most iconic movie moments of all time. I mean, what more can I say? The girls send the boogeyman flying off into space and blow up the disco ball, emitting the sun's rays down onto the nightmare creatures below, and save the day and end the episode. I find it incredibly fascinating that the episode doesn't have the boogeyman perish with the rest of his compatriots. His ship just goes flying off into the distance like Darth Vader's does in A New Hope, leaving plenty of room for a potential follow-up storyline with the character in the show. Show. And it's a darn shame because honestly, I would have loved to see this concept in a later season. A canonical episode where the boogeyman returns from space seeking vengeance for what the girls did, now having to unravel the fact that all of his peers have been incinerated by the light as he's the last of his kind or something. There was potential there. Yeah, I know he came back in the comics, but I'm strictly talking about the show here. All in all though, Boogie Frights is one of those episodes that I think is just an all around fun time and has a sweet moment of inspiration embedded in there with the professor's words of encouragement, which come back around to give Bubbles the bravery she needed to defeat the Boogeyman and blow up the giant disco ball to save Townsville, and the entire planet for that matter. That combined with a great one-off villain make for one of my personal favorite episodes of season one. It's an awesome and creative way to interpret the Boogeyman, so kudos for them on that one. As a final note, this is also the very first episode to feature a unique ending, one in which the narrator comments on how the girls literally saved the day because they ended the eternal night, only for the girls to react annoyed because he's disturbing their slumber. These don't happen too often in season one, but will certainly become more of a common occurrence into the later seasons. But it's still cool to see the idea for alternate endings originating all the way back in the beginning with the first season. So yeah, great episode, would recommend. They saved the day, literally. <laughs> Sorry, thanks to the Powerpuff Girls. Good night, everybody. Fittingly enough, the second half of this episode pairing also falls in line with a lot of the horror genre as now we've gone from monsters under the bed to a magician zombie that's got a ton of ominous tricks up his sleeve. These two episodes are some of the closest episodes we're ever going to get in relation to a Halloween episode because surprisingly, the Powerpuff Girls never had any sort of holiday special centered around it, despite a lot of other popular Cartoon Network shows at the time having those made. You'd think the channel would have wanted to capitalize on their biggest franchise being even more 
marketable with a Halloween special they could air year after year, similar to how they would for Christmas, but alas, sadly, that was not the case. This pairing, and then a few him episodes, were usually the best we got, and would air on the channel during their Halloween blocks in place of an official holiday episode. And I think they certainly serve that purpose just fine, but by no means is Abracadabra a true Halloween episode. It is just a horror story featuring a zombie that serves a more general purpose, which means it's not limited to only feeling like it fits in at a certain time of the year, and that's not a bad thing. I also really like the name Abracadabra, and the show staff must have too, because they not only use it as the name of the episode, but also the zombie villain itself, which is fine, but I think it actually makes this a very rare case of the episode just being named after the villain instead of a phrase or a play on the character's name, acceptable. Despite this fact, the title still has a double meaning. It's a combination of the popular magic phrase abracadabra along with the term cadaver, another word for corpse that seemingly has a less intense denotation in comparison to said word. The name abracadabra really rolls off the tongue well too, it's really fun to say. As far as one-off season villains go, abracadabra probably has got to be the best name out of all of them. The episode in question begins with the mayor talking to the Powerpuff Girls and Miss Bellum about a local theater of the city that he used to attend as a small child, or as he calls it, the theater. What a wonderful day for a celebration. Uh, girls, have I ever told you the story of this old theater? Just say yes. No! The theater used to host a special magic act that caught attention in Townsville, what with the magician Al Lusion performing all sorts of whimsical acts for them. That is, until one fateful day in which the mayor had witnessed himself live as part of the audience. A girl with big bug eyes similar to that of the Powerpuff Girls was brought on stage, and much to the surprise of Al, the girl ended up ruining most of his illusions. And this is where the episode spontaneously gets pretty dark, because everything quickly begins falling apart until the magician accidentally trips into an Iron Maiden and straight up dies. Like, not even off screen, Al straight up falls into this medieval torture device and physically dies right in front of everyone. It's dark, it's metal, pun intended, and it sure as hell caught me off guard when I was older, but damn I respect the show so much for it. Like, yeah, we get to see how this guy became a zombie and the show doesn't even sugarcoat it. Dude, season one was awesome, it's honestly incredible what they got away with. I also appreciate the whole silent movie approach that the episode takes to conveying one of the mayor's memories as a reflection of the time period that it would have occurred. It's got the whole classic piano playing over top of the footage to match the actions occurring on screen, just like you'd expect a silent film from the 1920s to have. Pretty much implying that the mayor is most likely pushing 80 if not past it, assuming he was a kid during the 20s based on this depiction. It's cool though, because the show didn't need to take this approach and go the extra mile to present the past events in this manner, we could have just been giving standard animation with a faded oval border, but instead, we got a full-on grayscale film grain classic film format to depict this poor man's untimely death. Of course, as tragic as this story is, the mayor doesn't seem to care, because no more than a moment later, his cranes come in like a wrecking ball and decimate the entire structure to make way for land development. Oh well, let the festivities begin, yes! <laughs> Unbeknownst to them, however, one of the wrecking balls slams into Al's Iron Maiden coffin, awakening him from his slumber as the magical zombie known as Abracadaver. And hey, there's a concept you don't see every day. Magic zombies. Huh. That's pretty fun. Having been awakened though, Abracadaver begins to roam the city streets, seeking revenge on all the people who laughed at him right before his death. Using his magical powers that I'm guessing manifested while he was beyond the grave because his anger managed to resonate over decades without ever truly allowing him to rest, I imagine. I do feel bad for the guy, I mean, really, if those were my last moments before meeting my end, I'd probably be pretty upset about it too. I mean, this girl literally ended this man's entire career by killing him indirectly. And the Powerpuff Girls get pretty upset too, but not because Townsville's under attack, it's because their father is allowing them to stay up late watching a scary movie that's surely not going to somehow be related to the current events that are happening in their real fictional world, right? This whole panning shot where we see Abracadaver's magic in full force is pretty cool too, seeing as every attack attempt he makes is some sort of reference to the traditional magic tricks most people think of when they think of magicians. A deck of playing cards, flowers, turning a building into a canary in a cage, a classic magic trick, that one there, although sadly the canaries usually didn't make it out of that one. Uh, we get a giant mutant bunny rabbit carrying townsfolk on its back, and of course, giant free-floating saws cutting straight through a lot of the city's tallest structures. 
the mayor's office included. Can't you see that all of Townsville is under attack? I think my hat's under attack! Call the haberdasher! Got your priorities straight there, eh, Mayor? Well, unsurprisingly, the girls, having just watched a scary movie, are now scared to head out into Townsville and fight this undead sorcerer. But, as a fun little side note, this is one of the very few times where the hotline actually has a different facial expression compared to the standard smile. It doesn't happen too often, but when it does, it's worth pointing out, and this here is certainly no exception. I mean, the fact that the inanimate phone has a disturbed look on its face really speaks as to how messed up this whole episode's premise is. Yeah, it's a cartoon, yeah, it's fiction, but really, sit down and think about what's going on here. A likely 70-ish year old corpse rose from the dead and is turning people into trees. Trees! And spoiler alert, the Powerpuff Girls don't figure out a way to turn them back. We never see these people again. For all we know, they're stuck as trees for the rest of their lives. Could you imagine? I mean, yeah, you'll live a lot longer if you stay healthy as a tree, but you're at the mercy of contemporary society, too. You really think they'll last long? especially in a city. Also, I've always liked the lighting of this scene with the girls watching the film and then contemplating on whether or not they should even go save the city. Just the different shades of blue emphasizing the dark lighting of the room whilst being mindful of the TV being the only light source. It's one of my all-time favorite settings, and I don't know if it's just me, but having a flat screen TV on late at night in the present day just doesn't feel the same as having an old CRT television on in a pitch black room back in the late 90s and 2000s. Maybe that's my brain making me think my memory is better than it was, or it's just nostalgic nostalgia talking because I don't really watch TV late at night anymore like I used to, nor have I consistently watched television since like 2009, but man do I miss this feeling when I was younger. Staying up late watching Pokemon or Yu-Gi-Oh or whatever else was on right before Adult Swim came on with something like Futurama, good times those years were. I miss him every day. So anyways, the girls flew into town and they attempt a different approach from their usual method of butt kicking. Go on. Oh, um, excuse me. Mr. Zombie, sir? <sighs> Could you stop destroying Townsville with your evil zombie magic, please? Yeah, that doesn't really work, and Abracadabra ends up making pretty quick work of the girls, each with a different form of magic trick from the others. Buttercup gets trapped in one of those saw boxes, Bubbles gets tied up in a bag and put in a case of water, and Blossom gets hypnotized into a daze until he's able to pull out his endless rope of handkerchiefs and whip her back and forth into the Iron Maiden, suffering the same fate as Al did all those years ago. It's actually strangely poetic in a way, seeing as Abracadabra here thinks Blossom is actually the same girl that was responsible for shaming him publicly. So, in a way, this kind of gives him the closure his restless spirit has probably been agonizing over for almost a century, but that's quickly overturned when the big reveal of the episode comes into play. Now Townsville is at the mercy of that evil magician Abracadabra! Gotta love queuing it up to good old fashioned magic. Logistically, yeah, maybe it's weird that it's never explained how the girls swap places, but A, it's a cartoon, B, it's magic, and C, it's magic in a cartoon. Literally anything goes. Magic is the end all be all to explaining the otherwise unexplainable, and considering this is like the one major time it happens over the entire season, I'll give it a pass because it's in theme with the episode itself. If there was any time the show needed to find an easy out with magic, this was probably the best one given the context. Now, whether Abracadabra was finally put to rest is left as another open ending. Sure, the series could have brought him back again if it wanted to, but it never did. So suffice to say it's open to your interpretation as to whether his spirit was finally put at peace, or maybe he's just back into another temporary slumber until someone else releases him from his imprisonment in another 70 years. But that being said, that winds Abracadabra down to a close. Personally, another great episode that's enjoyable for season one. It's a lot of fun and especially dark for the season this early. Heck, I I'd say it's probably darker than Him's episode in Octi Evil. It's a pretty cool take on those historic stories of bodies that remain unburied coming back as vengeful spirits, mixed with the traditional conception of a zombie with exaggerated magic tricks fueling his special abilities. I really like how Boogie Frights and Abracadaver are paired together, because I definitely say this is one of the best episode pairings of the season, and both one-off villains are probably my two favorite one-offs. Abracadaver's design is great, and his ability to fall apart then reconstruct his form makes him a pretty threat opponent. Raw punches aren't gonna do the trick. It really seems like the only way to subdue him is to fully entrap him in something so that he cannot move out of it. Heck, for all we know, he's still partially conscious in that thing. I mean, I don't know. Or maybe the girls killed him and he died a second time. 
There's no way to tell. Either way, his body is back in that device, so who knows what'll happen to him. Would've made for another great sequel episode, but hey, I guess it couldn't have its cake and eat it too. The dark red color scheme of the city also emphasizes kind of the darkness behind this character as well, seeing as this is usually only reserved for the most threatening villains that Townsville faces, almost always being him, but a few times Mojo or some other monsters, or that one time Fuzzy raged ballistically. Yeah, I'd say we got another winner here, and this series is continuing to be on a roll with our next episode pair as well. So once again, the day is saved, thanks to the Powerpuff Girls. Season 1, Episode 6A, Telephonies. This one's less elaborate than previous episodes, but another one of the kinds where it leans far more into the humor of the scenario rather than an outright evil villain of the week trying to ruin everybody's lives for their own selfish reasons. That being said, the title should say it all. It's the episode where the Gangrene Gang decides to make a bunch of crank calls to the various residents of Townsville, a concept that ever since the introduction of Caller ID has fallen to the wayside, but I can say that didn't stop my friends from doing this to me and others as a kid. Star 67 was very much a thing that would allow them to obscure their numbers and then call me, and me being the inexperienced middle schooler that I was would pick up the phone only to hear them playing sound clips from like a Michael Jackson or Peter Griffin soundboard that they found online in the late 2000s. Can't touch me! Very immature of them, but we were all middle schoolers, I can't say that I expected more from them. Plus, after the first time I just never answered restricted phone numbers, and as such they would always go to voicemail, which quickly deterred them from bothering me. Either way, the Gang Green Gang have the advantage of making these calls on local payphones, and don't have to worry about the person on the receiving end having knowledge of who's calling them. I guess in retrospect, this episode probably is one of the more dated ones, but the concept itself can, and will, always translate to teenagers. Thinking that minor inconvenience to other people's lives are the funniest thing. Man, even as a teenager myself, I never understood my peers that were like this. Now let me say now as someone 10 years older than that time period that a lot of those people never mature even by this age. It's kind of sad really, but hey, we can only control how we ourselves act, so. They of course reference classic crank call gags such as Prince Albert and is your refrigerator running? Arturo even pulls one on the professor where he tells him he won a $10 million and then has him hold only to hang up on him, leaving him in a perpetual stance that he maintains for the entire episode, seemingly never hanging up. Speaking of Arturo, Tom Kenny voices him from here on out, so goodbye Carlos Alazraki, you were fun for the one episode you were in. Now, as for the episode as a whole, I'll be honest, while I think it's a great episode in the humor department, there isn't a whole lot to talk about with this one, but I do at least want to run down the cool attributes that this episode has featured in it. The best aspect of the episode is hands down, the concept. Now, there very well could have been other shows shows that had done this concept before the Powerpuff Girls, given that superheroes were a thing for decades, but at least in my personal experience I had never seen a show do this idea before, so I credit the Powerpuff Girls for its cleverness here because it tackles a fascinating question. What would it be like if the signal, or call, used to get superheroes' attention fell into the wrong hands? That's exactly what happens with the hotline after the gangrene gang trick the mayor into leaving, so that they can use the hotline for their own nefarious jokes. The gang proceeds to trick the girls into breaking into Mojo, Fuzzy, and Him's abodes while they're in the middle of their day-to-day -day activities, leading to some rather awkward realizations once the girls have dropped by uninvited. It's really cool though because this is our first instance of the show treating the villains in a more slice-of-life way. As Mojo puts it, they're citizens of the city. Evil citizens, but citizens nonetheless. Why is it acceptable for the Powerpuff Girls to keep breaking into their homes uninterrupted while they're trying to enjoy themselves on a day off instead of doing something evil? Although, admittedly, it does lead to some pretty amusing moments. I had no intention of committing any crimes today. Then what were you doing before we got here? Sleeping. Before that? Reading the paper. Oh. See, Mojo's just an ordinary guy like everyone else. Totally relatable. At least his butt kicking isn't nearly as bad as when the girls show up to Fuzzy's cabin in the middle of his bath. I mean, Bubbles smacks him square on the head with his banjo, and needless to say, he does not take that well. And don't even get me started on when they break in on him. And squat, and up. Okay, legs up, two, three, arms out, and reach. Get your legs all the way around. 
I guarantee a first time viewer of the episode will never in a million years have been able to predict that that's what the girls would barge in on. Although it begs the question. Where the heck does him even live that the girls could just break in through the ceiling from? I mean, yeah, I guess the logical place would be hell, and the show's never going to come out and say that, but it sure is interesting that hell is just a studio apartment that the girls can somehow get to. Either way, this ends up upsetting the three of them, so they all hop in on a phone call together, and this is where the other cool detail of the episode comes into play. Hold on, Fuzzy. There's someone on the other line. Mojo, it's me. Yes, sir. What is it? Mojo's response to him's phone call. It is such a small detail, such a one-off line that most people would see as a throwaway, but it establishes so much. Awareness amongst the villains of the show that there is an established hierarchy of respect. Mojo's surprise response to hearing his voice followed by a simple, yes sir, is all it took to show Mojo, the girl's primary arch nemesis, yielding to him as a more powerful being. It's so cool and serves as a great example of world building in such a minor way that leaves a lot of room and space up to the audience to fill in the blanks. We can theorize and hypothesize all we want about how often the villains communicate with each other, whether or not they have some sort of ranking structure, or if only certain villains are in cahoots with each other. But it's so cool. This won't be the last time you hear me say this either, but the villains of the show are what make it as great as it is. The girls are awesome for sure, but Mojo, the Gang Green Gang, and him especially really bring so much personality to the table. I always get excited for episodes featuring any of these guys because I know I'm always in for some fun action or awesome laughs. They're all just magnificent in their own ways. But anyways, our villains converse with each other for a bit and ultimately settle on complaining to the mayor. And after him calls into the mayor's office, he gets a hold of Big Billy, who, being the brain-dead lughead that he is, tells him directly that they've been crank-calling the girls all day as the ones responsible for it, which in turn leads to the three of them showing up and breaking in to beat the tar out of the five for disrupting their days off, while the real mayor sneaks on by and calls the girls to come rescue him from all the villains fighting in his office, to which the girls tell him to buzz off because Boy Who Cried Wolf Syndrome has fully said in here, even though none of it was the mayor's fault. And not only that, but then the episode ends with our second special ending of the series, with someone other than the Powerpuff Girls receiving credit for saving the day this time. And yeah, that's Telephonies. Again, it's not a super elaborate episode, but I think it's fun enough. It definitely seems to focus more on expanding on the lives of several of Townsville's villains, seeing as we've only seen each of them once by this point. Although now that's changed and will continue to change with a few more season 1 episodes we have coming up. But hey, I don't mind this one, so yeah, it gets a good score from me. So once again, the day is saved, thanks to Mojo, Fuzzy, and him? Now this is what I'm talking about. Him's most menacing episode of the season and easily the darkest story of the season to boot. Tough love, title goes without saying, it's obviously coined from the expression of the same name, indicating the treatment of somebody in a strict or constraining manner with the intent of allowing them to prosper or benefit long term. Of course, in this episode it takes on a slightly different meaning, or multiple meanings rather, which I cannot wait to get into. The city of Townsville. The city of brotherly love, or should I say sisterly love? Well, technically that goes to Philadelphia, given the Greek translation of the name vaguely translates to brotherly love, so I'm not sure that Townsville really follows that same logic, but hey, semantics. The point of this opening is that it was constructed in a way that showcased just how loved the Powerpuff Girls are in Townsville, how much its residents, kids, mayor, narrator, and even their own father appreciate the good that the girls do, the purity and joy that they spread bring into the lives of others, making everyone's experience for the better. And him isn't having any of it. After the girls are established to have helped an old woman rescue her cat, saved their teacher from slipping on a skate, assisted the mayor with opening his pickle jar, and aided their father in some sort of chemistry experiment, he concocts an evil scheme. And not just any scheme, a scheme so vile and sinister that it's honestly gotta be real people's, like, worst imaginable fear. Betrayal, abandonment, being hated by everybody that loves you. Oh my god, it's just so evil in the truest sense of the word. 
word. And like, I genuinely mean that. Him is a master of social manipulation in this episode, and the way he literally turns everybody against the girls is so maniacally cruel. It's highly hyperbolized, sure, but very metaphorical for the social manipulation that cruel people use in order to turn others against one another. We all know that person at school or work or some other social setting that's all about their own social status and their willingness to do whatever it takes to maintain it, even if it means tearing other people down for their own benefit. And I'm sure some of you watching have been victims of said person. They'd lie about you behind your back, spread false rumors or gossip or whatever they needed to say to turn your friends against you. Some of them may have fallen for it, and some of them may have stuck up for you, not succumbing to that idiocy. I've been in that exact position before. I know how that feels. Freshman year of college, to be precise. It's awful. It's miserable. It messes with your head. And it's arguably one of the most evil, non-illegal things a person can do, in my opinion. Him's a master of finding indirect ways to torment the girls, and this was an easy go-to here because he didn't have to do much of the work. He just had to mind control a few people and let the girls deal with the rest themselves. And I gotta say, this shot of him's head over the entire city is the iconic shot of the episode, no question. I mean, this gigantic evil grin just looming over the ant-sized city in comparison really demonstrates the sheer imposing force and raw power he possesses over the helpless citizens. If he really wanted to destroy this city, I'm sure he could in a heartbeat. But that's not him's MO. He doesn't care about Townsville necessarily, he doesn't want to ruin it, he wants to rule it. It's the Powerpuff Girls he wants, to beat them, to destroy them. They're the one threat standing in his way that matches his evil abilities. That's what his fixation resides on, as depicted in the very first scene with their reflection in the bathtub. I love how tough Love presents this through the scenario he concocts, and it's pretty well backed up in Octi Evil as well. I mean, him didn't attempt to really destroy the city until he had turned Bubbles' sisters against each other. It proves he's smarter than the average monster or villain. He's not just gonna run in there wasting his time and attempting to destroy the city when he know the girls will show up to stop him. So his methods and plans always attempt to beat the girls first before attempting to attack the city, before initiating a full-on direct offensive. That's what makes him my favorite villain. He typically takes a more social or psychological or indirect approach as opposed to a directly physical one, and that provides for excellent ideas and amazing writing. And so, with him's pellets, rockets, I'm not quite sure what these are, but whatever they're supposed to be, they emit this really cool red gas-like fog that just fills the entire city streets and sewers. It's a neat visual. What soon follows is a recreation of the prior day's events. Again, a really effective manner of contrast that those paying attention to would pick up on. The old woman beats the girls with her cane for trying to rescue her cat. Miss Keen and her students all huck apples, basketballs, and all sorts of other objects at the girls. And the mayor, well... It would be my pleasure. Yeah, so Powerpuff Girls was able to have guns pointed at three five-year-old girls in 1998, but just a few years later, Yu-Gi-Oh! had to have the guns censored out of scenes entirely, despite having a much more mature tone overall. Or at least the source material did with how dark that manga could get sometimes. Yu-Gi-Oh! is actually the only manga I've ever read, and I own the entire series from beginning to end. See? Look here. This is my Yu-Gi-Oh! shelf. It's pretty cool. Anyways, as amazing as Miss Bellum's line delivery is there, it's messed up. And it continues to mess with the girls' heads only further as they head on back home to the professor. I mean, the narrator literally interjects himself on their way back while they're discussing what's going on amongst themselves, and then professor just yells at them and chases them up the stairs? Dude, these are five-year-old girls. Like, holy crap, the sheer damage that this could do to them is scarring. And I'm not trying to be funny or, like, exaggerative at all. Like, I'm serious. People consider this one of the darkest episodes of the series, and I'm 100% inclined to agree. Like, don't get me wrong. Yes, it's a work of fiction, but the subject matter it's communicating right now is what makes it as dark as it is. I think that the internet can tend to overemphasize things being more than they actually are, but not in this case, nuh-uh. The deeper you read into this scenario, the more diabolical it gets. I mean, literally the most trusted person in the girls' lives, their father, is trying to attack them? That's kind of messed up. I mean, just listening to the way Kathy Cavadini gives Blossom's line delivery upon being cornered at their front door, it just gives me chills. Chills. Don't you love us anymore? Yeah, you act as if you, as if you hate you. Yeah, hate us. 
The raw emotion in her performance here just seals the deal. Like Blossom genuinely sounds terrified and distressed over this whole thing. I mean, imagine yourself in this position. Every single person, friend, foe, family, or stranger alike. That's gotta be one of the worst feelings in the world, and it's no laughing matter. I'm sorry to get all serious about this in a video on the Powerpuff Girls, but this show is so much more mature than it appears, and it deserves to be treated with that level of maturity. Yeah, it's all fun and games with episodes like Telephonies, but Powerpuff Girls is an all-encompassing series. There are times for laughs, and times for serious psychological damage, okay? This time just happens to be the latter. Anyway, yeah, him reveals himself and the girls realize what's going on, but not before him gets a few licks in. Oh, uh, shoot, I guess I meant that literally, didn't I? Damn. Ironic that these two characters were both voiced by Tom Kane, huh? Anyways, I'm pretty sure this spawned a ship or something, knowing the Powerpuff fandom, but just wait. I haven't even gotten to that subject matter yet. Oh boy. Oh boy. I'm not looking forward to that. Well, the way that him just sort of eats up this whole scenario is glorious. His confidence, his ominous yet jesterly manner of speaking to the girls, even going so far as to bring them in close and pull on one of Bubbles' pigtails, is just so in tune with the playfully demonic entity that is him. And surprisingly, this is Buttercup's first real moment to shine, because while Blossom and Bubbles are knocked down after taking hits left and right, Buttercup's agility prevents her from getting hit, and her lack of resistance to hurting the ones trying to hurt her grant her the upper hand. As she puts it, their real loved ones would never hurt them, so she justifies her retaliation in believing that these aren't the real people, and thus she can fight back. It's a leap in logic that, while not true, as we find out, grants Buttercup the assurance that she's doing what she needs to, and I think that's what catches him off guard. His entire plan was that the girls wouldn't hurt the ones they love, no matter how cruel they were being to them, but Buttercup's misunderstanding actually leads to a success. And honestly, it's brutal. I mean, Bubbles directly full-on soccer kicked that cat right back into that tree, Blossom smashed these two kids' faces in, and despite how much the girls didn't enjoy doing this, they did what was necessary and put an end to him's influence, and they make that clear. or it will be your last. The seriousness in Blossom and Buttercup's tone as they warn him never to make them do that again really just says it all. And you know, yeah, it's kinda odd that him just sees this and leaves, but you know, I ultimately think he won. He did the emotional damage he set out to do, and even if it didn't go according to plan, and even if he didn't take over the city, he did force the girls to beat everyone up they normally would help, including their own dad. So, you know, he might take that as a win. He seriously messed with their heads and forced them to do something they thought they would never do. The sincerity in the voice direction of this one is some of the best work so far. I mean, you really hear the true feelings of the characters in the delivery of their lines. It's honestly fantastic. Like, I'm full invested and immersed in their perceptions to the whole situation. The direness and a bit of contempt they have for him at the end there, it's just incredible. And as I said, it's revealed in the final scene of the episode that Buttercup was wrong after all and they really did beat up the real people that loved them. But hey, they were mind controlled and the girls kind of were out of options at that point, so like, you know, what else were they supposed to do? In summary, Tough Love gets the job done at exactly that, Tough Love. In a variety of contexts here, whether it's the way the girls have to be tough on themselves and beating up these citizens in order to save the day, or the way the citizens are tough on the girls and the girls have to use their love to fight back, or in a weird way the way that him shows tough love on the girls by forcing them into this experience to grow as heroes but also commit an evil act. Again, that's a bit of a stretch, but in a messed up way, he did kind of help them grow. All in all though, I think this episode is great and definitely see why so many others consider this one of the darkest in the series, but there's even more to it than that that I just think goes under appreciated and I hope I was able to shed some more light on some of those aspects here. Day is saved, thanks to the Powerpuff Girls. Oh, nurse, isn't it time for my sponge bath?
And now we have major competition. Man, I hated this episode as a kid. Not because it's bad or anything, but because I just hated seeing the Powerpuff Girls get so easily replaced by the citizens of Townsville by this total jock of a superhero who only showed up five minutes ago. But, you know, looking at the episode now as an adult, it's phenomenal. Once again, continuing the trend of season one episodes just being magnificently well thought out comes the comic book hero spoof episode that really highlights a few different ideas that all seem somewhat more relevant more and more as time goes on. The title being Major Competition makes sense in several contexts. Obviously, a new hero showing up in Townsville and fulfilling the same role as the Powerpuff Girls, who have been the major sole protectors of the city up until now, creates competition. And seeing as he is garnering a lot of fame and attention rather quickly, he is a major threat to the girls and their line of work as well. His name is also literally just Major Man. Major, of course, serving as somewhat of a synonym to super in certain contexts, and given his traditional red cape, emblem on his chest, and underwear on the outside of his costume, as well as his variety of powers from strength to heat vision to flight, he's very easy to compare to Superman. Then, of course, his color scheme consisting of red, white, and blue ties him to American nationality and representation. A major is the name of a rank within the American military. I mean, yes, it's in several militaries, not just the US, but in relation to the episode, this is a loose connection, but it is reflective of a respected leadership role tying back to America, which is my point that Major Man plays in relation to the citizens that follow him. Of course, the term Major also relates to something being important or of significance, which is the primary thing Major Man is seeking, to be the center of attention, to acquire major fame from the city. He wants to be the major topic that people are talking about. Major Man in this episode also has his own theme song, presumably composed by James Venable, although I don't know for sure, which is fantastic by the way Major Man, a hero to everyone fights his battles to the end never giving up now, I hardly know anything about music composition, but if his theme is in a major key, that would just take the cake here, like as if there weren't enough connections here already. I truthfully can't tell by listening to it, so I don't know if that attention to detail is present or not, but if it is, that would be super cool. But I'm no music theorist, so I don't know. Long story short, I love Major Man both in terms of design and character. He's a perfect hyperbolic representation of what the traditional male superhero looked like. Overly exaggerated chest muscles and hulking huge biceps, a massively angular chin with a bright white shiny smile, and Johnny Bravo-esque hair. He's got an exceptionally deep voice played by the one and only Jeff Bennett, who does a great job portraying the character in this episode, and it all comes together as the perfect egocentric spoof character that is easily mocked by the episode, as we see by the reactions of the girls themselves. The core idea of major competition ultimately boils down to a concept that I think is pretty common in all of media across the board. It's a clear-cut case example of people thinking they want one thing, when in reality they want something else entirely and just don't know it. Also, you kind of get a little bit of the you don't know what you've got until it's gone idea wedged in here too a little bit as events play out, but I'll go ahead and jump into the story now. The city of Townsville is on fire! This is the hardest episode opener of the season. Yes, we did have the narrator kind of overreact in Octievil with the city being attacked by Snake Beast, but that was a calm tone followed by a sudden shift to urgency, whereas this one just throws us right into the city is on fire, and like, given the circumstances, yeah, I'd be freaking out too. This serves as the perfect setup for the episode as the girls in their usual flight pattern head on in to blow the fire away, only to be sent spiraling in the breeze by an even stronger gust of wind created by none other than the mysterious maestro, I mean the Midnight Marauder, I mean whoever the heck this guy is. I don't know, the town doesn't know either, but regardless George Jetson is here so that's cool I guess. Anyways, long story short, Major Man's here to take all the fame and glory away from the Powerpuff Girls and wouldn't you know it, in a perfect situation has presented itself before him to prove himself as the superior superhero, in the form of this man robbing an old woman of her green and bolting, which Major Man reacts to in the most overly dramatic and flashy way possible. flying up to outer space and slamming directly into the ground instead of, you know, just 
punching him. And the way the girls react to it too really sweetens the deal here because they see how stupid it is, as experts. So overly dramatic, so painfully unnecessary, being flashy isn't the signature sign of being a superhero, it's getting the job done, it's saving lives. Not that the towns won't care though, they're eating this slop up from the trough like it's a five course meal and they just keep on begging for more show. This is one of the earliest cases of the citizens of Townsville being viewed as stupid. Now, in truth, I don't think the show really got the idea to make its law-abiding citizens utter morons in the spitting image of their leader, the mayor, but I think it could be found that this episode is one of the earliest inceptions of the idea that perhaps later manifested into season two and beyond where the show really began to up the lack of intelligence that these everyday people seem to possess. And again, as a child, this upset me, but as an adult, I think the citizens being portrayed as mindless sheep only enhances the allegory that it's being presented here because it truly does reflect a significant portion of a general population subconscious. Out with the old, in with the new. It's a saying that applies to everything, really. It's what keeps our society going, both culturally and economically. It's just always sort of been weird to me that, like, culture does this to people, too. I don't know, I've never understood it. I don't put people on pedestals really to begin with. Like, yeah, it'd be cool to meet someone who made something or whatever, but like, at the end of the day, everyone's a human being and I'd treat everyone the same regardless of what their social or wealth status might be. Now, this song here is a very well-made theme, but that theme song doesn't even come close to the mayor's most prominent role in the episode. Don't be scared, mayor, we can handle it. Go ahead. We've, uh, uh... Uh, just grown apart, you see, and, uh, well, there's somebody else. I'm sorry, we can still be friends. Goodbye. What? And that's hysterical. I love how this whole phone conversation is presented as if it was a breakup call. Like, <laughs> there's somebody else we can still be friends, followed by the absolute priceless reaction of Blossom just staring into the void while Buttercup and Bubbles try to figure out what was said. It's easily the best joke of the episode. And it's not just the mayor who breaks up with the Powerpuff Girls. The narrator is just as guilty of it too as he starts to neglect talking about them. And even their own dad seems to get swept up in the major man craze. And that's part of the problem here that I love that the episode illustrates. It's that this competition, this being forgotten, only applies to the person being forgotten. A lot of the time, people that put their attention on the new topical or trendy thing aren't doing it out of malice to the old thing necessarily. They just seem to think it's cool and get caught up in the new thing because that's what everyone else is on. Peer pressure plays a role here too, of course, but the fact of the matter is that 15 minutes of fame is very much a powerful thing that can really cause people to get swept up in it. There have been thousands, nay, tens of thousands of people in American culture over the last century that have come and gone, got their time in the spotlight very briefly, and were evicted from it almost as quickly as they found themselves in it. And that's just a sad result of how volatile human interest can be. One thing's in for a few days, weeks, months, or whatever, and the next thing you knew, people people have moved on, leaving that previous subject to rot away in the past and slowly be forgotten about more and more as time goes on. It's just that the concept of being the Powerpuff Girls in this case is a ridiculous notion because obviously people wouldn't forget that they exist that fast, but it's done in service of illustrating the point and that's the important thing to remember here. I mean, the professor doesn't really say anything nasty to them, he's not derogatory in any way, he just seems to think the new superhero is cool and he finds himself being a fan as he runs around the room like an absolute goofball. Some people do have a tendency to just toss things to the side, and sometimes other people just forget, not in a mean-spirited way, they just forget. Did you hear that? Yeah. You know, there's something major fishy about that major man. Hey, did you guys know that Professor could fly? And I love Bubbles' quick line right here. It just, it's cute, it's innocent, and it's funny. Really shows Bubbles' charm and obliviousness without necessarily making her stupid, like the rest of the town is presented to be. I think the final conclusion of the episode is magnificent, though, because the girls catch on to what Major Man's really been up to. He's setting up the whole thing. Every crime, every accident, all of it is just a ploy for him to earn the role without actually having to put in the work because it's all artificial. Whether it was him letting on that he knew about the crimes in advance so that he could always arrive on the scene in time on live TV, no less, or the girls outright witnessing him kick a dog into traffic. It's pretty clear that he's a phony, and sadly, a lot of attention-seeking people in the real world are the exact same way. Putting on shows or facades, being fake, doing things and going so far as to make up incidents all so that they can get a little bit of clout. All eyes on them, so to speak. I don't know if this is clearly more of an extroverted trait because as an ambivert, I don't really understand it and probably never will. 
don't want all eyes on me, you know? It's like, yeah, I know I have an audience on this platform, but I never want to get to the point where, like, the whole world is talking about me or anything. It's not really a goal of mine. I'm not trying to be famous. I'm just a guy that makes videos about stuff he likes. <laughs> I, I don't know. Anyway, the ending to this episode is absolutely poetic in the way the girls use this discovery of his own tactics against him. So long story short, a monster attacks the city and the townsfolk aren't worried because Major Man will save them until he gets captured and start crying like a baby because he's scared of being eaten. Uh, say, did you know that there's a giant monster destroying towns, man? Impossible. I didn't set up for any- <laughs> And now the truth is revealed. He was a scam the whole time. What a shame. Too bad the town doesn't have any real superheroes to come save them or anything. It's the Powder Puff, I mean the Power Puff Girl. Who? You know, the Power Puff Girl. And I find this is really cool because this is the first reference to the fact that the girl's name was going to and most definitely did get mixed up with Powder Puff by a lot of people. It's the first time it popped up in the show, but it was all over a lot of Cartoon Network's commercials at the time, such as this one for Cartoon Cartoon Fridays. Hey, that's the theme to the Powder Puff Girls. What did you just say? Um... So I just think this was a really neat acknowledgement to include. It kind of shows that the staff had the foresight to know people would make this mistake a lot. And they do. They absolutely do. Anyways, the episode concludes in the most fitting reveal possible. Forcing Major Man to reveal everything he did was a scam. The city being on fire? He started it. The burglar and old woman? Well, those were just his cousin and grandmother. And so on and so forth. Utterly annihilating his reputation in the eyes of people and exposing him for the fraud that he is. And like, here's what I really like about this episode. Major Man's superpowers are real. They aren't phony. He does have the ability to fly and shoot lasers from his eyes and stuff like that. But it's his lack of spirit, his lack of confidence in his skills as a true hero, and his hubris that are his downfall. He thought he could get away with the image of a superhero without possessing the actual character traits that would make him one. I think this quote from the writer of the episode, Cindy Morrow, really sums it up well. The idea behind Major Man was that although he really had superpowers, he was such a weak person that when it came down to it, he couldn't fight off a fly. As often as people do, he had such a lack of self-confidence, he overshadowed it with a falsely humongous ego. If he were really the man he pretended to be, he would have definitely been able to beat the daylights out of Fred the Monster. But he was mentally weak, thus physically weak. I couldn't have said it better myself. And so the episode concludes with the girl saving the day by beating the monster and Major Man skulking off somewhere never to be seen again while the mayor goes to reinstall the hotline phone. And when the coast is clear, we get the big reveal. The girls staged the whole thing from the very beginning. Ergo, Major Man's own method of scheming used against him and led to his ultimate undoing. Hence, its poetic conclusion. A taste of his own medicine, if you will. I just love that. Not to mention the fact that this is also the first case we have of a monster having a bit of a personality. The girls seemingly know Fred here with how casual they talk to each other, and it's silly, it's fun, and it shows that even with tackling ideas such as this one, the show doesn't take itself too seriously at the end of the day. And that's that's what adds to the charm. It is such an effective show at communicating its ideas and then just plays them off like, hey, we're a silly show about three super powered girls that beat up bad guys, but that's the thing. That's why I respect this show so much. It never needed to be this good, but it just is at everything it does. It's proof that the team who put this show together were truly a talented group of remarkable people. It's just amazing to me how an episode that I remembered hating as a kid just because I didn't like the guest character for the episode could end up becoming such a respectable one in my eyes now that I'm older and have a mature perspective. People are sleeping on this show, man. It is such a work of art. What I used to consider a forgettable episode is very noteworthy, and I think that it deserves more attention than it gets. So, once again, the day is saved, thanks to the Powerpuff Girls.
So for the second half of the seventh episode pairing of the season, we've got Mr. Mojo's Rising. Now this one's interesting because it's a pretty clear title pun on the hit song by The Doors known as Mr. Mojo Rising, a track featured on the album LA Woman which the band released in 1971. The name of the song is actually an anagram of the lead singer of the band, Jim Morrison, so there's a fun fact for you. It's also relevant to our villain character, Mojo Jojo, who's featured as the primary antagonist once again here, seeing as this episode is about his rise to power, literally, as he gains the benefits of the girl's own superpowers after he convinces the professor to aid him in gaining them in order to make up for the lost relationship that they had. Yep, this episode right here is an origin story episode for how Mojo came to be and why he has such a personal vendetta against the Powerpuff Girls. Turns out, he's a lost member of their family, although his story of how events went down don't quite align with what the professor can remember. And that pretty much leads us into the episode, seeing as it's pretty straightforward. We come to learn Mojo's origin, he fights the girls a bit, and then we find out the full story of what had occurred however long ago. The episode begins with the professor being captured by Mojo and the girls coming to discover that he's been kidnapped when they go flying down into the lab with Buttercup bonking Bubbles on the head over and over again with Blossom giving chase after them. I do gotta give Mojo credit where it's due because his method he uses to obtain the professor is quite a work of beauty if I do say so myself. Mm. This thing is huge, too. What's kind of funny is that the background against the wall showing the professor's shadow actually changes in between the impact frames. And speaking of which, that impact frame. Pretty cool, to be honest. In fact, I'm a big fan of them when they're used effectively. I mean, I understand the complaints about them being used to censor things, and I totally agree with that when they aren't placed properly to enhance the impact of the blow, or if they go on too long. But when you time it just right to match the motion of the image and add a forceful sound effect into the mix where the blow is heavily implied, it can actually make the impact better because it leads your brain to fill in the gap, emphasizing the blow in your own imagination based on the pop of light that quickly hits your eyes in time to the sound effect. It also makes you as the spectator feel as though you took the punch yourself. Again, when it's used effectively, like in this case here. This is also the first episode where we really see Mojo speak in the manner he's famously known for. Yeah, he showed up in Telephonies and Monkey See Doggy Do, but he wasn't established really speaking in Molinguish quite yet. Although here we see this with both his explanations of his emotions, his expression with his powers, and of course the note he leaves behind for the girls to follow him. Here Powerpuff Girls, I have kidnapped Professor Eudonia. I have taken him someplace against his will. If you look for him in this spot he likes to be, you will not find him. He's with me, but not by choice. I took him and he didn't like it. This message is from and was written by Mojo Jojo. Who could have done this? Love Bubbles is who could have done this gag, another shining moment from Ditsy Bubbles. This leads the girls to arrive at his Volcano Top Observatory, where he elaborates on his past. He was once the professor's trusted lab assistant who helped him with lab experiments all the time. Eventually, one day the professor created the girls, however, and he quickly became overshadowed by their superior abilities. Mojo might have had the brain, but he didn't have the charm of the girls as the professor's daughters. Leading to him becoming resentful and seeking to defeat the girls once and for all for ruining his relationship with the professor who seemingly can't remember anything prior to the girls being born further accentuating Mojo's whole plight here. It really is a cool connection that he has to the girls though, I mean, the fact that their origins are essentially intertwined, it really links his arch rivalry to them. No other villain has this close of a personal connection to the main characters. Mojo literally shares the professor as their same father, and he had a hand in essentially creating the girls himself, as we come to learn in the latter half of the episode. Pretty significant origin if I do say so myself, especially because other than Mojo, the only other main villain we ever get in origin for really is princess of all characters, although we won't be getting to that until season 2 unfortunately. The guilt the professor feels for neglecting Mojo in the past is what ultimately drives him to want to help him, and so the two set out to do just that in one of the coolest montage sequences yet as we see Mojo and the professor intently working on building this machine. We've got awesome angular shots that have heavy shadows to highlight the serious facial expressions of the characters, the deep red backgrounds against the dark blues and purples in the foreground, it's all just so visually stimulating that makes makes me admire it so much. All this hard work and effort pays off too, because before long Mojo finds himself acquiring superpowers, leading to his betrayal of the professor and an all out action sequence takes place as he utterly decimates the girls left and right. Every ability that they have, he has as well. And I like to theorize that Mojo's incredible knowledge of his abilities that he just gained and his ability to outwit the girls come from two 
two different sources. One, his experience being beaten by the girls over and over again has led him to become very familiar with all of their super abilities, and two, his superior intellect gives him an advantage in predicting the girls' moves and finding the optimal ways to defeat them. Plus, he manages to blast them down with a finishing blow by firing this energy beam from his helmet that's so powerful it causes Blossman Bubbles to switch clothing after they impact the ground below. And ultimately, as amazing as this combat sequence is, Mojo's victory is what leads to his own undoing as he flies around breaking all of his stuff now that he no longer needs it, triggering the memory of Professor Utonium who realizes that Mojo was actually a terrible lab assistant that he was finally forced to kick out after the girls were created. A completely different side of the story that's later confirmed to be canon by the movie itself, aside from one small detail that Mojo presumably leaves of his own fruition in the film rather than the professor kicking him out. You kinda created the Powerpuff Girls! What? I created the Powerpuff Girls? I'm responsible for their birth? It was me who caused them to be? And that ending, the whole, it was me, ordeal is just the perfect way to wrap things up. Mojo coming to terms with the fact that he himself is their creator and that he basically created this endless cycle of battling the girls with his own hands as he was the one to push the professor into the container of chemical X which set the whole thing in motion. Also, I forgot to mention it, but this shot here of Mojo holding his head while his brain grows has such an awesome coloring effect to its background. Just want to point that out real quick. But yeah, that's Mr. Mojo's Rising. I realize I'm pretty short on this review compared to most of the other episodes I've discussed, but you know, sometimes I don't need to say a whole lot to get all my points across. I love the fight between Mojo and the girls. It's really cool getting to see the team's background designs, not only for Mojo's lab, but the professor's lab as well. They leaned hard into the UPA style for these, and it's especially cool given the fact that this was the team who worked on Dexter's lab before this, which spent a great deal of its episodes inside Dexter's dark blue lab environment. To see two other different styles of lab from the same people, it's really cool, and it kind of shows how diverse they could be with creating similar environments in such different ways. But yeah, all in all, I dig the episode. Great fighting, great origin story for Mojo, like I said, and that ending. It's priceless. So, once again, the day is safe thanks to the Powerpuff Girls, but thanks originally to Mojo Jojo. It was me. It was me. It was me. It was me. So Paste Makes Waste. Bit of an obvious reference to the famous Ben Franklin idiom, haste makes waste, and it makes sense for reasons we'll see as the episode goes on. Now in all honesty, I think this is another one of those perfectly fine episodes that does its job and does it well, but it's not an exceptional standout episode the way I think a lot of other ones in season one are, especially now that we're in the second, aka better half, of the season. I'd still consider this to be a good episode, but on the lower side because really it just doesn't have as many interesting components to talk about as other episodes, yet still accomplishes its goal perfectly well. For instance, the intro of the episode continues the trend of having a different opening from every other episode with the narrator introducing the city, then the suburbs, then the school, all the while getting progressively more redundant the further it goes on. And can we just take the time to appreciate this opening background for a second? The scale here is surely impressive, and given the dimensional size of what the image probably is, I wouldn't be surprised if the crew actually had to stitch together multiple backgrounds here to actually get this shot to be as large as it is. It's impressive, to say the least, especially for the time. As the episode transitions over to Miss Keen, though, that actually brings me to another point I'd like to bring up, which is that for whatever reason, I think Miss Keen's proportions in this episode are seemingly drawn weird. I wouldn't use the term off-model necessarily, but when you compare her to other episodes later on, she just seems to always look a bit off. Maybe this was just a result of the team not having finalized the techniques and how Miss Keen was supposed to look, but in certain shots, especially later on when she's pasted to the wall, she just looks very odd. Considering this is her first major role, I'd say this theory has some credence, but again, maybe it was just the style of the board artists and or animators that did this particular episode. Lanky is the word I would use to describe it. She just looks lanky in a lot of the shots where she's further away from the camera. But transitioning back over to the creativity of the show, let's talk about the kids that Miss Keen calls the names of for roll call. Terry Pitt. Here. Wes. 
West going on? Yeah. Bubbles? Here. Blossom? Present. Buttercup? Yep. Lloyd Floydoidson? Huh? Floyd Floydoidson? What? Harry Pitt, Floyd and Lloyd Floydoidson. Who came up with these? <laughs> oh, and we can't forget the tried and true classic, What's Going On? At least the other kids all show up again in later episodes, but as far as I know, I don't think Wes ever gets acknowledged again, unless I'm mistaken. This is also the first introduction to Mitch Mitchelson, voiced by Tom Kenny, who's clearly the class clown brat who picks on the weaker kids and has a very Popeye sounding voice. You don't look so good. Maybe you'd better sit down. I wouldn't be surprised if Tom Kenny's portrayal in this voice was intentionally similar to that of Popeyes with a more gruff and boyish tone added to it, but either way, it was surely fitting. Also, the way Buttercup just says, yup, and the Floyds being like, ah. like, not even a here, they're just that invested in their projects that they don't seem to pay roll call any mind, and wouldn't you know it, this is a Buttercup episode, of which I'm happy about because Buttercup's my favorite of the three, so more time with her in the spotlight is always fine by me. Unfortunately, the subject matter of Paste Makes Waste paints Buttercup in a sour light because she, along with Mitch and the Floyd Joinson brothers, end up picking on poor old Elmer Sklu. An obvious parody on Elmer's glue, of which I don't know how the glue company must have felt in this show having portrayed this poor introverted nerdy kid obsessively eating their glue and being made to be a horrible monster for doing so, but hey, the company lasted far beyond the airing of the episode so it must not have hurt their stocks too much at the time. I always felt bad for Elmer though. As a kid who was bullied, it really does suck and it's completely unwarranted most of the time and Luckily, the episode does a good job of portraying why it's ultimately wrong. If you bully someone, they'll turn into a giant glue monster and destroy everything, terrorizing you and potentially scarring you for life. So moral of the story is don't bully anyone because it's wrong. Sarcasm aside, I do think that the way the characters all respond to this scene really makes it though. I mean, the way Buttercup just kind of gets carried away and all the excitement shows her immaturity and enthusiasm to the point where she takes it too far and the way that the rest of the class reacts after it occurs serves as an eye-opening moment for her. It's a pretty accurate accurate portrayal of real life again, too. I mean, I can think of times where I've been on both sides. What starts as harmless teasing at first can quickly escalate into something more. People lose control, and more people sometimes jump on board and take it a lot further than the first person, which was just intended as a harmless joke. Of all the girls to be the one to get carried away, Buttercup absolutely makes the most sense as the choice for this topic, so kudos to the show for understanding its characters and what scenarios would be fitting for which girl to deal with it. Also, here's a fun easter egg. Take a look at this daddy poster in the background. Kinda messed up portraying an alcoholic deadbeat dad in a kid's show, but it was a different time. Anyways, now we're getting into the real absurdity of the episode, the paste monster. So like all good villain origins, it begins with a nuclear power plant. Although this ain't your traditional everyday nuclear power plant, oh no. This is the Industrial Children Creel Cord. I don't know what a Creel Cord is, but I think this might have been meant to say Serial Corp? as in Serial Corporation? Not sure. Either way, apparently Serial is nuclear in the Powerpuff Girls universe, and so there are all sorts of departments located here. Most notably, the Marshmallow Toxic Filter site, where they presumably filter out the toxic waste that permeates children's breakfast cereal. And with how much sugar is in those things, you know, this kind of wouldn't surprise me. So by a stroke of silly luck, this guy spills some toxic waste, throws the cloth away, gets thrown in a garbage truck, a fly lands on it and consumes the waste, becoming mutated. The garbage truck drives all the way to Pokey Oaks, the fly flies out of the truck and lands in Elmer's jar of paste where he proceeds to swallow the fly whole. What a sequence that was. And it only gets crazier when Elmer becomes this giant paste monster with what I consider to be one of the coolest lighting effects yet. The animators added this neon green glowing outline to both the fly, the rag, and Elmer, along with all of his glue, which gives it this caustic radiation effect that makes it really pop off the screen. I find it so fascinating that they achieved this effect because it's like there's an added layer of bright green light that pops off the hand-drawn backgrounds. It's just another one of those pristine examples of the show going above and beyond. Like, the episode did didn't need this effect, they could have just given it a plain green outline or even the standard black, but they went the extra mile to give it this extra glowing pizzazz that makes it more visually unique, and I respect it so much for that. But this is the Powerpuff Girls after all, and it wouldn't be Powerpuff Girls without some awesome action sequences starting with Elmer terrorizing the bullies that picked on him at the school. The way he just kinds of picks them all up with his fingers as they all run away helpless.
hopelessly is actually kind of terrifying when you think about it. I mean, just imagine that for a second. Like, this giant paste creature absorbs you into his hand and then sends you flying into an airplane as a five-year-old child. I do appreciate the children cheering over the destroyed school, though. That was <laughs> amusing. And while I think the school action sequence is fine enough, it only gets better when the girls give chase after Elmer into the city, what with him using these skyscrapers as buildings for recreational sport, and then, of course, the way he's apparently just stuck all sorts of things to buildings all over the place. Actually, going off of the more subtle hints at humor, such as the children cheering from earlier, there's several of these during the sequence here, whether it be this detail where Elmer picks up one school bus and then he grabs another bus that's literally labeled another bus, or this one brief part where he scrapes this poor guy that was pasted to the underside of his foot where they decided to utilize the famous stock sound effect known as the Howie scream. That name may not sound familiar to some of you, but I can almost guarantee you've heard it before. <laughs> Which is a fitting place to put it. I mean, if they were going to put it anywhere, that's the best place. So, yeah, it's not that distracting, despite being a recognizable soundbite from other media. And then, of course, the big battle between Buttercup and Elmer here is the ultimate climax that leads to the resolution that Buttercup has been battling with all episode. Apologizing. Whether she's put on the spot in front of the class or her sister's being absorbed into the glue monster's body, Buttercup attempts to find every possible excuse or outlet to escape from the pressure of admitting that she was wrong. It's as if she treats it like a sign of weakness or an acceptance of defeat. But really, the metaphor just goes to show that being a bully can lead to unintended results or unforeseen consequences, which is a very real outcome. Not with all bullying cases, mind you, but with some. In this instance, maybe it wasn't Elmer's intent to retaliate, but once he was put in a position to serve those bullies right, he completely took advantage of that. In my humble opinion, he's justified in doing so. Sure, violence doesn't resolve more violence, but I completely understand where he was coming from. It's only when he targeted other kids besides his harassment or Miss Keene or the citizens where he became morally in the wrong. And I get it, some people won't agree with the idea that Elmer had the right to punish the bullies, but that's a subjective matter, and we don't need to get into that because that's not the point of the episode. The point is Buttercup accepting that what she did was wrong and being humble enough to admit that. Overcoming her own ego to apologize is a very fitting lesson for the character to learn, and I find that the method this episode takes for her to reach that conclusion is very in theme with the grand ideas of the show itself. if I picked on you, and I'm sorry if I called you a paste eater. E.G. also really sells the apology. I mean, her delivery of the line just sounds spot on in its authenticity. This is a word I find I'm using to describe the girls' performances a lot lately. Authentic. But I mean, they are. All three of the women portraying these girls do an astronomically phenomenal job at putting a childish spin on the voices. The way they stutter or inflect their pitch really makes it feel like these girls are kids. Sure, their dialogue has a more mature vocabulary than your typical five-year-old, but the way they act and the way they communicate and the way they inflect their voice is what sells the idea that they're so young. It's just a reflection of how masterfully talented everybody involved with this show is, truly. And again, while I don't love Paste Makes Waste, which now you can see how the title ties in, it's still very effective in communicating its idea to the audience. Very well done. Oh, Buttercup, we love glue. So once again, the day is saved, thanks to the Powerpuff Girls. Immediately following our Buttercup episode comes our first Blossom-centric episode of the season in Ice Sore, which, if you ask me, is a pretty underrated episode in terms of its construction because while a lot of episodes in the season definitely feel like their own mini-movies of sorts, I feel like this one really takes the cake in that regard. Intense is the perfect one-word summary to describe Ice Sore because the sheer intensity that is being conveyed here is felt all over the episode in various ways. Whether it's the intensity of the heat that the characters are suffering through, the intense jealousy that Buttercup and Bubbles hold for their sister, or the intense pressure of that final scene. There is no other episode in the season that stresses me out this much. Just by watching the characters melt under the scalding, hot, fiery rays of the sun beam down on them, whew, 
This is debatably the best Blossom focused episode in the entire series. I think there are other competitors to be sure, but this one's up there, no doubt, and definitely in the top episodes of season one, without question. Now as for the title, Eyesore is of course referring to the phrase eyesore, and while Blossom certainly isn't a sight for sore eyes, if you look at the figurative definition of the phrase, it's referring to something offensive to view, in which case, Blossom's ice breath is very much offensive to Buttercup and Bubbles here because Blossom is obsessed with showing it off in every way she can, and her sisters are getting sick of it being rubbed in their faces all the time. But I mean, in all fairness, who wouldn't want to mess around with a new superpower that they just discovered that morning, you know? I can't necessarily blame Blossom for being so fixated on it, because this is the same idea as any old kid discovering they have a hidden talent or something, like that kid in your class that can do a funny voice no one else can do, or the girl that can put her foot behind her head, or the one kid in fifth grade who would always brag because he could chug an entire milk bottle in two seconds. Yeah, that's right Kyle, I remember you, even though you were only in my school district for one year and we barely ever spoke to each other, but I haven't forgotten, you bragged all the time. But I digress, let's talk about the episode's opening. The city of Townsville! Oh, and man, is it hot. I absolutely love this heat effect that the show has implemented here. One thing I can't figure out about it though is if this was a post-processing effect that they did digitally after the fact, or if they took a more traditional approach by filming a thin volume of water being sloshed around and slowed down, and layering that footage over top of the animation. You can definitely tell by looking at the footage that the drawings were animated traditionally here. This is certainly a post effect, and I'd be curious to know what method they used to achieve it. And again, this is another case of the show going above and beyond. They didn't have to implement this. They didn't have to take the extra time. The drawings themselves would have been suffice enough between the intense light that is captured by the sun, which is its own light manipulation effect that I appreciate for really illustrating the bright heat, to the warm shades of reds and origins that permeate the city and its backgrounds, as well as the skin tones of the sunburnt citizens. There's even red cars here, like it's all a visual amalgamation of fire, and the warmth of this establishing sequence is communicated beautifully. I'm sweltering just looking at this. This then then brilliantly transforms into the next scene as we see the professor sipping on a scalding hot cup of coffee before spilling it on himself, burning his hands, and then transitioning to a boiling pot of oatmeal on the stove, which we quickly learn Buttercup is making for her sisters. Okay, so there's a lot to unpack here. For starters, this is very much a textbook case of siblings handling a scenario in their own way. Bubbles and Blossom are hungry, but Buttercup doesn't want to be rushed, but she ends up just rushing through it anyways by zapping the oatmeal with her laser eyes and then rapidly taking it off of the stove. I don't know why I find this so amusing, but the thought of Buttercup being patient and then her sister's getting on her nerves so she just says, ah to heck with this, and zips right through it is very much in line with her approach, and then it winds up making the oatmeal way too hot as a result. On top of this, there's Bubbles, who throughout this entire scene is copying her older sister and the things she says very much like a younger sibling would. It's adorable. The way she says things like, too hot is cute, and you can tell that Tara was having a ton of fun with this while she was recording it. See, that's the thing about this show too. Like, listening to the way the characters speak, you can visualize how the voice actors portraying them felt in the moment. Every single episode, they come in with this genuine desire to give the best performance possible. They clearly want to be there. This isn't just another job for them, and considering that at this time most of the cast were relatively unknown, it really gives it a family-like vibe. There's no sort of highly recognizable celebrity in the mix. I mean, sure, E.G. Daly was known as the voice of Tommy Pickles, so she was probably the most recognizable cast member, either her or Roger L. Jackson, who had done the main voice of the Scream franchise, but that's about the extent of it. Tom Kenny, Tara Strong, Jennifer Hale, and Tom Kane all sort of had their careers launched by Powerpuff Girls. I mean, Tom Kenny was one one year away from voicing Spongebob, but this show came first. And see, that's the thing. Most of this show's cast were relatively lesser known faces at the time, especially so because the interest in voice actors really didn't pick up until the boom of social media took over in the early 2010s. These weren't a bunch of celebrities fulfilling a contract or anything like that. It was a group of people coming together to have fun and act out a show. As with the network and with Craig and everyone else involved with its production, I'm sure none of them had any idea just how big Powerpuff Girls would become you can tell they're all just having fun. Now, even though I think this show is as amazing as it is, it's definitely not without its flaws, such as this line of buttercups getting cut off for some reason. This oatmeal's too hot! Too hot! So boring! 
Maybe this was a production error, maybe it was just poor timing, maybe the episode was one second too long and they had to cut something somewhere. Not sure, but either way, I've always noticed that weird audio cutoff whenever I watch the episode, and now you'll never unnotice it too. But either way, this is the command that leads to Blossom discovering she has a new power, Ice Breath. This was hinted at briefly in Fuzzy Logic first, but Ice Sore is where it gets made to be more concrete. The girls are capable of developing individual powers that their other sisters cannot. According to the show, Bubbles' is the ability to speak Spanish, although I think this is just an oversight because as the show goes on, Blossom is established to have some familiarity with Chinese. And I think Bubbles' true special power, while not being stated, is her ability to communicate with animals. We've already seen it in Fuzzy Logic and will continue to in other episodes like Helter Shelter and Stray Bullet to name two examples. Buttercup seemingly doesn't get acknowledged in this conversation though, but hey, maybe we'll get to discover what her special power might be, right? So what are you gonna do with it? I know, I know, make the floral ice like in Tom and Jerry. That's my favorite. First of all, shouts out to Tom and Jerry. I love those classic cartoons as well. Secondly, the episode she's referring to is the episode known as Mice Follies, in which at one point the floor becomes ice and Tom starts figure skating around while the baby mouse spins a bunch of desserts around to create different colored lights. It's a fun gag and watching this cartoon again has just unleashed an entirely new wave of nostalgia all over me because I remember when I was in like kindergarten in 2002, I would come home every single day at 11.30 to 11.45. My mom would put a frozen pizza in for me, and I would plop down in front of the TV and watch Tom and Jerry from noon to one after eating lunch every single day. Man, those were the days. I miss it. The ice effects and backgrounds that the show then illustrates throughout the entire episode are extremely pretty to look at, and the added reflection effects as the girls slide across the ground are a nice touch as well. Even the professor's reaction to finding out Blossom has a special power is great, because while he does have a concerned tone at first when he sees the floor is covered in ice, he quickly shifts it to a more supportive fatherly role when he discovers that Blossom is learning, she has a new ability. The professor's ability here to immediately recognize, oh, hey, Blossom didn't mean to do this, is the kind of parental understanding that some people will go their whole lives without ever learning, which is a shame. He doesn't get mad at her. He realizes she's a learning child, and she is struggling with how to interpret this new ability. Is this a good thing? Should she be afraid? She doesn't know, and she's looking to her father for advice on what to do. And I love the way his face gets frozen for the remainder of his time on screen, especially when he winks to Blossom and the ice cracks around his eyelid. It's just great. Ice Sore once again nails yet another concept spot on. It showcases the kind of relationship the professor has with his three daughters as a tried and true dad looking out for his kids. The girls head on over to school where the air conditioning is broken, and so of course Miss Keen does the logical thing by sending all of the children outside to go play while the AC repairman attempts to fix it for her. A death sentence, if we're being honest. Teacher, I made a drawing. Look, Teddy. I don't care. Now go play! This poor kid. Like, he just goes up to Miss Keen and shows her this magnificent drawing he made of him and his dad dying of heat stroke, and she's just like, I don't care, Billy. Go play. And the playground scene is absolutely brutal. I mean, these kids are treating this almost like they're being tortured with how strong the heat is. It's so overdramatic, but the intensity of the sun's lighting and the heat waves being brought back in, you can totally see why. I especially love in a lot of these shots how you can see that the sun is massively overpowering the scene. The intensity, there's that word again, of the heat waves bear down on everyone below, you could probably be convinced that the earth was hurtling into the sun with how rapidly it was growing in the sky. And of course, how could I go about this episode without talking about the score? The backing track in this scene is absolutely gruesome. Wow. It's so discomforting, and it exhibits how demanding it must be on these kids' poor bodies to attempt to withstand the molten sun. The perfect scenario for Blossom to utilize her new power, conveniently enough. And after her sisters tell the other kids who catch wind of this, they all begin to beg her to use her ice breath to help them cool down. And after a little bit of hesitation due to the professor's words echoing in her ears, she eventually caves and creates a giant winter wonderland for all the kids to play in.
And yet again, the music, designs, and backgrounds all cater to a rather refreshing juxtaposition from the intense heat that was plaguing the playground a few moments ago. Now we have light chimes resonating through the score with cool blues and interestingly enough, a gradient that blends into green along the horizon. It's a fascinating yet odd color choice, but it works in these shots here, and I love the added detail of the snowflakes in the sky. It's the little things that really buff up the stylization of the show. Of course, this brief relief doesn't last for very long because pretty soon the girls get called into town to stop a robbery with some criminals hopping into a vehicle with a getaway driver. And because it's as hot as it is, the tires of the car end up getting so hot that they just pop off completely and the car is stuck driving on its bare wheels, letting out this intense screeching sound while the car continues skating along the ground. I always liked this moment, just watching the wheels start to glow red before exploding and then hearing it scrape across the ground, it was always so striking to me. And if I had to guess, a lot of this probably had Gendy Tartakovsky involved with it, given that it's an action scene, especially with how well it's paced and how aggressive the music kicks in to complement it. Also, they have gray guns because this was season one and they could get away with that. What really makes this scene though, is when Blossom comes flying in and attempts to stop them with, go figure, their ice breath. Even though that's not the best approach she could take to stop their vehicle given the scenario, this is great for a number of reasons. One is that it shows Blossom is completely swept up in her new ability that she doesn't want to use anything else to solve her problems. Even though she might have a better option available, she only wants to use the new power for everything. Two is that it, once again, contrasts against the intensity of the episode, with the criminals being chased and driving away, which is what this episode is all about. Also, I love this shot of the car skating down the hill because the light blue road placed against the dark orange and yellow buildings just makes for a cool looking shot. And three, it is the mistake that Blossom needs to make in order to realize that she got carried away and disobeyed the professor's words, which is the driving force for why she promises to never use her power again from that point on. Blossom is loyal. She's very much about following the rules and doing what's right. And by not allowing criminals to escape, but also using the power recklessly, she ended up freezing a bunch of people on accident who she then profusely apologizes to. That poor tree man, dang. And just when we thought we weren't gonna get an appearance by the mayor, he is seen in his office with Ms. Bellum looking directly into the sun with his telescope, exclaiming, I'm trying to find the source of this heat! Oh, goodness gracious, great ball of fire! That's a song reference, which I only picked up on after having seen Top Gun for the first time a few years ago. Good movie, by the way, and so was the sequel. Oddly enough, the mayor's not a complete idiot in this episode. Sure, he's oblivious, but he is the one to pick up on the giant fireball coming from space that seems to be the source of all the heat that was afflicting the town that day. Which is cool, because up until this point, the episode doesn't really let on that it's a giant fiery meteor of some kind that's about to strike the Earth, but rather just kind of red herrings you into believing it's the sun. You don't really expect it at first, but once the narrator chimes in commenting that heat seems to be getting to an unnatural level, combined with the mayor discovering it's a giant fire Fireball, it all makes sense. I mean, most people probably wouldn't just assume there's a fireball headed towards them. They probably just imagined it was really hot that day. And this is where things really heat up, because now that the threat is visible, everybody realizes the impending doom that's headed straight for them. This is life or death. This could be the end of their entire city, or nay, the entire planet as they know it, and they're helpless as they watch above. This feels like something right out of a movie, honestly. I mean, the rising action leading up to this is executed perfectly upon the realization that they're about to all die while Blossom sits helplessly in defeat, feeling terrible about what she's done. Bubbles and Buttercup attempt to fly up to the meteor to stop it, but their efforts are in vain because even they can't seem to handle the heat that this giant space rock is giving off, so they fly back to Blossom begging her to use her new power because this is now a situation where it is applicable to the current problem. It highlights an inner struggle that Blossom has to deal with of learning to know when an ability like this is called for in the appropriate situation. Obviously, she feels terrible guilt for what she did, and it takes up until the last possible moment for her to finally jump in and use it. But the drama is justified because of how she handles her emotions. Her pride was hurt, and that's probably the most sensitive thing Blossom has going for her. She takes her role as a hero so seriously that one small mistake like this completely sends her into this downward spiral because 
because she doesn't handle failure well, which I think is an absolutely magnificent thought for an inner struggle that Blossom would have to face. As the next few seasons go on, you'll see that Blossom unfortunately doesn't get as many episodes centered on her as the other two, which is part of the reason why I want to prop this episode as much as I am. Because I really think this is a great idea, love the way it's executed, and Blossom doesn't get that many episodes. This one doesn't spend the entire time on the concept too, it's just sort of introduced to her, but then there's enough there for that drama and tension to enhance the episode without it detracting from the greater plot at hand. As a few final notes before I end off my thoughts on Ice Soar, I just want to add that I think the anticipation in this final climax is phenomenal, and the team did a great job at portraying a rising action climax and falling action sequence in such a perfect way, and I love the extremely washed out hues on the characters to exemplify the brightness of the giant fireball. As if there wasn't enough intensity throughout the entire episode, this is where it maxes out with how strong that light is, combined with the screen shaking and again the color choices that complement said lighting. Bubbles' scream as Buttercup pulls her back just says it all really. The sheer level of helplessness that they feel knowing they won't be able to save the city, knowing that they're about to witness thousands of people perish from this catastrophe. This shot here in particular with the defeated looks on their faces captures the mood perfectly. It's just masterful. Of course in Blossom's shining moment she does muster up the guts at the last second to freeze the fireball into an ice ball and allows the day to be saved after the girls smash it into a bunch of small snowflakes. We could really use a giant fireball about now. <sighs> As one final point that I'd like to mention, I love the use of leitmotif in this episode. I'm not a sound theorist by any means, but I do at least understand how leitmotifs are used, and I would say that this episode has an effective incorporation of one, in the form of Blossom's ice breath, which plays at a few points throughout the episode. Honestly, you could probably write a 10 minute theory video on this concept alone, and you could probably do it better than me, but either way, I love its incorporation here, and assuming that this was all Jim Venables doing, then good for him at succeeding yet again. Again, bravo. Yeah, so um, if it wasn't already apparent by the sheer amount of time I spent on this one, I really love Ice Sore. I think this is one of the best Blossom episodes, if not the best, and one of the best episodes of the season, bar none. It really reminds me of a film in a lot of ways, just condensed down into 11 minutes. It's extremely experimental with a lot of the special effects it pulls off, and tells a compelling character story, and has great artistry to it. Not much negative I can really say about this one. I still think you're cool. <laughs> so once again, the day is saved. Thanks to the Powerpuff Girls. So long, everybody. And the streak of amazing episodes isn't over yet because Bubble Vicious comes out swinging and hits a 500 foot Grand Slam home run. This one right here is the iconic Bubbles episode. This is Tara Strong's favorite episode of the entire series because it's the episode where Bubbles really comes out of her shell, so to speak, and proves herself to be just as tough as her two older sisters. It's one of the best single character centric episodes in the entire series and one of the best of the season, bar none. The title is also incredibly clever. Bubble Vicious, a play on the Bubblicious brand of bubblegum, changing to a more serious and aggressive tone which matches Bubbles' vicious behavior throughout the duration. As for the opening, this episode introduces the simulation chamber which appears in this series for the one episode and then never again. Although it does appear in a promo bumper and in the cherished power of the female music video, it's a cool concept and explains how the girls stay in tip top shape for crime fighting even when there's a lull in evil activity, but it's a shame the show never really took advantage of this concept again after this. This opening battle with Buttercup fighting the slug monster is so well paced and just shows how amazing the directing of the action is here. There's just a strong sense of knowing exactly how everything in the battle is going to play out. That moment moment where she sort of gets stuck inside and then proceeds to burst through its membrane is just so raw. What I really like, however, isn't the simulation room itself, but the lighting around the simulation room. This is a common lighting scheme that the series uses a few times throughout, but it's just such an interesting choice to have an almost entirely blue frame with nothing but blacks and a few whites to fill the characters and eyes, and then the only other color here is a pinkish red shade to represent the lighting. You wouldn't really expect this blend of colors to mix 
well. Like red isn't a typical shading color in dim light, but in these laboratory environments, it just looks so good. And so when Bubbles goes to take her turn in the simulation room, the professor intentionally goes and lowers the danger level all the way down from nine to two, mentioning that Bubbles isn't ready for the higher levels yet. And that's where the whole foundation of this episode lies. Everyone in Bubbles' family views her as the weakest member, and this was always Craig's philosophy as I mentioned. Blossom is the oldest and thus the most mature leader. Buttercup is the middle child that tends to be more forgotten than the other two, but is still rough and tough in her own right, having to deal with two direct sibling relationships, for lack of a better description. And Bubbles is the youngest and ergo most inexperienced with more childlike interests, which causes her older sisters to view her in a weaker light. Blossom's a little more indirect about it by telling the professor to leave the hall light on for her because she's afraid, while Buttercup's definitely confrontational about it. There is this part where you're stuck inside this slug, uh -huh. and it was all gross and stuff, and then splat, pow, pow, uh -huh. you're hit it, and then you're slamming, uh -huh. and on the ground, and punching it, and yes. kicking it, and it was all dead and stuff. This episode is a character struggle for Bubbles, tried and true, just like Buttercup struggled with apologizing in Pace Makes Waste, and Blossom struggled with her new power in Ice Soar. The story of this one really just comes down to Bubbles proving herself to be just as tough as her sisters. However, despite this being about her toughness, I think a bigger strength of the episode is that it's the first time Bubbles ever really seems to be focused on something. In other episodes before, we've seen her act more distracted than the other two with small side comments like when she asks if they knew the professor could fly, or her reaction to Mojo's nose about the professor being kidnapped. This time though, she's fixated on this idea of proving herself and she never loses sight of that goal, even if her methods of proving herself are a bit extreme. Bubbles' inner monologue here is great because it's how she convinces herself to test her might. You can definitely tell this being the first big Bubble-centric episode that it really allowed Tara to kind of explore the character and learn more sides to her. Like yes, Octi Evil did have a bit of a focus on her, but the other two were still prominent enough with their arguments that they were dealing with. It was a scenario where all three characters struggled, albeit the focus was tilted a little more in one direction over the other two. This one though is entirely meant to portray a struggle that bubbles in only Bubbles has to deal with. Having Bubbles go hardcore really gives her character more intricacies that we have yet to have seen in the series up to this point. It exemplifies that her weaker appearance is more than just connotations typically associated with her softer personality, but when put in the right situation, she can stick up for herself just as much as the other two. They'll treat me like a baby. I'll show them. I'll prove that I can be hardcore. This is Tara's favorite line to quote pretty much anytime anybody ever asks her to do the Bubbles voice, and rightfully so. She even used it when she gave me a shout out several years ago, which was awesome, by the way. Jordan, I just texted you. Hi, Jason, this is Bubbles, I and I want everyone to watch Shower Street. You know why? Because it's hardcore. I hope you have a good time. See you soon. Thank you, Epic Toy Series, for this. And also, thank you, Sinner Shroob, again for this other shout out that she happened to give me. Shout out to Shadow Street. He loves Bubbles the most. And he loves Bubbles the most, so he must be hardcore. <laughs> so like I said, she basically talked herself into sneaking into the simulation room, which has this really cool perspective shot of just her shadow going across the computer panel, might I add, and then she proceeds to take the simulation's danger level all the way up to 11. The phrase dialing it up to 11 is actually a popular idiom that was less than two decades old at the time this episode was made, as it had actually originated from the 1984 film known as This Is Spinal Tap, in which a guitarist basically turns his amp up to 11 to illustrate just how powerful the sound he would create was about to be. Given that most standard amplifiers at the time only went up to 10, this was a very visual way of indicating the intensity of the sound that would be played. It's sort of like the whole 11 out of 10 scoring idea, or giving it 110%. This depiction is a very literal take on the phrase here, but it prepares the audience to expect something incredibly intense once the simulation kicks on. And that's exactly how it starts. I mean, this straight up is one of the most intense fights the show ever has, period. Like, how did they manage to get this much violence past the network? Gendy was probably having a field day with this fight sequence. I mean, there's no doubt in my mind he heavily involved himself with many of the action sequences throughout the first few seasons of the show. Knowing his style and the way he portrays action, there's some pretty clear indicators. You've got eyes popping out, ooze of some kind popping out of the back of this monster's skull, Bubbles wipes blood off the side of her mouth, which like, when do you ever see that in a show like this? And the absolutely insane part where she rips off the monster's horn and throws it back through the back of his neck and blood flies out? How on earth did they get away with this? I mean, it's just wild. It's insane. 
The impact frames hit perfectly and the fire effect on the cells is really cool too. It just all comes together. Sure, the show had great action sequences and episodes leading up to this, but this is the one where it really feels like the show finally figured out how far they could push the boundaries on these sequences and help develop some of Gendy's signature style. And yes, we've even got the long-running reference that we've seen in Gendy's other shows as well. And of course, it also goes without saying that the music perfectly encapsulates the feeling of the adrenaline-pumping monster clash that's going down, so... Of course, after successfully proving herself to be powerful, Bubbles falls into this mindset of being hardcore all the time and takes everything to the extreme, playing tag with her sister Blossom, for starters. <laughs> This monologue is great. I just love how carried away Bubbles gets with it. I mean, she really gets into it. Oh, and a minor fun fact for you. The song for this scene at Pokey Oaks is actually reused from the Meet Fuzzy Lumpkin special, believe it or not. And so, after answering the hotline, Bubbles flies into the city to see what the trouble is that the mayor was calling about. And of all the possible crimes that could possibly be committed in the city at this very moment, it's this. Well, I may be able to talk, but I sure as heck can't drive. Oh, hi, Bubbles. How are you? Oh! Where the heck do they come up with this stuff? Like, the character of Talking Dog by itself is already silly enough as it is. He's just a minor background character that's been seen a few other times, like in major competition. So the fact that this really is his first big acknowledgement and it's just him sitting in a car holding up traffic is just so far out of left field. But almost horror movie-esque in the way that Bubbles just rips her arms through the roof of the car, pries it open, and then yanks him out to wail on him is so gruesome. I mean, like, she totally goes overboard. This punishment is not deserved, but it's just so excessive that I can't help but smile, and her whole mercy is for the weak line gets me every time. Plus, it's a Karate Kid reference. I mean, it's just so metal. All of Bubbles' lines are hard-hitting here from start to finish. She takes hardcore to a whole new level, like it's almost edgy in some ways. I really wish I could play them all for you, but then I'd just be playing the whole episode at that point, and that's not good for copyright reasons. <laughs> Tara absolutely kills the line deliveries, though, in the way that she's making Bubbles sound like she's retaliating in a very childlike manner, but the way she talks back to her sisters is very extreme. But, um, you're going overboard. That's not the Powerpuff way. Forget the Powerpuff way! I'm doing it my way! Like, Blossom and Buttercup are just completely dumbfounded in hearing this. They don't know what to think, they don't know where it's coming from. And the narrator, too. He makes a comment like, Sister's doing it for herself, which is actually a reference to the song Sister's Doing It For Themselves, released in 1985 by Eurythmics, featuring Aretha Franklin, so that's a small but neat detail. But unfortunately for Bubbles, though, she's going about doing it for herself the wrong way by blatantly attacking these citizens for doing menial things that don't really deserve the level of punishment she issues them. There's one guy who, like, steps on one blade of grass, and there's another guy who throws a wrapper away and unintentionally misses the trash can. So she beats him up before the litter even hits the ground, which is like, that's cool, and a bit fun because of the sheer exaggeration of the punishment not fitting the crime, but like, she's definitely going overboard, and Mojo sees this as his perfect opportunity to snatch her up and torture her to make her sisters come flying in to rescue her, which is very much in theme with the idea of the episode, because Mojo also knows she's a crybaby sometimes, and so she singles her out for that reason. In his own way, he's condescending to her too. Of course, he's doing this after Bubbles had this dramatic shift in character motive, so he's completely unaware of how fired up she is currently. I also don't know if Batman was what they were going for with Bubbles sitting on the roof here. I think it is, but I can't say for sure. But it's a great transition either way, and I love how it's incorporated to get us from the montage to the next scene. Mojo's whole plan is silly though, because like, okay, well, actually, let me just show you. Here's this brilliant plan of his. And with you three do-gooders out of the way, no one will be able to stop me!
His plan is to have the girls walk through the front door and get stuck so he can shoot them with a cannon. That's it. That's his whole plan. <laughs> well, that's just brilliant. Also, Mojo's line delivery on you with my laser. has always stuck with me. I don't know why. Actually, the entire sequence has. Who am I kidding? Nate, the entire episode, really. There are just so many quotable lines spread throughout the entire thing from start to finish. I can definitely compliment the writing for really outdoing itself here. This conversation with Mojo only gets better when Bubbles calls him a doo-doo brain, and he retorts by turning the laser up to 11 just like she did for the simulation. That's it! I've had it with your sassy mouth! I didn't want to do this! Well, actually I did. And yes, I absolutely love that line as well. You can practically hear the giddiness in Roger L. Jackson's voice as Mojo as he turns the dial up. In the end though, Bubbles just ends up taking it to the point that she completely destroys the machine that's holding her hostage and beats the tar out of Mojo before her sisters can even jump in and do anything to save her, thus earning her both recognition and respect for the sheer level of brutality she just dished out to Mojo. I mean, look at this poor chimp's anguish as he just lays there all pathetic-like. It's so extreme, and this is easily easily one of the most violent beatings Mojo ever receives. Although not THE most violent, but we'll get to that one in a later season. Even still though, she literally broke his fingers and beat the stuffing out of him. There's some pretty fun pain reaction faces from Mojo here as well while he's getting beat up, which just adds to the fun of it. Violence is funny. Haha. -ha. A very satisfying ending if I do say so myself, and a well-deserved one for Mojo after he zaps her again, clearly not learning a single thing from the beating he had only just received. There is an undercurrent of sweetness here in the ending though with the way the three of them come together. I mean, while Bubbles is off doing her own thing, Blossom and Buttercup are searching for her so like, they do care, if they didn't they wouldn't be trying to track her down. But yeah, that's Bubble Vicious. A fan favorite, and it's pretty obvious why. Bubbles was never my favorite Powerpuff Girl, but I'd be lying if I said she didn't normally get the best episodes that focus primarily on one of the main characters. This is only one of several episodes over the series that really showcase how great Bubbles can be as a character. She is the favorite amongst the general populace, or at least she was back in the early 2000s based on some poll Cartoon Network ran at the time. I can't say for certain if that's changed at all since those days, but I feel like it hasn't. Either way though, it's a great episode, and the best part is, the quality isn't dropping just yet, because the second half of this half hour is just as good, if not better, than Bubble Vicious. So let's go ahead and get into that. So once again, the day is saved, thanks to the Powerpuff Girls. And now, completing the best pairing in the entirety of Season 1 comes The Bare Facts, yet another absolutely remarkable piece of work that really symbolizes just how much of a groove the latter half of Powerpuff Girls seems to pick up. This episode is intricate, experimental, very risky, and yet one of the most unique episodes of an 11-minute cartoon to have ever existed. Even decades later, I still find this one to be pretty unmatched in terms of presentation style, pacing, and creativity in its unorthodox methods of storytelling. In fact, I think this and Bubble Vicious combined are the very reason why this pairing was likely chosen as a nominee for the 1999 Primetime Emmys. It unfortunately didn't win as it ended up losing to the episode and they call it Bobby Love from King of the Hill, which of the five candidates I personally ranked fourth because while it was an okay episode, it just paled in comparison to the strides that other episodes nominated that year had made, but hey, what are you gonna do? I've been convinced that the primetime Emmys have been rigged forever, so. Either way, The Bare Facts is another play on words that has its ultimate payoff revealed at the end, so I'm going to go ahead and save it for when that time comes. But at least I can say this title was most likely inspired by the phrase, The Bare Facts. I mean, like, I don't really want to get into what a lot of the uh, things are that seem to be tied to this saying, so I'm not sure if that connection was intentional, although maybe it totally was given some of the other things that this series will get away with in an upcoming season, so instead I'm going to look for the least grotesque potential source of inspiration, and that just so happens to be an Ohioan garage rock band from 1966 going by the same name who literally lasted for one year, released like four songs, and then disbanded never to be heard from again. Yeah, I highly doubt this band was the inspiration, but it's better than describing the alternative, okay? Regardless, let's just kind of crack down on what makes The Bare Facts the most unique episode of the season. It's told entirely from a first-person perspective. That first person, of course, being none other than the mayor. 
So right away you can see how bold of a story device this episode is rolling with right out of the gate. Sure you get the occasional episode where you get a first person shot here or there or even a brief sequence, but how many other episodes can you name where the entire thing is told from this one perspective? It may seem like a somewhat alienating concept at first, but before long you really get to see just how amazing this episode is because it gives the writing a chance to shine. Animating a first person perspective episode is difficult, I mean extremely difficult. Difficult. Could you imagine trying to animate any sort of action scene or dialogue sequence where a character is constantly walking around a room or something? It's hard, doable, but challenging to say the very least. So the episode does resort to having most of the mayor's perspective maintain a stationary sitting position, such as when he's sitting at his desk during the opening act of the episode. And it also serves as a pretty deep dive into the mayor's daily work life. We get to see what he does all day as he sits at his desk and works on very important laws, signing them into practice without so much as a second thought. It's great though, he just sits around talking to himself while he acknowledges all the things he loves about his life. I'd like to order a pizza, put it on my tab. <laughs> I love the power. Ah, my wife. I love my pen. Man, this dude seriously has a strained relationship with his wife, doesn't he? I mean, I don't know what's going on back there behind closed doors, but he's tried pawning her off and won't even say that he loves her. Like, what's the deal with that? Also, the fact that he can't even spell his name, which, by the way, is apparently mayor is hilarious yeah that's right miss bellum basically confirms that the mayor doesn't have a real name he's literally just mayor which i mean based on impeach fuzz i guess that actually makes more sense now that i think about it but anyways it's not long before mojo breaks in and this is where the episode really takes a turn because the mayor gets knocked unconscious only to later wake up and realize that he's blindfolded and can't see anything it's a very interesting creative choice and a precarious one at that i mean considering the entire screen goes dark and there's like an entire 80 seconds of uninterrupted nothing. Yes, some would argue that this is cheap because they don't have to animate anything, but considering this is a one-off thing that never happens again in the entire series, I appreciate it for not only taking the risk, but providing a completely auditory experience. At this point, the episode instructs you to turn your eyes off and listen with your ears, focus in on what's being said, and visualize events as they're playing out within your own imagination. Oh, shut up, I say! I say shut up because I am going to become powerful, but before I can become powerful, I must be taken seriously, and the only way to be taken seriously is to rule the city of Townsville as the mayor! Theater of the mind is a very powerful force when one lets their brain wander and create the picture for them. The use of sound effects here is also given a lot more focus to set the scene, and on top of all of that, it's funny. And as a side note, it's a really keen attention to detail that the show should be given credit for. They went out of their way to pan the audio based on the positioning of the characters in relation to the mayor. Here, I highly recommend listening to this next part of the video with headphones on if you can, so you can get the full effect. But if you can't, just... Take my word for it. And that is why I had to strip you of you! Not so fast! I'll kill it, kill it, kill it! Power puff goes! Ooh, take this! Stop! Ah. Yeah. Ah. This show did not need to do this. They did not need to add this level of detail. The vast majority of household television sets at this time were most likely mono devices, i.e. they only had one audio channel, so there was no separation of left and right speakers or any concept of something like surround sound yet. And yet the show went above and beyond and added this extra panning touch just because they could. Once again, the show going out of its way to do something they didn't need to do. Hardly anybody at the time of watching this live on the air could have possibly noticed the panning effect given the everyday technology, and yet the show went ahead and did this anyway, inherently making the episode a better experience as it aged and time went on because wow, this really helps you get an idea of how close Mojo is to the mayor. You can easily hear him pacing back and forth across the room as he speaks. It's not just a continued stream of dialogue, no, you actually have to pay attention here and think for yourself. Visualize where Mojo is in relation to the mayor. It challenges the viewer in a way that I still have yet to see any other animated series do in this manner. Some people want to call this 80 seconds of blackness cheap, but I'm going to disagree full stop. This show found a way to take a daring concept like this, which as a reminder kids were the largest demographic of this show, so to do this was extremely bold, and yet they found a creative and engaging way to keep the story going. And on top of that, it makes everything that comes next all the more worth it. As a side note, I will admit that as a kid I would always end up thinking the TV broke when I would see this sequence. Look, 80 seconds 
really isn't that long of a time, but as a kid, time just seemingly moves slower compared to adulthood, and 80 seconds is a very, very long time from that age. So, I always get a chuckle and look back fondly on my younger self, as I can still clearly remember seeing this episode on TV and watching the blank screen intently, waiting for the picture to come back on. I appreciate this so much more as an adult now, though for sure. But yeah, so pretty soon the girls rescue the mayor and bring him back to his office and this is where things really start to shine as to why this is debatably the best episode of the entire season. The recap that the girls give the mayor. We were all at school. I was drawing a pretty picture of a red daisy, but then Blossom came along and said that the red daisy was bi- bi- yo genetical- bi- genetically impossible. Yep, the rest of the episode is a vivid retelling of everything that happened from the girls' perspectives, with every single one of them being presented in a different visual style to not only individualize them as characters, but to contrast how they interrupted the events of what went down. This is a clever incorporation of what's known as unreliable narrators, seeing as the events that get presented from Blossom Bubbles and Buttercup's perspectives seem to somewhat align and somewhat differ from each other as they go through the story. Obviously, some of what the girls tell the mayor is true, but there are seemingly a lot of changes made by each of them that just so happen to twist the truth into a lie that's hard to piece back together. There's just enough here to figure out the basics, but the specifics get lost in translation. And all of this stems from the mayor asking the girls why they're laughing so much, which the girls seemingly don't want to answer right away, and instead choose to tell the story all over from the beginning. I suppose from now I can look at each of the three girls' visual choices and compliment each for what they do. Firstly, Bubbles, which is told in an animated crayon drawing style with the outline lines and everything wobbling back and forth in a similar manner to the boiling lines effect that was popularized by Ed, Ed, and Eddie. The second visual style is Blossoms, which is the most traditional method of the three, having the entirety of the visuals filtered over with various shades of pink to represent Blossoms' color. And her ego is in full force here. Pushing up on my conversational Chinese, when all of a sudden, my hotline phone rang. I knew there was trouble and I had to act fast. I rushed to the phone. Why is everything always about you? I was brushing up on my Chinese. I rushed to the phone. I took the call. Bubbles and Buttercup were there too, I guess. Like, this is so in line with Blossom and her whole leadership persona. She doesn't exactly act like she's the center of attention, but she sees herself as the most capable hero, the most inspiring heroic icon that can always be counted on to save the day because she takes her responsibilities as a hero so seriously. And lastly, Buttercup's perspective, which has darker still frames shaded with lots of heavy blacks, small amounts of white, and the rest of the space filled in with nothing but this soul green color to, once again, reflect the color of the girl telling the perspective at that specific point in time. I really love how a lot of these shots look. Of the three, Buttercups easily has the most striking imagery for sure, but it's fascinating because they have the least animation. Every single frame from Buttercup's story has a unique art style that I just appreciate so much here. And this episode is also hilarious, by the way, lest I forget to mention that. It's just so great, the mayor's a total barnacle head and most of what the girls are telling him is surely flying completely over it. But given that he still hasn't figured out why the girls are laughing at him, it's no surprise. And while the visuals are one thing, that's only a third of the full bare facts pie, because the other two crucial components of what the girls present to the mayor that makes the episode as great as it is relies on their own personalities and dialogue to drive it, and the music that complements it. Allow me to play three quick clips for each of the girls telling a piece of the story back to back. Pay attention to the background music as well as what and how the girls describe events. Boy, was he mad. There was steam coming out of his ears. But I knew that deep down inside he was a sad, poor little monkey. I took Mojo into custody in order to keep Buttercup from beating him up and deposited him in a safe place. It was coming at me and I jumped, smash, whoop, whoo, and then I flew at him and smash, crash, wham. In all three of these clips, each of the girls have their own theme music. Bubbles is a lot lighter and focuses on softer chimes, while Blossoms has more triumphant brass, and Buttercup's grounded heavily in guitars and fast-paced rock music, similar to how the intro highlights each of their individualities. It's such a simple background element, but it tells you everything you need to know. Music's ability to convey ideas to an audience is vastly underappreciated by the everyday crowd, and it deserves to be recognized for how incredibly effective it is at really raising up the significance of the events at hand. But it's not just the music music here, it's the character dialogue too. Bubbles, being the ditzier one, is a lot slower and seemingly more distracted than the other two. She doesn't really focus on one thing as she gets off track relatively quick, and she's taking her time and telling a story at that. Buttercup hurt Mojo's head, and I would have kissed his little boo-boo, but then I remembered he was a bad monkey, so I kicked it in!
Bubbles is clearly in no rush here to get to the point as she seems to want to talk about everything she witnessed in explicit detail. Then there's Blossom, who's entirely focused solely on herself and how she led the team. She's focused on one idea and has a methodical pacing to her story. She's not rushing through or taking her time, but rather including all of the necessary facts on how she approached the scenario, making sure to include the vital information, leaving out the extra fluff unless it enhances her own appearance. She's not trying to paint a picture in the mayor's head, she's recapping her step-by-step -step procedure. And then you contrast that to Buttercup, who's flying through the events without any sign of slowing down. She's 100% fixated on the action, as that's the thrill. She gets an adrenaline rush from excitedly going over what went down between her and Mojo, and her added sound effects really just show that she's not about the small stuff, she wants the high-octane battle to be the main course. This episode really is one of the best examples of Season 1 that I could recommend to somebody to give them an idea of what the show is. Like, yes, the episode takes risks and isn't traditional in the sense of how it's told from the mayor's point of view, but I really think by this point the show has figured out what it is and who the girls are as characters. Between this, Bubble Vicious, and the previous episode pairing of Paste Makes Waste and Ice Sore, where each of the girls have had their own episode now and it sort of convenes here, it really just solidifies the show's identity from this point onward, and I think that's supported by the last few episodes we have left to go in the season. Of course, now I suppose I should reveal that the reason the episode is called The Bear Facts is because the narrator was naked the whole time, hence the bear part of the title. Then, of course, the facts, referring to the story that the mayor is trying to pull out of the girls. The Bear Facts is storytelling at its finest, and I really cannot praise the episode enough. It really has it all, from a unique framing device to vastly dynamic art style shifts to comedic dialogue that always manages to crack me up. This is hands down one of the best episodes of the entire season, and as I get older, I continue to love this episode more and more. As a kid, I didn't really care for it, and as a teenager, I thought it was alright. But by the time I was in college analyzing animation like this, I realized that there was something special here, and now with my experience, I can say the bare facts truly is a work of art. Honestly, Powerpuff Girls should have won that enemy for this episode alone. Bubble Vicious was just an added bonus. So once again, the day is saved thanks to the Powerpuff Girls. Here, you cheeky devil. So, honestly, how do you top an episode as amazing as the bare facts right after it? Well, unfortunately, like I said, the next episode isn't all that great, because next comes Catman Do, an episode that I truly cannot seem to figure out what the episode's name is supposed to be a pun on. The closest possible relation I can find is Kathmandu, which is the capital of Nepal, and I apologize if I pronounced that incorrectly. Now, maybe I'm just uneducated on the subject, but I fail to see what the connection of the capital of Nepal has to do with the events of this episode. So, so far, the only other episodes that seemingly failed to succeed at being a play on words was Powerpuff Bluff, which even still at least had the assonance of Puff and Bluff to back it up, and Octi Evil, which I also failed to figure out. And yes, maybe you could count Buttercrush, but that was at least a play on Buttercup's name, whereas these three are seemingly on nothing related? Unless the answer is the capital of Nepal, but that's unrelated. The only other things I could find under the name was an actual cat named Cat Mandu, who was named joint leader of Britain's official monster raving loony party. I don't know what that is, but good for him. In 1999, which was most likely coincidental timing more than anything else. And then also this brand of cat food, which didn't establish itself until 2004, a total five years after the episode aired, so that's definitely not it. Oh, okay, and lastly I could find this song by Bob Seeger, which was also just inspired by the capital of Nepal, I guess. I mean, maybe this was it, given that the song references Warner Brothers, although PPG was made in Georgia, not the West Coast, but it's their parent company. I don't know. I have no idea. Either way, the lack of clarity on the title has nothing to do with the fact that I just don't really care for this episode. Debatably, it's my least favorite episode of the entire first season, and that's saying something because even then I still cannot call this episode bad by any stretch of the imagination. It's not. It's 
okay. I just don't find the premise very interesting, and this is coming from someone who used to hate cats because he was allergic, but over the past three years has completely been reformed, and now has both a home cat and an office cat that spends so much of their time around him. In fact, here, have some footage of my home cat, Shika. She's a little rascal sometimes, but I love her all the same. But yeah, I don't know, I don't have a lot to say about this one because most of it just doesn't impress me and I find it a bit confusing at points as well. The ideas seem a little all over the place and I don't think this one stuck the landing as well as most of the other masterpieces I've already discussed. I will, however, at least compliment the zooming effect of the opening shot. The city of Townsville, a place where catastrophe could strike at any minute. That's right. It's a little thing, but I just love the way the cannon just sort of shifts into view while the camera zooms out from the city skyline. It's a cool motion before panning down to our villain of the episode, this man who we don't see the face of holding this precious white kitty. He opens with a monologue about him blasting this laser out to a radius of 15 miles, but gets interrupted by the Powerpuff Girls who bust in and immediately jump into action as they take the guy out with ease. Most of the action shots here are pretty great, although interestingly, we've got a Miss Bellamesque character here because we never see the face of the man who's attempting to pull off this scheme. Instead, we only see the man's torso carrying the cat, who runs off into the corner while the building self-destruct sequence kicks on, leading to a cool over-the-shoulder shot of Bubbles flying through the crumbling skyscraper and attempting to rescue the cat in time, which she succeeds at. From what I can tell, this shot was actually green screened, I think, based on the rough edging I can see around Bubbles' head outline here, which is an interesting way to achieve this shot. I'm sure it made it easier for sure, but that's a pretty clever way to kind of pull this off. I don't usually think of chroma keying being used in animated shows like this, so definitely shows that the team was using all technology available to them at the time. All I can really say about the first act of the episode from this point on is that the cat is drawn to be cute, and cute it is indeed. There's no denying that. I mean, yeah, the girls discuss the kitty that they brought home and hope the professor will let them keep it, but instead of humoring them with the idea, he reacts negatively in a way that I never really understood all my life, and even to this day, I still don't get it. I remember when I brought a puppy home to my parents, and do you know what they said? They said yes? They said no! <laughs> Was this meant to be a joke? I don't know, it just comes out of nowhere and it makes the girls frown in a rather unhappy manner. I mean, does the professor have repressed memories that he's just not letting on about here or what's the deal with this? I don't know, I just never understood it. It's weirdly written and the communication doesn't seem to come across here. Even as a kid, I took issue with this. Catmandu seems to have a lot of downtime throughout the episode though where the characters are just sitting around talking, whether it be in this bedroom scene or later the next day after the professor tells them they can keep Kitty. So I guess the name of the cat is just Kitty. We can keep Kitty. <laughs> Why? I knew it. <laughs> what did you say? Okay, not the most inspired name, but we'll roll with it. The reason for the professor letting them keep the cat is because it managed to wander its way down into the professor's lab while he was working late last night, and the two spent some time bonding together over several hours. I won't lie, this is pretty much how my office cat and I bonded. After I got my promotion and moved into a new office, the cat who rarely ever spent time with me at all beforehand other than passing by every now and then, wandered in one day and just sort of started laying on my spare chair. Before long, he was sleeping in the windowsill, laying on my desk, there have literally been times where he has slept on my lap from like 9am to 3 in the afternoon and you better believe the feeling of having your legs fall asleep after being stuck sitting in like one position for 6 hours is absolutely brutal. But cats rule all I suppose, I'm an animal lover, what can I say? But hey, the girls are glad they get to keep the cat, right? Well, it unfortunately doesn't work out that way because they hardly get to spend any time with him at all. Rather, the professor is keeping him all to himself while the two work on building a machine in the lab of some sort. It's a cool montage that takes place in a lot of cool blue light with a very prominent consistency between the professor and Kitty. The glowing yellow eyes, and with that, the big twist of what's going on shows hints of itself, which gets revealed to the audience before long, with the professor referring to the cat as master after banning the girls from entering the lab. Interesting note, the voice of Kitty in this episode is none other than Hamill himself. Mark Hamill, that is, which is really cool. I don't think a lot of people know this fact, which is fun, I suppose. It's cool that they got him to do a role on the show, especially considering that A, he's an incredibly talented voice actor, and B, lots of people on the show were Star Wars fans. I mean, Boogie Frights literally turned into a huge homage to the original film in the final act there. Ultimately, the cat's plan is to simply rebuild the same laser ray that was seen in the opening act to possess people into letting their cats rule their homes. Now, I don't know about anyone else, but the cats in my life already rule their homes without the need for any laser ray to possess my mind. 
Unless I've been possessed and just don't know it. Hmm. Anyways, I only have a few more talking points here that I really want to bring up. I really enjoy the stealth sequence where the professor and Kitty break into the museum and sneak in to steal the cat's eye jewel at the one exhibit. Although the premise for this episode is eerily similar to that of Mojo's plan from Monkey See Doggy Do just with cats at the focus of taking over here instead of dogs, I think that's another reason why I don't particularly care for this one's concept. It just feels too samey to the first episode of the show that aired, but that's just me. But the break-in scene going back to that is something that for whatever reason I can just vividly remember watching on on my TV at home in my mind from like 20 years ago. I don't know why or what was so prominent about this scene. I think it was probably just the silliness of Kitty using its claws to cut the glass to get into the jewel case, but either way, when I think of this scene, it's the Mission Impossible-esque heist scene that I always jump to first. I also really like how Bubbles handles the news when she answers the call from the mayor. What is it? The cat's eye jewel's been stolen! Again? I thought we took care of that guy. Wait! Why did they catch you the bad guy? I mean, Professor Roger, It's an amusing gag, admittedly. Another detail I really like is how the cat's opening monologue at the start of the episode is mimicked again at the start of Act 3, only this time with the professor holding him instead of the faceless other guy. And I think that was another cool choice, by making that opening guy faceless. He was never the threat to begin with. He wasn't given a face because he didn't matter. He wasn't a real character. The cat was the villain the whole time, and the guy just acted sort of as a decoy. And so that's who the audience should have their focus on anyways. Even if it's made obvious to the audience way before the characters figure it out, it creates a sense of dramatic irony that just enhances the story a little bit more. The final fight scene is also pretty good. I think it's silly how the professor retaliates like a cat would and then jumps off the building to save Kitty, only for the girls to grab him at the last second, leaving Kitty stuck in a tree. It's pretty wild, and once again, the backgrounds and soundtrack are just great as always. I like how most of this episode's score has a jazzy sound to it, a lots of noticeable bass and light percussion that bounces around. Whether it's the slow pace whenever Kitty is on screen, or the faster tempo that plays when the laser begins to take effect on its citizens. Good stuff like always. A lot of the things that the people become possessed to allow their household felines to do includes obvious ones like letting them shred the curtains, or sleep inside, or even eat turkey off the table. Oh, and then there's the mayor. Absolutely no comment. All in all, the episode is just fine. I don't know, it's not really my thing. It has a good family ending to it, I'll give it that much, and the way the narrator sort of just gives up at the end is pretty amusing too, because like, Bad Kitty, if you think the girls are gonna help you, you're barking up the wrong... I mean, you're meowing up the... Oh, well. At first he goes for a pun, but then he quickly realizes he just doesn't have any material for an ending here. I'm not sure if this is Tom Kenny doing an improv thing and the show just went with it, or if they actually had this meandering be a part of the script, I'm not sure. I know Tom Kenny did improvise a bit with his lines as narrator, and sometimes would come up with ending lines himself, but I don't know if there's any easy way to confirm which episodes are him and which are the script. Either way, yeah, that's Katmandu. It's alright, I guess, I just don't love it. Once again, the day is saved, thanks to the Powerpuff Girls. Lucky for me, the second half of the 10th episode pairing more than makes up for it with Impeach Fuzz, an all-around great title that I honestly consider to be one of the best for the sheer depth of meanings that surround these two simple words, Impeach Fuzz. It's so simple, yet it completely encapsulates every single idea incorporated into the plot in such a perfectly succinct description. The term overall is a play on peach fuzz, which is a term typically used to refer to the facial hair of an adolescent male who hadn't developed a full beard yet. Although the term can really be used to refer to any sort of vellus hair that grows anywhere on the body like arms and legs as well. The first word has been changed to impeach, referring to the act of charging a holder of political office with misconduct and potentially having them removed from office as a result. Although this isn't guaranteed if the history of the United States presidents are anything to go off of. And then of course the fuzz in this case is referring to the character of Fuzzy Lumpkins who shares his second starring episode with an unlikely character, the mayor. Yep. 
That's right, this is a Mayor and Fuzzy Lumpkins episode, an unlikely duo that you really wouldn't ever expect to see this early into the series, given how unrelated these characters are. I mean, this feels like a concept most shows would eventually expand into in like a third or fourth season, you know? After a lot more of the basic plots have been done and the character dynamics have been fully established, but honestly, this just makes it that much more special because it once again shows how ahead of the curve this animated series was, doing something so unexpected this early in the lifespan and pulling it off masterfully. Judging by the concept, however, it's probably pretty clear that this is more of a comedy-driven episode episode as opposed to an action heavy one given the sheer ridiculousness of the premise, but that's alright. Also, as one final note, given the fact that Peach Fuzz typically carries a connotation of adolescent with it, which is synonymous with immature, and Fuzzy's lack of maturity in the way he behaves once he takes office here, I'd say the term has a pretty allegorical application as well, and it just goes to show you what happens when someone that lacks experience and knowledge is elected into office. Of course, this episode isn't really directed at any specific candidate candidate or political party as it pretty much maintains a relatively unbiased stance here which makes me respect it so much more. There aren't any obvious call outs to certain past presidents or topical issues at the time that the cartoon was made and that just makes it all the more timeless. So, as for the opening of the episode, we get the narrator's standard City of Townsville line delivery and then everything immediately transitions directly into the mayor rehearsing his upcoming re-election speech with Miss Bellum as his audience. A city of growth and prosperity. Of the people, for the people, and by the people. His speech here pretty much consists of a bunch of references to several famous speeches given by prominent American figures over the course of the country's history. Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream, Abraham Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, We the Citizens of Townsville might be a reference to We the People of the Constitution, but I don't know for sure, and Ich bin ein Townsviller is a reference to John F. Kennedy's Ich bin ein Berliner quote. So basically, the mayor's speech is the speech of all time, and Ms. Bellum just goes along with it. No one's running against you. No one ever does. If George Washington used snails instead of greyhounds to pull his sled, there'd be no trees for Honest Abe to shout from the highest mountain. What? And that's what I love about this scene, because it's really the first time so far that we've gotten an extended dialogue between Ms. Bellum and the mayor for more than a few seconds. They have a really sweet work relationship, because you can tell the mayor looks up to her as an intelligent woman and values her opinion and input on the effort he put into his speech. You can also tell he takes his job as mayor of the city very seriously, even if he is a buffoon, because even though she points out that he has always run unopposed, he still wants to instill pride in the citizens and assure them he's doing his best to keep their interests in mind. I admire that. Although Miss Bellum's reaction to that response is absolutely priceless. <laughs> Despite this, the mayor carries on with his campaign by going around uttering his iconic slogan, Vote for Mayor for Mayor, which just further confirms that the mayor's name is indeed Mayor, as if the bare facts wasn't enough of an indication of that. Which is like, great, because it ultimately shouldn't matter what the mayor's real name is. At the end of the day, he is the mayor. That's his character. That's what he should be known for. It doesn't matter what his real name is. I seriously respect that approach, and whether that was Craig's decision or maybe Gendy had input on it, I don't know, but shoutouts to whoever did come to that conclusion. The mayor absolutely plasters this campaign slogan all over the place on repeat non-stop though, like to an utterly irritating degree based on the reactions of all the citizens of Townsville in this long panning shot, which again, I admire from a production standpoint because this was an extended drawing that the team had to pan over to fully transition from the city to Fuzzy's cabin deep in the woods. It's always really cool to admire the talent and skill that the show would display in subtle ways like this. Remember, Powerpuff Girls was released just on the cusp of animation switching over to a digital format, so this was one of the last mainstream cell animated cartoons on one of the big three kids TV networks before all of the animation seemingly unanimously agreed to swap over to digital art at the turn of the millennia, given how much easier it was to produce. I find that Fuzzy showing up on the scene and yelling at the mayor to shut up and the citizens latching onto that is very fitting and clever because, let's be real, that's how a lot of people feel about a lot of political candidates. They just want to tell them to shut up, so, you know? I see why these citizens would hop on board with a campaign like that, but it's also clearly hyperbole because the citizens are idiots and Fuzzy is also an idiot who does literally nothing to run. The mayor's out here driving around through town and kissing babies while Fuzzy's at home sleeping all day, and yet 
through the power of democracy, Fuzzy ends up winning the seat and kicks the mayor out, literally, to live on the streets. And while this election doesn't seem to have any direct drawbacks on the citizens of Townsville from what we're shown, it absolutely does have them for Ms. Bellum. Charming. Talk about a total abuse of power, like, that's not okay in the slightest. It was a different time, so sure, maybe culture wasn't as fine-tuned to identifying this, but I'm sure having something like this in a kid's show today probably wouldn't fly. I mean, wow. It's not much better for the girls either, whom Fuzzy attempts to call because he's got himself in an emergency. Get out of your quiet! Help me catch my pig! <laughs> Ah yes, the most iconic line of the episode in my opinion. The whole, help me catch my pig! line has stuck with me for over a decade since rediscovering the show in 2013. I mean, like, I will literally just quote this one line for no reason in my everyday life. It's just a mixture of the sheer absurdity of the scenario with Jim Cummings' excellent performance that makes it so memorable in my mind. It's easily the first thing I think of whenever Fuzzy Lumpkins gets brought up in any conversation. All of this next sequence is great though, not just that. From Fuzzy screaming through a can to his facial <laughs> reaction when the girls bust in, to his demand for them to help him catch his pig. It's just so silly, and you can tell the show is really leaning into Fuzzy's country bumpkin lifestyle hard with all of the things he's making the Powerpuff Girls help him with. Fixing a truck engine, milking a goat, extracting potato juice, and Jim Venable's score once again nails it all with the way he places heavy emphasis on the banjo being at the forefront of this whole chaotic montage. It's all over the place, it's fast, it's crazy, the timing and editing is well paced, and Jim coming screaming of emergency with different inflections is top notch voice acting. I just love this show, man. It's a literal masterpiece. It makes me so delighted to see every piece come together in such a perfect way. It's just unreal. And the best part is that, as I've said before, it never takes itself seriously because we literally get the girls dressed up in hillbilly overalls and straw hats playing music on a jug. Go figure though, the girls have had it. And after reaching out to Ms. Bellum, they agree to go find the mayor exactly where he was left when he was removed from office. And no matter how much they beg or plead or cry, the mayor absolutely doesn't care about what Fuzzy's done because he's all washed up. Stranger. I don't care. He's tarnishing the image of what it is to be the mayor. I don't care. He's wearing your hat. And that just further shows that relationship between Bellum and the mayor. It's fitting that she, and not the girls, would know exactly what to say to get him riled up. I mean, she can't stand the way Fuzzy's treating her, and even though the mayor's a total dolt, he doesn't objectify her in such an awful manner, so like, of course she'd want the old mayor back. This results in Fuzzy agreeing to wrestle the mayor for the position of mayor, so I guess democratic process just doesn't matter, because the throne of the mayor can be won in a wrestling match, and this wrestling match gets so insanely wild, so insanely quickly. Like, the match starts out fine, right? Simple 1v1 match, and then Fuzzy's like, uh, nope, actually, you gotta fight my three cousins as well. If yous wrestles one lumpkin, yous wrestles them all. And just by looking at these designs, you can really tell the character designer, likely Craig, given that the character design was his speciality, although I don't know for sure, it could have been someone else, had a field day when coming up with these. He got the tall lanky one, the large round one, and the small stubby one to round out Fuzzy's average proportion size. And this scenario, of course, leads to my favorite part of the entire episode, where the mayor gets to choose a wrestling partner, and he goes for the professor instead of the three girls. Then I pick, uh, Professor Utonium. What? 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 The professor's entire role in this episode is to get decked in the face. Take my girls, please. No, no, no. Get up here, Professor, and show Fuzzy what for. <laughs> That's it. After this moment, we never see him again for the rest of the episode. He's literally only here for 30 seconds to get socked and then carried out on a stretcher. The mayor's logic here was so flawed, it's so hilarious in the same way he tells the professor to get on up there, and the professor's so uncertain of it, and then just wham, right in the kisser. It's mean, sure, but you know, pain is comedy. 
Of course, the mayor gets to then experience his own fair share of pain, as the Lumpkins tag each other in to utterly demolish the poor man, whether it be slamming his face into one of the posts, or literally steamrolling him flat to the ground. The timing on this sequence is great, and it only gets better once the girls get involved. They're juking left and right, Buttercup literally suplexes one of them in a repeated shot with different angles to emphasize the impact. There's a very brief yet so satisfying shot of Bubbles punching the tar out of this short Lumpkin over and over again as he gets knocked knocked down and then rises back up, kind of like one of those weeble wobbles. And that smug grin she has on her face while doing it, it just adds to that charm that I love about Bubbles, making her a certified badass in my eyes. I mean, I'm looping this clip for you right now because it's just so satisfying. And then of course Blossom's finishing move on the last Lumpkin, socking him several times in the face too. The impacts are there, the violence is there, the editing is phenomenal, and you just get a sense of the utter chaos that broke out in that ring. All the while hearing the mayor's guttural battle cry in the background, which Tom Kenny had to pretty much hold for the entire duration of this fight in the mayor's tone of voice. So kudos to him for hanging in there on that one. That couldn't have been easy. Of course, with the three girls and four Lumpkins in play, that math doesn't quite add up, and the last Lumpkin in the ring manages to pin the mayor down, claiming his crown as mayor of Townsville, and placing the mayoring hat on his crown once again. Only this was the worst mistake Fuzzy could have ever made, because this causes the mayor to go a full-on rage mode. And again, it's just so fun. I mean, he's this short little bald man with a monocle who absolutely loses his mind and goes to pull off all of these extreme wrestling moves with such a short stature that again, there's some oxymoronic undertones at play here. The mayor even goes to use the famous Superfly Splash finishing move to knock Fuzzy out and win the match entirely. And that guitar riff that Jim Venable threw in there followed by an immediate slow motion like pause is a true chef's kiss moment. And you know, throughout all of this fighting, it's satisfying because at the end of the day, Fuzzy totally deserves it. He was terrible in office, at least based on the fact that the crowd seemed to be on the mayor's side instead of Fuzzy. He forced Bellum to wear that revealing hillbilly getup. He forced the girls to do all these menial tasks instead of actually using them to save the day. And above all else, he punched Professor Utonium in the face and sent him to the hospital. I do see one of those points being a potential criticism of the episode, that of course being that the audience at the fight seems to be cheering for the mayor and booing Fuzzy despite the fact that these people are likely the same ones that put Fuzzy in office in the first place. But to that I would probably say that while it's not directly shown or stated, presumably because of the way Fuzzy acted in office around the girls and Bellum, he probably didn't take his role as mayor seriously for the citizens and they wanted their old mayor back because Fuzzy was doing nothing for them. I really don't think that's a stretch to say either. Like, yeah sure, maybe one line in there or a brief 10 second scene of the town suffering because of Fuzzy's incompetence would have helped, but I think it's a fair inference to make without that being in there. Either way, that brings the episode to a close, and so I just gotta say that I really do love this episode. I was impartial to it for the longest time, but I think in the last two to three times I've watched it, I've really come to enjoy the absolute stupidity of the scenario, and just the all-around fun zaniness that follows after Fuzzy takes his oath. It's a great variation in comparison to Fuzzy Logic, because unlike that episode where he was treated more like a total rage monster, in this episode he's more of a dim-witted doofus, which ultimately served his character better in the later seasons. Seasons. I mean, this is the approach they seemingly take with him from here on out, as we don't really get that many more of those physically strength-based rage moments anymore. I think Impeach Fuzz is also great for a mayor-centric episode, and I really like that Impeach Fuzz starts to flesh him out more as a character. It solidifies his place in the show in such a great way. So yeah, overall, I really like this episode, and I couldn't have asked for it to end on a better note. Help me catch my pig! And so, once again, the day is saved. Thanks to the Powerpuff Girls. Y'all come back now. Here. And so it seems we've come to this, the final pairing of 11 minute episodes of the season before heading into the final two standalone half hour specials. We're almost to the end guys, it's getting close. 
but not close enough, because we still got more to go, like I said. The A-side episode of this pairing is known by the name of Just Another Manic Mojo, a pretty recognizable pun seeing as it's based on the popular hit song by The Bangles from 1986, known as Just Another Manic Monday. And similarly to that song telling of the craziness of that Monday that they're enduring, Mojo has a very manic day of his own in a very hilarious way, I must add. Yep, it's another comedy episode and definitely my my favorite Mojo episode of the entire season, given its sheer absurdity of a premise. This entire episode, all 11 minutes, revolve around one core idea. One egg left? But for a nutritious breakfast, two eggs is the minimum requirement, and I have but one, which is once I have two, and it is two that I need. Curses. Mojo was unsatisfying with having just one egg for breakfast. I kid you not, that is the entire basis for the events that play out, and I cannot wait to talk about it. So let's get to it. So yeah, to start things off, we have this lovely opening from the narrator in which he tells us about the beauty of Townsville, the sheer joy and happiness that's expressed by all of its citizens, and the overall positive attitude that residents of the city seem to carry with them wherever they go. Unless, of course, your name is Mojo Jojo. For on top of this mountain lies the lair of the revengeful, resentful, spiteful, law-breaking, mad, swindling, thieving, malicious, extorting, assaulting, crooked, torturous, dishonest, complaining, wicked, indecent, menacing, touchy, swatty, shadowy, villain, villain of all time. Dang, first the narrator starts off with such a happy and upbeat tone to set the scene and then he just becomes this blunt pessimist reviling at Mojo for being this utterly heinous villain before the dudes even woke up yet. The sheer number of adjectives that Tom Kenny just throws out here is unbelievable, like he doesn't hold back. He just lets them fly and by Jove you can tell he really does not like this guy. But hey, even if the narrator doesn't like him, I do. And seeing how he prepares to get ready for the day is so in tune with his character. I mean, of course a scientific evil genius would have come up with a full-blown conveyor belt system to do all the work for him. With an intellect like that, why should he have to lift a finger if he can automate everything around him? We even get this cool shot that's a direct reference to Darth Vader's meditation chamber from Empire Strikes Back when Mojo has his helmet placed upon his gigantic oversized primate brain. But the real kicker here is, like I said, Mojo's sudden realization that he is unable to fulfill himself with a satisfactory breakfast to begin the day. I don't normally describe things using this terminology, but Mojo's reaction here is just so extra. Like, the overdramatic meltdown that he has over only having one egg in his fridge is such a Mojo thing to overreact to. He's a bit of a perfectionist, you know, I get that. If things aren't exactly how he needs them to be, then he finds it difficult to function. And also, while I'm at it, shouts out to Roger L. Jackson for his performance here. No other episode in the season leans as far into Mojo's Mo Linguish as this episode does here, and I think it really puts Jackson to the test, but his ability to keep up with this dialogue, which has such a fast and repetitive pace to it, really sells the performance and solidifies Mojo's mannerisms from here on out. You know, sure, he had his other appearances in his first episode with Monkey See Doggy Do, as well as a prominent role in Mr. Mojo's Rising, but even with that episode, I don't think they fully leaned into Mojo's comedic potential until this one, because in those other two, he had a full-blown scheme to act out, which made him more of a threat than a joke. Craig put it best in the official Powerpuff Girls documentary, but all of the villains of the show fit somewhere on a spectrum, from pure evil to pathetic joke, and Mojo sits snugly right in the middle, perfectly balanced, as all things should be. Sometimes he can be a threat, and sometimes, like in this case, he can be a hilarious mess to laugh along with. I mean, some of this dialogue is downright hysterical. Two eggs is the minimum requirement, and I have but one, which is shy of two, and it is two that I need. It's like the more Mojo loses his cool, the more he reiterates. I repeat, reinstates the same thing over and over again. Oh, but wait, that line's not until season two. Sorry, got ahead of myself there for a second, but I guess I couldn't help it. Okay, I don't want to stay on the scene for too much longer, but I just want to add that Gendy boarded and directed this episode, so his voice is primarily at the forefront with this one, and that is very apparent in the angles that Mojo is continually drawn at. I mean, this egg reaction shot right here just screams Gendy, if you know his style well enough, and the constant close-ups on Mojo's face every 
every time he says curses along with his squinted eyes to emphasize the disgust or contempt he's currently feeling is a consistent occurrence throughout the entire episode. Mojo really is a grump for like 90% of it, and in all honesty, a lot of that is just self-inflicted. I mean, whether it's him getting to the bottom of his steps and forgetting his wallet, forcing him to head all the way back up and then all the way back down again just to see some harmless kids playing in his moat is only the first thing in a line of minor inconveniences that he blows way out of proportion. <laughs> Must remember to destroy those kids after my breakfast has been eaten. Like, whoa, Mojo, calm down there. They're just kids. It's not like they did anything wrong. But hey, that's nothing compared to the moment where he's stuck standing at the crosswalk next to all of these obnoxious people chewing bubble gum and snapping their fingers to loud music or just shouting while having a conversation. Gosh, and even I remember as a child thinking this scene went on forever too. It doesn't last long at all. It really doesn't. But just the way the camera sort of pans around all the different people while Mojo's facial expression shifts to emit more and more distress made it just as comforting for me as a kid as it was for Mojo just standing there begging for the light to change. And then of course he has a super embarrassing moment at the grocery store where he asks a shelf stalker where the eggs are located in such an intense tone, only for them to be right next to him. Everything Mojo has to deal with here, he always reacts in such an extreme way. Extreme frustration, extreme contempt, and extreme embarrassment. But it just further serves to live up to that sheer evilness that the narrator set up for us at the very beginning. Luckily for Mojo, he manages to get his eggs and heads on back home for the day to enjoy his mighty fine nutrition Trisha's breakfast and catch up on the news by reading the paper. Dude even went out of his way to add a rose to his table for atmosphere and everything. I gotta admire that dedication. This episode really is just a day in the life of Mojo though. I mean, we're basically halfway through the episode right now at this point, and what has he accomplished so far? He went to the store and bought some eggs. I cannot stress this point enough. This cartoon literally found a way to make such a simple, mundane, ordinary concept of somebody going to the store to buy eggs. Hilariously entertaining. I mean, how many other cartoons can you say have done that before and since? Like, this, it just makes the show tried and true. I love it. I cannot reiterate it enough. It's amazing. I am such a super fan. Oh my gosh. Suddenly, the episode takes a turn with the Powerpuff Girls baseball crashing through his window which sends Mojo into an utter panic because guess what? Due to the inconvenience of having to go to the store to buy more eggs, he didn't have any time to come up with a plot to destroy the Powerpuff Girls that morning. And now they're literally flying right to his doorstep with him being completely unprepared. It leads into the second half of the episode where Mojo attempts to destroy the girls on a whim with a laser and struggles to do so because they're kids and he can't get them to sit still. While all the girls really want is their ball back. And that's the thing that really works here in this episode. The girls are kids in the purest sense here. The way each of them seem to argue with each other, the way siblings would and perceive the situation is so amusing. Well, it wouldn't have happened if Bubbles could catch. Well, I would have caught it if you threw it straight. What? That's right, you throw cricket. You better take that back. Hi, I'm Buttercup. And Bubbles' jab right there just puts a smile on my face every time. Like, don't get me wrong, Buttercup's my favorite, as I've said, but dang, Bubbles got her good right there. All three of them in this episode really hone in on their inner kid, though, because they're naive enough to just waltz on up to Mojo's place and ask him to give them their ball back like it's no big deal, despite the fact that he's their arch nemesis that's tried to destroy them several times before. Mojo basically invites them in like ordinary house guests, and they oblige him by following his orders to sit on his couch. But as any one would really expect from kids that age. They don't sit still because within seconds Bubbles is up from her spot and attempting to knock over a super valuable Ming Dynasty vase. A super priceless artifact from Mojo's very first crime, which also obviously this was written before the movie, so that whole first crime thing is sort of retcon, but who cares, that's no big deal, and the show probably didn't have the foresight of an origin movie in mind at this time anyways. And as another side note, I love how Bubbles is wearing a backwards baseball cap for this entire episode. It's not too often you see the girls wear other things outside of their standard attire, so when they do something like this, it's pretty noteworthy. All three of the girls are pretty much in line with what you'd expect from them though in this episode here. Blossom's polite and simply asks for the ball back and is willing to patiently wait for Mojo to get it because she's mature enough to sit still. Buttercup just wants the ball back now and is growing increasingly more frustrated the longer it takes, and Bubbles gets distracted by every little thing in the room to where she can't stay in place for very long. This even leads into her, most likely, finding Mojo's album of baby 
baby photos, which embarrasses him greatly, further adding to the frustration that Mojo has to endure, all because he's trying to pull off a scheme he was unable to prepare, whilst being constantly pulled back into the room every five seconds because the girls keep messing with his belongings. They even go so far as to play tag and hide and seek with him, and even volunteer to help him search his lab, which he is absolutely against. But, because they're super powered, there's nothing he can really do to stop them, either. Because my machine, my aquarium, my laboratory! Ah, clever. Nice reference to Dexter's lab there. I dig it. But yeah, it's like every single distraction gets more intense than the last. Like, you almost feel bad for Mojo to a degree, but then you also remember he's literally trying to destroy these girls at the same time, so you can't really feel bad because he's trying to be evil. He's just failing miserably. In fact, he fails so poorly that he ends up blasting himself with his laser instead of the girls because for like the third time in the episode, Bubbles is once again fascinated with wanting to tip over this exceedingly rare vase and that's enough to get Mojo to come running out on all fours in a hectic scramble to stop her from damaging it. Seriously, the reaction faces Mojo has here are great because they're exaggerated but still remain within the general style of the character. They're not completely out of place. But this laser blast is the final straw, and Mojo really just gives up entirely after he hits his limit as signified by the notable repetition of every spoken line. Next day, next day, next day. I love how even the narrator gets in on it too. Small thing I know, but I just find it so amusing. And of course, the beats of the music that are synchronized with Mojo's lines just give it that extra oomph to back it up. All of that effort, all of that frustration, all of that utter chaos for nothing. All because Mojo couldn't get by on just one egg for breakfast that morning. I guess that's what he gets for eating three eggs on a previous day, presumably. Should have paid more attention to his remaining supply. But just when you'd think Mojo's in the clear, we cut to the following morning where he reads the paper to see the main headline news from the previous day. Mojo, Jojo saves the day? Returns Powerpuff's ball? <laughs> And I couldn't think of a more fitting note to end the episode on, honestly. Throughout the entire episode, Mojo is just uttering curses at every single inconvenience that occurs to him, no matter how big or small. And you know, it's a lot more than his standard allocated amount. Like, yeah, we'll maybe hear him say curses in response to failure once or twice an episode, but in just another manic Mojo, it's like every other line of dialogue he has, and it just makes me chuckle. So much so that I went out of my way to compile every utterance of the word curses into a single montage so you can see just exactly how many times he utters it over the course of the episode. Returns Powerpuff's ball? Yes! I need curses. I have forgotten my wallet. Curses. Powerpuff Girls save the day. Curses. 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 And on a final note, we get another specialized ending, this being the first of a few times that Mojo is solely credited for saving the day because he did, indeed, return the Powerpuff Girls ball to them. What a kind-hearted individual. What's interesting about this special ending, however, is that it's more than just a named recognition. It even comes with its own original music piece to accompany him as opposed to the standard Powerpuff outro music, which is a neat added touch since Mojo has a different motif to his theme compared to that of the girls. So pay attention to that when I play the outro of this episode here in a couple seconds after I wrap up my final few thoughts. Overall, I really do love Just Another Manic Mojo for being as silly as it is. Definitely in my top five of the season, no doubt about that. It's just such a zany concept of us getting to see what a typical day of Mojo's life might look like. You really wouldn't ever see this type of premise in your standard everyday superhero show, which again adds to the overall uniqueness of the Powerpuff Girls. 
Like, when else do you see the heroes being invited into the home of the villain because they just want a ball back so they can go back to playing catch outside in the town park? It's glorious. It just speaks to the testament of how unique of a concept the Powerpuff Girls has and how flexible it can be. Across all 21 scenarios that we've seen so far, sure, some are better than others, but there's so many creative alleys that are explored in this season alone, despite it having only just established itself. And it only gets better over the next three seasons, truly. We've only scratched the surface of what this show was truly capable of. I'm sure I sound like a broken record with several of the compliments I've been making about the show this far into the video, but the truth of the matter is that it really is a one-of-a-kind animated series that's way better than it ever needed to be, and that's because this show was created by a team of passionate people. This wasn't a product, it wasn't aiming to make money first, it was a fun project for a group of people to sit down and come up with the silliest ideas they could think of week after week because because it was fun, because they were enjoying it. They were making it for themselves and they were giving it their all. This show had one of the best teams ever behind it and it truly resulted in something special. And as if the rest of the season wasn't already enough proof of that, let's go ahead and transition into the last 11 minute episode of the season and easily one of the most iconic episodes of the series at that. And so the day is saved thanks to Mojo Jojo. You saved the day. I did not. Don't be silly. You gave their ball back. I said I didn't. All right, all right. Man, who doesn't love this episode? People who hate the ending, I guess, maybe, but I ain't one of them. This here is another one of those signature genius titles that I like to rave on about, as it's a play on a few different ideas at once. Obviously, the basis for it is the phrase, time for a change. Obviously, replace the word time with mime, and there you go. We've got a mime in this episode. But what I find so incredibly fascinating about it is the concept for the villain. Rainbow the Clown, this happy-go-lucky performer whose main goal is to end entertained through joy and color becomes this grayscale silent antagonistic mime who saps the color out of everything he touches and by extension, the life as well. A clown turned mime, two types of performers that are diametrically rivaled to one another as one focuses on slapstick which is usually tied to sound in several ways, typically big blasts of audio because sometimes loud equals funny, whereas mimes focus purely on visual comedy through their use of body language, completely removing sound from the equation. Two similar types of entertainers that use different skill sets to entertain their audience. I never really thought of a mime as being an evil clown before, especially considering a lot of pop culture has depicted clowns as the evil ones themselves in plenty of films and shows, and I tend to hear much more about people having a fear of clowns than they do of mimes. But hey, that's not to say mimes can't be just as terrifying. Either way, this episode has an awesome concept that a lot of people seem to latch onto for its sheer creative premise, and I am inclined to agree with with the majority on this one. Mime for a change is popular for a reason, and there's no denying why. That being said, let's dive in. The city of Townsville, a vibrant and colorful community. Listen, don't you hear the joy? Man, I swear, all of my praises of Jim Venable's scoring have been leading to this one episode because, go figure, one of the very last episodes of the season is yet another experimental one in a similar vein to the bare facts, albeit with a shift in focus on color and sound as opposed to perspective. That being said, the opening scene with our lovable friend here, Rainbow the Clown, is the perfect way to set up the concepts that are about to be toyed with when the action gets going. He sings this sweet little song as a birthday gift for Jim here, who is actually based on Jim Worthy, a background designer on the show, which this won't actually be the last time he shows up either. Rainbow's joyful that it brings happiness to all those fellow people around him. So what if the episode said, screw this guy, and nearly ran him over with a truck? I love that fake out pause there, like, you think he's fine, and then just BAM, there's the bleach to completely sap all of the color out of his outfit and flesh at that, turning him into the nefarious villain known by the name of Mr. Mime. Nope, not gonna make the obvious joke here. Literally everyone on the planet has already drawn the obvious comparison. Not gonna do it. Nope. Alright, fine. 
Ha ha! It's like Mr. Mime from Pokemon! Nah, to be honest, this is just a coincidence. Like, maybe if Rainbow here started using psychic powers and creating invisible barriers, then sure, it might be more intentional, but Mr. Mime's powers in this episode are completely unrelated to psychic abilities, and their character designs aren't very similar to each other at all. Plus the fact that Craig later confirmed it on Twitter, yeah, it's just a coincidence in the timing. But this is where that creativity I mentioned earlier comes in, because the show basically got this idea idea that, yeah, if you sap all the color out of a clown, they look relatively similar to that of a mime. What removes color easily? Bleach. There you go. He gets blasted with bleach to get his evil powers and personality. And like I said, it leads directly into the experimental side of the episode because he gets the power to diegetically suck all of the life and color out of everything. Cars, buildings, animals, people, you name it. It's just so awesome because the show, as seen with other innovative ideas that tried it in previous episodes, always find a way to make the idea that they're playing with a part of the story rather than just testing something out, you know? Like the show doesn't just go, hey, let's make a black and white episode. It goes, how can we make the removal of color in this episode interesting. What if we had a villain that toys with the diegetic world that had the ability to literally leech the color out of the screen from the viewer's perspective? That makes this episode respectable. It doesn't just do things to do it or to be fancy. It builds an entire character and story around the idea so that it can be explored narratively in a compelling manner. And my word, does it succeed yet again? And that's not all, because like I said, the score that accompanies Mr. Mime is just about the most unsettling backing track yet, with the distorted off-key notes being played by the Calliope. A calliope is an American musical instrument typically associated with circuses and by extension clowns and wow, I can't believe I actually get to use my knowledge of knowing what a calliope is for once in a video. Never thought that had happened. Do these things even exist anymore? I digress. It was the perfect instrument choice to include at the forefront of this mime sinister theme and that combined with the watery ending noise that typically lands on the ending beat of his leitmotif gives it this sort of, I don't know, liquid draining like feel to it. Like it almost feels as like that sound represents the actual bleach draining the color out of the frame or something. It's an odd but fitting sound choice that just resonates in such a distinct way. It's awesome. That of course brings us to the Powerpuff Girls, who discover the lack of color after their bus driver freaks out and loses control of his vehicle speed because the stoplight is out. Guess he never learned that you should always treat an intersection with a light out like a four-way stop. Who gave this guy his license? Either way, the girls save the day and set the bus back down, which only then is when they realize something fishy's going on, and Bubbles in particular just just ain't having it. This is very peculiar. Buttercup, what do you think? Whatever. <laughs> you mean whatever? Okay, admittedly, Buttercup's whatever response screams 90s, but that minor choice in dialogue direction aside, Bubbles' freak out here is great. I love the way she frantically just starts flying around everywhere trying to color everything in with her crayons, cause like, even though that's clearly not working, I admire her determination to set everything straight. Yeah, Blossom and Buttercup are off trying to figure out what exactly is going on here, but Bubbles has her priorities in other places, which reflects her more artsy and creative nature that she usually has over her sisters. This is complemented by the fact that the established shot of the girls on the bus has Bubbles coloring in a crayon drawing of her and her sisters while she's singing a cheery little tune. And then the green, and then more pink, and then a dash of blue. Coloring, 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 get another color, do to do. Look, I draw us. Which I simply adore, but that's not all it has going for it. More on that in a few minutes. Also, I think it's a really cool detail that when Bubbles draws on everything, she scribbles in actual crayon. Like, the animators actually physically drew on the image or backgrounds to give it a crayon texture that mimic Bubbles' crayons. It's almost fourth wall breaking in a way, albeit subtly and still remaining within the world, but it's such an awesome detail nonetheless. It's another example of the show going above and beyond and doing something it didn't need to do, but it did anyways to further enhance the experience. With Bubbles preoccupied with coloring the entire environment around her, it's up to Blossom and Buttercup to get to the bottom of this, which doesn't take them too long, as all they have to do is follow the trail of color desaturation until they come across Mr. Mime, who's going all out on taking the sheer life and sound out of everything with his powers. Produce stands and construction workers, babies and hip-hop artists. Nothing is safe from Mr. Mime's bleach, not even a nest of birds. <laughs> Thank you.
You can tell the board artist had a blast coming up with the ways to animate Mr. Mime coming on screen to sap the color away too, either by mimicking the motion of a jackhammer or striking a hip hop pose based on the appropriate victims of his discoloration. Not even the girls are immune from an ambush after they get cornered by Mr. Mime in an alleyway, leaving Bubbles to discover them all by her lonesome a moment later. And try as she might, as she has the entire episode, she colors her sisters in to no avail, leading to her desperate cry as she lets out a hearty no while the camera pans out like four times to emphasize how small she is in this moment of defeat. And I love this shot too. You really get a sense of the scale here and what Bubbles is up against when you see this tiny smudge on the screen surrounded by a giant grayscale world that envelops the entire frame of the image. And that of course leads into easily the most memorable part of the episode. Love makes the world go around. Powerpuff Girls isn't prominently known for its original songs, but the show certainly had several made during its run, and this is one of the most recognizable ones, no doubt. It's another reason people like the episode so much, and I see why. I really do like the song. That bass line, man. So before I get into the song itself, I do want to highlight my favorite part of the episode. Like I said, I've basically been building up to this concept for the entire duration of the video, and it almost feels like it was all leading to culminate in this moment, because the way the sound is utilized in this episode in particular finally brings it to the forefront. The use of sound is explicitly tied to color in this episode, as is shown off many times with the sound effects vanishing when Mr. Mime alters the reality of that space. Color in this episode is representative of life, and by extension, so is sound. When characters lose their color, they also lose their life, in a sense. Not literally speaking, but figuratively. And it's Bubbles' use of sound in the form of song that brings the color, and by extension, life, back into her sisters and the rest of Townsville. It's a clever turnaround. Just as spring always comes to wash winter away, so does music to drown out the silence. Of course, it helps that it's a catchy tune as well. And what more can I really say? The lyrics might be a bit basic, but the tune more than makes up for it. I love some of the shots and effects that the team chose to use to treat it almost like a music video in a sense with the crowd cheering at the base of the stage and everything. This shot in particular with the girls running towards the screen was always super memorable to me. Although what's interesting is that actually if you pay attention to Blossom's lip movements, they mimic in line with Buttercups as she sings the love loop as I call it, while Kathy Cavadini is actually singing something completely different. I think I remember reading somewhere at some point in time that they actually made this change at the very last minute, but it could have also just been a production error on the animator's side. I'm not entirely sure. Overall though, Love Makes the World Go Round, it's a catchy song and definitely makes a memorable moment seeing the girls up on stage. It was a nice touch that they threw the PPG logo on the drum set kind of like a lot of bands typically do, and I especially love when Blossom goes hard on that one guitar solo. Also, a small attention to detail that I've never seen anybody point out, but it's utterly genius, is this. Did you ever notice how it's during the guitar solo, the most prominent moment in the song where you're getting blasted with the most sound from the instrument, has Blossom flashing all sorts of different colors within her outline rapidly, almost as if it's overstimulating? That wasn't just a cool effect the episode wanted to do. This was an intentional choice. It's communicating to the audience that the intensity of the sound has reached its peak. The girls are overflowing with colorful energy as they rock out to the rhythm of the tune. The color is on total overload. This is the moment that generates the power within Blossom's guitar to emit those sonic waves that convert Mr. Mime back into Rainbow the Clown and frees him from his curse. These flashing colors are representative of the music hitting its maximum potential as the colors are practically radiating off of Blossom through the intensity of the solo. She can't be stopped, no matter Mr. Mime's efforts, which is why he ultimately succumbs to the tune in the end. And with that, all's well that ends well, right? I'm back, Rainbow the Clown! <laughs> Well, dang, I guess that introduces the one major criticism I see a lot of people throw at this episode, which is that the ending is too mean. And like, 
I get where they're coming from, but it's never really bothered me. I mean, Craig has even come out and stated many years later that even he admits it's a bit mean and he wouldn't do an episode like that nowadays, but back then, I can kind of see it since he was a lot younger and maybe had a different sense of humor. I get the joke it's going for, even if it is a bit extreme, but I don't hate the ending because in the end, Rainbow did still cause trouble even if he wasn't necessarily in control of himself. I see both sides is what I'm saying. Either way, the ending doesn't ruin any aspect of the episode for me personally. This story was never about should Rainbow end end up in jail or not, it was an experiment with sound and color alike, and I'm drawn way more to that anyways. I personally find Mime for a Change to be a great episode that I have little problems with. It's got an interesting villain and I've already praised the ideas it plays with at great length, so I don't see any need for me to carry on. As far as 11 minute episodes go, this was one of the best to end the season on, and I can wholeheartedly recommend it to anyone. There's a reason it's amongst the more talked about episodes of the show, for sure. So, once again, the day is saved, thanks to the Powerpuff Girl. Love, 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 la la la. All right, everyone, it's time for the episode you've all been waiting for, The Rowdy Rough Boys. To say this is one of the most popular episodes of the entire series would be an understatement, but it's not because of how well-produced, choreographed, animated, and written the episode is. Oh, no, it's because of one brief moment right here. That's right, I'm ripping the band-aid off. That last minute of the episode where the girls kiss the boys, this harmless little ending that sparked what would become the biggest scourge on the entire Powerpuff fandom for decades to follow? Shipping. I'm getting this out of the way. Now, I mean no offense to anybody that enjoys the concept of shipping, and if people want to continue to ship the Powerpuff Girls and Rowdy Rough Boys together, there's nothing I'm going to do to stop them. But to get the elephant out of the room before I review the episode, here are all the reasons why I dislike the concept. And I'm sure I'm going to upset a lot of Powerpuff fans in saying this, but I've been putting off talking about this for years, so at this point, bring it on. Number one, and this is the most crucial detail of them all. They're five. They're literally five years old. Number two, it's a complete disservice to the show and characters. The girls have so much more to them as characters than being boy crazy all the time. Yet like half the total of all fan content revolves around the girls and boys together romantically. The show also isn't a romance or drama, it's an action comedy. This shipping thing has nothing to do with it. They're superheroes first, and for some reason the fandom just forgets that. Number three, the show staff never intended for any of this. It's purely a fan concept that is only supported by like one season five episode, which for all intents and purposes, literally showed us how lame the idea was, but whatever, we'll get to that episode someday. And number four, the Powerpuff Girls and Rowdy Rough Boys are half siblings who share the same father, Mojo Jojo. Mojo is literally the creator of both the girls and the boys, as emphasized by these lines right here. Well, Mojo, keep in touch, son. Yeah. See you around, Dad. Who do you think you are anyway, Pops? Why, yes, I am your father! Which does play into a criticism of the kiss scene being a little strange. So, yeah, I'm just not a fan of the concept, I never liked it, and I wish that this episode was remembered more for the best thing it delivers on, action, instead of this. This is one of the best action episodes in the entire show. Like, period. And it's kind of weird for me to admit this right after I just got done dissing the whole shipping thing, but as a kid, this was my favorite episode of the show. Not because of the ending, but because of the action scenes. There are just so many incredible fight sequences littered throughout the entire second half of the episode that it delivers such a wild ride. And while I find the boys to be very one-note characters, as threats to the girls, they are the perfect equal antagonist, evenly matched in abilities and raw power, pushing the girls to their absolute limit in so 
many ways to the point that they actually lose to them in pure combat, which admittedly does have an unfortunate implication that may not have aged perfectly, but it does show that even the girls aren't invincible characters that just win all the time. They have a certain level of humility and realize that sometimes they're gonna fail, but their willpower and ingenuity grants them the courage to find other ways to circumvent challenges and overcome anything that stands in their way. But I'll get more into that when we get to it. The title of the episode, by the way, is literally just The Rowdy Rough Boys. I wasn't just presenting the characters when I introduced this review. No, this is literally the entire episode title, which while it may admittedly seem lazy at first given it's just the name of the characters, the term Rowdy Rough is a direct play on the name Powerpuff, so, you know, it still works as a pun regardless. When it comes down to it, the core concept of this episode is actually pretty simple. What would evil Powerpuff Girls be like? Well, let's find out by watching Mojo destroy the city a bunch first. The city of Townsville is under attack by Mojo Jojo. I enjoy the entire opening montage that kicks the episode off. All three major plots that Mojo attempts. First, he's attempted to destroy things with a laser gun, which creates these giant red smoke explosions that I've always loved the visual color choice of. I don't know why, but just the look of these red smoke clouds is so appealing to me. Plus, Mojo kills a bunch of people. Presumably. Look, you can even see one guy's arm if you slow the footage down. His second plot is an odd change of pace, but very Mojo nonetheless, because he's literally flying around Townsville in this giant Cyclops telescope UFO and taking down the entire military with ease. And then his third attempt is him stomping around in his giant mech suit, all of which result in the girls defeating him every time and him getting tossed in prison with the sinister scowl on his face that with every failure looks more and more agitated than the last. There's a lot to compliment about the first part of the episode. I love Mojo's mugshots, I love his prison outfit design, I love how the city backgrounds change color schemes with every new plan that Mojo attempts, I really love the interior design of Mojo's machines having this deep red control panels that consist of all sorts of monitors and stuff. The combat is stellar, but that goes without saying. It really feels like a tried and true supervillain versus superhero action scene. But of course, with it being tried and true, that means the villain always loses. No matter what evil scheme or attempt at defeating the Powerpuff Girls Mojo Jojo attempts, he can never seem to win, and Blossom absolutely rubs it in his face. Give it up, Mojo. You will never defeat us. Stop it there. The Powerpuff Girls never lose. And this makes Mojo furious. I'm talking full-blown rage fest. He gets tossed in prison for a third time and he goes absolutely ballistic. The anger, the rage, it's just so primal. Like he's reverted back to his animalistic instincts as a chimp. It's a full-blown temper tantrum, but it feels so justified given the entire setup we were treated to prior to this moment. That's the thing about this episode. Like, we're not even to the Rowdy Rough Boys yet, and yet there's so much to admire about this episode's setup. Like, this isn't just an ordinary episode episode where we assume Mojo loses all the time based on other episodes, we see it happen three times in a rapid, repetitious succession to fully emphasize his irritation. It justifies his overly emotional response when he's thrown in prison for the third time. Like, this whole freakout scene wouldn't have nearly as much importance to the grander scheme of the episode had we only seen him fail once. It's that methodical structure that builds up to this freakout that makes it work, and this outrage is then immediately followed by despair as we shift from the brightly lit scene to these incredible dark shots of Mojo postulating in his prison cell. This shot where you can only see his face from the side has such an eerie ambiance to it. It's almost depressing in the way the blue-green shading and black shadows basically encapsulate Mojo entirely to where it makes him appear helpless, trapped in this void with seemingly no way to bounce back. And this one close-up shot of Mojo's deep red eyes is even more ominous because even despite Mojo's hopeless state, he is still cold and calculating, still pushing on with pure evil coursing through his veins. So what plan does he ultimately come up with to beat the girls once and for all in his current state? What evil scheme does he concoct? The Powerpuff Girls House! Hello? Hello, uh, may I speak to Professor Utonium? So, you know, he just hits up the Powerpuff residents via the hotline. Like you do. Guess they just have this thing's phone number lying around all over the place or something. See, this scene is another great example of a typical moment you'll never get in any other superhero show. The evil arch-villain literally calling the father of their arch-rival and having a casual conversation about how they were created. Also, why was the narrator so jolly there? Like, was that just Tom Kenny goofing around or something? It's so overly joyful that it basically creates a sort of mood with 
whiplash from Mojo's despair to suddenly be all wacky and goofy, but that just goes to show how even when there are dramatic character scenes in the show, it doesn't take itself too seriously by reminding the audience how goofy it is with things like this. So when hearing their origin from the professor, Mojo takes it upon himself to create an alternative variant of the Powerpuff Girls via his own methods with the resources he has at his disposal, and this is what I've been waiting for. I can finally acknowledge the nursery rhyme that this entire series was based off of. Yeah, you know the intro with the whole sugar spice and everything nice thing? I'm sure most people probably knew this already, but in case anybody watching has no idea what I'm talking about, the phrase sugar, spice, and everything nice is not an original idea from the Powerpuff Girls, although this show is certainly the most recognizable thing that comes to mind whenever that phrase is brought up. In actuality, this phrase originates from the 19th century nursery rhyme that has never had a confirmed author as far as we know. The nursery rhyme is actually called What Are Little Boys Made Of, seeing as the first verse of the song tells of what boys are made of. The Powerpuff Girls introductory narration actually follows the second verse of the song, which tells of what little girls are made of, sugar, spice, and everything nice. I also love how the chef is just this nice guy who smiles for like no reason, and also is smoking, interestingly enough. A lot of these prisoners have unique designs, which makes looking at all of them in this wide shot really fun, and what's that one guy doing in the corner there? And then to top it off, Mojo's version of Chemical X is literally just a prison toilet, which like... <laughs> <laughs> Chemical indeed. Admittedly, witnessing Mojo inhale the toxic fumes isn't something I ever needed to see in my lifetime, but aside from this moment, the rest of Mojo's facial expressions are on point in this episode. Whether it's how he reacts when the girls beat him, or just how giddy he gets because he put his next evil plan in motion. Speaking of which, that brings us to the introduction of the Rowdy Rough Boys. <laughs> Okay, so I kind of mentioned it earlier, but one criticism I have of these characters is that they are very one-dimensional. None of them have any distinct personality traits aside from Brick, kind of, and really all he has going for him is that he's the leader. Boomer and Butch don't really get the personalities they're kind of known for in the last two seasons here, so they really are just existing as evil versions of the girls without the distinctions between each other. That being said, let me at least acknowledge the positive things I do like about the boys, because they definitely do have qualities that I think are pretty neat especially given that they're basically foil characters to the girls. Not just because of the fact that they're boy versions on the surface, but because they really are so incredibly similar to one another, but have the big contrasting character trait of their moral alignment. In D&D terms, the girls are lawful good, and the boys are pretty much chaotic evil. That being said, I do like how the boys have darker color variants of the girls and the same hair colors. They've also got long sleeves and their eyelids aren't purple, which took me actually like 20 years to notice because I always saw the girls girls had purple eyelids, and I just thought that's how they were all designed. I never realized that it was supposed to be mascara or whatever. Honestly though, I just like the purple eyelids more than the reddish tan ones the boys have, that I always just associate purple as being the default eyelid color of Powerpuff Girls characters anyways. The Rowdy Rough Boys names also start with B's, with them of course being Brick, Boomer, and Butch, the former two being voiced by Rob Paulson and the latter being voiced by Roger L. Jackson, by the way, for anyone curious. Each of the boys have unique hairstyles that are similar to the girls such as Brick's hat and long hair being reminiscent of Blossom's bow, so both leaders have a head accessory, while Butch has the most simplistic hairstyle with bangs, like Buttercup, and Boomer's is similar to Bubbles. And lastly, my favorite detail is that their theme is literally the inverted note progression of the Powerpuff Girls theme, where instead of the upward rise in notes, it's a downward decline. That's just awesome. So yeah, hopefully that kind of shows I don't hate these characters just because of what they're associated with. Like I said, they don't have a lot in the motivation department, but as far as designs go, they're pretty spot on. So after introductions are had, the boys end up grabbing Mojo and busting him out of prison, which then hard cuts directly into a commercial break. And that brings us into the second half of the episode, aka the best half of the episode. The scene starts off with the girls fighting a giant octopus monster that stumbled its way into the city somehow, and after a well-fought battle, Bubbles ends up flying through the back of this creature and straight out of its eyeball in a kind of gross but more so gruesome manner that pretty much shows us straight up that they killed this monster. You know, usually when the girls fight a monster, they beat it and send it back to where it came from, just battered and beaten. Nah, this octopus here, straight up dead, and there's no buts about it. Side note, Bubble Vicious doesn't count, those were holograms, but that's besides the point. This fight doesn't really last long though, because that was just the appetizer. The main course is getting dished up by the Rowdy Rough Boys, who don't waste so so much as a second thought before pummeling the girls from out of nowhere. We're the rowdy rough boys and we wanna fight! What's up with that? 
those guys. Leading to what is hands down the best action of the entire series up to this point. It really feels like we've built up to the end of the season with this one, seeing as it is primarily consisting of non-stop speed, fast cuts, excellently timed editing, and the perfect musical score to back it all up. It's like season one was an opportunity for the crew to hone their skills and really get a feel for what they were capable of, and this episode here is the end result of what they were building up to all season. It really is just an awesome extended action sequence that gives me a boost of serotonin every time I see it, because like, in most of the 11 minute episodes, we definitely get action, but it usually only goes on for a short time. With this, we've got like a straight seven minutes of combat with all sorts of interesting maneuvers and set pieces sprinkled throughout. There are just so many incredible shots of the girls and boys fighting back and forth against each other here. I love this one tackle motion that bubbles indoors only to flip Boomer back up into the building behind her, which leads into the other two boys being smashed into it too. And then they recover off of it and jump back down in this awesome action pose before chaotically leaping from building to building in such a disorganized array without ever colliding with one another. A stark contrast from the girls' counterattack where they all fall in an organized formation to strike back at the boys. There's so much differentiation here between both sides, and yet they're constantly balancing each other out with no clear winner. Oh man, and I especially love this extended wide shot where you see all six of the characters sort of flying around the wide background. There's so much happening all at once that it feels like a genuine all-out street brawl. Plus, there's a dead octopus in the background as well for like half a second. It's even shown that the boys have a tendency to fight dirty, such as when Brick pulls Blossom's hair and swings her around like a lasso, which is just plain cheating, honestly, but what can you expect? They're the bad guys. Bubbles! Are you alright? That's a neat Sesame Street reference there with Bubbles acknowledging Mr. Hooper. Always thought that was charming. But if you thought the hair pulling was cheap, you ain't seen nothing yet. This episode really just gives us all the action we could ever want, which is why I consider it one of the best of the season. I mean, this entire sequence of all three girls attempting to save all these people in these different vehicles that are all hurtling towards each other is so heart pumping, especially with watching Buttercup halt a literal cruise ship, which has her animated in such a way that you can literally feel the same strain in your muscles as Buttercup as she catches this colossal mass of metal. And then the boys just come in and get a cheap shot after the citizens thank them. Like, yeah, that's fair. All of these action sequences are organized chaos. Oxymoronic to say the least, but it's true because every single moment of this battle is just so well planned, yet there's so much going on at once it can feel completely disordered when trying to keep up. You almost have to watch it multiple times to truly witness everything that happens across these fight scenes. Oh, and another small detail I love is how when the girls flee the city we get to see the boys flight trails, whereas the girls have a thicker but flat flight trail, the boys have a more rocket-like jagged trail with thinner tails behind them. And as if the vehicles weren't enough, we then shift over to a massive chase sequences through the skies where the boys race after the girls in hopes to send them home crying once and for all. When it ultimately comes down to it, the boys have one goal in mind, as they say from the beginning. They just want to kick some butt. The girls are at a clear disadvantage here because they're busy trying to be mindful of the city and citizens around them, and the boys do not care. They do not have any sort of attachment to these people or a civic duty that exists as an obstacle in their way. Meaning that when you put these two equally superpowered teams against one another, the one with said disadvantage is practically guaranteed to lose in the end, and that's exactly what ends up happening here. You know what I appreciate about this scene? The fact that, while this is 100% a joke about flatulence, it's completely implied rather than outright brought to everyone's attention. There's no obvious sound effect, no in-your-face gross reaction, no crude remarks. It's nothing more than a passing comment made by Butch while also being drawn as a parallel to that of the rocket ship smoke. Not only in Brick's comment of kick in the afterburners, but the fact that their light trails literally animate like rockets. So it's not just bottom of the barrel, there's more class to it than a typical joke of that humor. Kinda weird that this is the finishing blow that sends them to their defeat, but I can't deny that it's a pretty awesome moment nonetheless. Up in the sky! It's a missile! It's a bomb! It's a death ray! It's the girls! Oh. 
Just the pure silence as everything flashes a bright white while the girls crash into the ground below deep, deep underground in their first ever tragic defeat that we've seen. While it obviously isn't shown this way, this is practically an implied death scene in a way because the reactions of the citizens witnessing this are completely speechless in such a manner. It's a somber shift in tone from the thrilling fun of the action to the sudden realization that, oh my god, the girls are seriously hurt while the boys are off celebrating with Mojo back at his lab by dumping Gatorade on him. The Superheroes lost. They failed, and they're about to abandon Townsville forever for failing to protect the city from evil. And it's not until Ms. Bellum tells them they're attacking the problem from the wrong angle that they realize that sometimes there's other ways to beat somebody than just using brute force. Instead of fighting, try being nice. Huh? You know, nice. I get it. Ew, gross. What are you people talking about? Admittedly, this conversation isn't a very subtle one, although, as a kid, I certainly wasn't picking up on any of it. Yeah, just like the mayor, I was completely lost on this as a child, and that's probably the reason why they could get away with it, honestly. It's still insane that they did, regardless, but the implications here are not going to register to the young and innocent minds watching the show. But on a less suggestive note, I really do love how Ms. Bellum is essentially like a mother figure to the girls in a sense here. This is the first first of several times throughout the series that she kind of takes on this role, and every time she does, it's an excellent utilization of her character. But with that, the boys come to find out that the girls are back again, and... <gasps> what the? Yep. This scene, something that was simply meant to be a clever way to solve the problem devolved into decades and decades of a peculiar fixation. But I already addressed that at the start of the episode, so no need to beat a dead horse. In all honesty, I think the way the girls beat the boys here is clever on the writer's behalf. Like, on one hand, yeah, cooties, it makes total sense and it completely destroys the Rowdy Rough Boys chemical balance. It's over-exaggerated and the eyelashes are a bit much to be honest, but I think it's super clever as a solution to the problem. Especially because these kisses outright murder them, resulting in Mojo once again failing and getting hauled off to prison for the fourth time in the episode. It's a cute ending, but it's not perfect. I'd say, at the time, it was probably deemed an okay feminist ending, but like, if you look at it from the perspective of the fact that the girls weren't strong enough to beat the boys with their own powers and had to rely on their sweetness, to beat them. All I'm saying is it isn't the best example to go to for feminist messaging in the show. I give the benefit of the doubt that the right intentions were here, and it was a different time, so perhaps this was looked at with a very high amount of respect, but it is flawed. But that brings the episode to a close, so I guess with that I'll go on record right now and say that it was great, it was wild, it was fun. As a young boy though, you can imagine I hated the kissing scene because goodies, I grossed me out, and the Rowdy Rough Boys' reaction to this were super accurate to me for what that's worth. The other reason I liked this episode so much back then is because it was my first episode of the show. Yeah, I know, it took this long to get to it. I can't remember what time of year it was that I had first seen this episode, but I remember exactly where I was when I did. Upstairs in my grandparents' bedroom, probably three or four years old at the time, watching it on their tiny little box TV. I had never seen so much action, so much violence in anything before. Powerpuff Girls exposed me to a whole new world of animation that I never knew existed. Needless to say, here I am decades later, still here, still praising it for all its glory. I may have matured a lot since I watched that episode, especially because I'm an adult and not four, and it's far from my favorite nowadays, but I will always appreciate it for being my first. And what an episode to be someone's first of the series, right? Yeah, needless to say, I was hooked from that day on. So once again, the day is saved, thanks to the Powerpuff Girls. So now, all that remains is the season finale. Although Powerpuff Girls never really branded its final episodes of each season as finales per se, and to be quite upfront with you, Uh-Oh Dynamo is probably the most season finale-esque out of all the potential season-ending episodes because this is another half-hour episode that leans heavily into the action side of things just like the Rowdy Rough Boys did. It's another well-beloved episode, and once again, it's pretty clear to see why, given that it's basically a love letter to kaiju movie fans ever. 
everywhere. And for those of you in the audience that may not know exactly what kaiju means, it's a Japanese term that refers to films centered around monster movies in which monsters are typically gigantic and tend to destroy giant landmarks and cities as the people frantically flee below them. Godzilla is the kingpin among all of them, given that its movies tended to be the most popular, stemming all the way back to 1954, which is commonly regarded as the first of its kind. There have been numerous kaiju movies made over the last several decades, to the point that kaiju is more commonly used to refer to monster battles rather than just one singular monster attacking a city, although they both tend to get swept under the same umbrella. Either way, Dynamo falls into the more common occurrence, that being a giant monster battle between well, a giant monster, and a giant robot. In watching this episode, it's pretty clear that several people working on the show were likely to be massive giant monster movie fans given the sheer faithfulness to the genre that gets captured here with the sheer amount of set pieces and action scenes that play out, just like you would expect one to. It's also awesome because while, yes, giant monsters have already been featured in the Powerpuff Girls episodes that have come before this, this is the first real episode to be 100% focused on the monster being the main threat of the episode. Yes, I suppose one could argue Paste Makes Waste technically did it first, but that only lasted a few minutes, and also wasn't truly a monster from the start, but rather a kid that transformed into one radioactively, so really that just comes down to semantics. I'll make arguments against Octi Evil and Major Competition as well, seeing as those monsters only showed up in the final act and weren't a continuous threat for the entire duration. Uh-oh Dynamo has our good friend the Balloon Fish Monster, a monster so powerful that it can inhale a ton of air to increase its size exponentially and strengthen its blubbery flesh to become difficult for even the girls to bludgeon in any meaningful capacity. Following this episode, the balloon fish monster essentially became the signature Powerpuff Girls monster design, as it tended to be featured in a lot of the promo material to essentially represent all of the giant monsters of the show. It was the main threat in the Apples and Stereos Signal in the Sky music video, and it showed up in the 10th anniversary special Powerpuff Girls rule, and gets referenced in future episodes as well, of course. And I really think it has a pretty great design over all to boot. But before we get into the fish balloon monster's appearance, let's first talk about the episode's opening. Now it should be known going into this that Dynamo wasn't always intended to be a half hour long. Don Shank, who was the head board artist for this episode, actually went a bit overboard with it, which ended up extending the episode's runtime as confirmed in the Powerpuff Girls Power Zine. Oh, and before I forget to mention it, the title Uh Oh Dynamo is based on the popular advertising campaign Uh Oh SpaghettiOs, which isn't just a play on the sound of the slogan, but like, Dynamo makes a lot of mistakes in the episode, so the phrase Uh Oh is pretty applicable, but you'll see what I mean. So with that context in mind, it could be said that this episode's beginning montage that runs through a bunch of locations around Townsville could be viewed as filler. It could be seen as an unnecessarily long sequence that just kind of meanders through the setting of Townsville and shows off a bunch of inconsequential locations around the city, but this episode does do something clever with these locations later on, which in my opinion almost makes this opener necessary to the episode, and I think it's a brilliant workaround. I mean, maybe this was included to fill time because without it the episode would only run for 17 minutes, but I'll get to why in a moment. First, I want to comment on Tokyo Townsville's background designs, which I just think are stellar. Between the city skyline and the bonsai gardens especially, which has such an awesome seafoam green grass color tone to it, lots of greens and blues are here in general, which definitely makes the solid red bridges and walkways stick out against the environment more. It's just such a calming location, and the incorporation of Japanese instruments into the soundtrack of the episode is a great inclusion to the atmosphere that is set. Oh, and the narrator introduces it in the form of poetry, which is nice as well, which leads into a brief montage of all of these Golden Book stylized paintings that make for a very interesting inclusion in the episode. Again, PPG shows us that it's not afraid to experiment and introduce new stylized art designs into these episodes whenever it feels it may appropriately fit, which just makes me appreciate it even more than I already do because it shows the diversity in production and enthusiasm for the craft. Now there is a major point of contention that comes into play around this moment where the fish balloon monster arrives that leads to my understanding of why some people might criticize the episode. The way the professor responds to the situation. You know, in most episodes up to this point, he's seemingly been perfectly fine with the girls beating up bad guys and defeating monsters all the time, but for whatever reason in this episode here, he is freaking out thinking he was going to lose them. Admittedly, I'm kind of inclined to agree, but I'll at least offer my best rebuttal here. 
I can understand it being his first time as a father realizing the sheer level of threats the girls encounter. It's like a wake-up call for him, a sudden realization as to the harsh reality of what the girls endure and the fact that he could lose them at any time without being able to do anything about it. On the other hand, it seems odd that he would normally be okay with the girls fighting crime all the time against other foes with weapons or monsters or the devil himself, but hey, it's kind of a necessary step in order for Dynamo to be created and introduced anyways. Which is exactly what the second part of the episode leads into, Dynamo's construction. It's another The Professor Builds Something montage, similar to the ones we've seen in Mr. Mojo's Rising and Catman Do, but honestly, I still don't get tired of them. Unlike the Professor here, who literally spent sleepless nights just building this thing from start to finish. It's got great lighting, and I love how they overlay the various clocks across the scenes to emphasize this. Also, the Professor is a convention-going man, I see. Fascinating. In the end, though, his efforts result in one of his greatest inventions yet, a giant mecha named Dynamo, who he can't wait to introduce the girls to. This is, of course, tying back into that kaiju influence that I mentioned prior to the starting of this episode, with mechas definitely playing a prominent role in several of those films as a subtype of kaiju monster, the most recognizable probably being Mecha Godzilla, although several others exist as well. The Pacific Rim franchise is also a recognizable utilization of these sorts of monsters, although that is a property of Western origin but very much in line with the genre. Also, believe it or not, this is not actually the first time that Dynamo had existed in the Powerpuff franchise. No, in fact, Dynamo actually ties all the way back to being one of Craig's four earliest ideas for Whoop-Ass Stew, specifically his short Monster Trouble, which honestly, out of the three that were never finished, is totally my favorite. A monster's attacking the city! We're all gonna die! Oh, who? Who will save us? That's who! It's the whoop -ass Girls! Just the way Craig delivers that, we're all gonna die, line cracks me up every time I hear it. Oh, and yes, that is Craig narrating, by the way. Interestingly, in that short, the girls just combine their powers and instantly transform into the dynamo rather than it being a fully built mecha. And honestly, I'm glad they changed the concept for this episode, because like, honestly, if the girls could just transform into it on a whim, it'd bring in the never-ending question of, why don't they just transform into the dynamo? And even though those repercussions are acknowledged later in this very episode, I just just know that would still be a criticism that people would bring up. And so ultimately, the professor requests that the girls use Dynamo because it will keep them safe, even though the girls themselves aren't too keen on the idea, especially Buttercup. Um, that, that's Super Professor, but we don't need a battle robot. Ugh, we have superpowers, you know. That was always a weird line delivery to me. This happens a few times in season one, and I'm not sure if there was this idea at play with Buttercup talking a lot like a valley girl in a way. I mean, between this and her whatever to Bubbles in Mime for a change and some of her other lines in earlier episodes, there's like hints of 90s sprinkled throughout here and there. But after season one, it feels like this idea was pretty much dropped because it never really appears again. Also, Octi disappears from Bubbles' arms in between these two shots. You know, honestly, even though this show had some animation errors here and there, I haven't really felt the need to point out a lot of them because, you know, I get it. Not everything's perfect. But a lot of the creative techniques this show employs in its presentation, such as the art style shifts or special effects, as well as the fact that the characters' stories and themes are super endearing and well-written, minor mistakes like this don't really mean anything in the grand scheme of things. There have been other mistakes that I've chosen to point out and others I've chosen not to point out, not because I want to hide the show's imperfections, but just because it's not really necessary when looking at the big picture. I mean, there have been several lip sync errors or incorrect correct color usage that's occurred, and I'm never going to deny that these things happen because they absolutely did. That's why I point them out sometimes, but I guess just if anyone thought that I wasn't aware of these issues, oh, no, I am. But those sorts of things aren't super glaring and don't change the overall perception of the episode for me, so I don't see it necessary to point out every single time. But the sequence following the professor showing his creation to the girls is one of the best parts of the episodes because next we get a montage of the girls fighting all sorts of crime over the course of a five-day week. I love that lighting effect with the hotline in darkness followed by the fade in. That's awesome, and so are all of the crimes they end up solving. On Monday, they stop this crook from robbing the Binkity Bonk Bank. On Tuesday, they solve a damn octopus problem, and I love that clever wordplay they manage to sneak through. Wednesday, they save a burning building. Thursday, they destroy a meteor with these awesome spacesuits, which I really wish came back in the series more. They're really cool designs, and I totally could have seen like a full on space episode where the girls wear them the whole time. That would have been sweet. Oh, and then on Friday, Mojo enacts his most 
most evil plan ever. Whacking the Powerpuff Girls with a stick. Truly the most evil plan that was sure to allow him to beat the girls. Truly. Nah, that's some great visual gag humor that I really appreciate because the episode doesn't even acknowledge it. It's completely on you as the viewer to recognize the stupidity of the scene, and that's just great. But you know what's even greater than that? <laughs> Root beer time. Ah, a classic. Don't ask me why. I don't know. But this is just one of the most quotable things I've ripped from the entire show and carried with me for years and years. Yeah, the Utoniums decided that they should head back to the Bonsai Gardens again on Saturday because surely that balloon fish monster wouldn't show up again, right? Right? Oh, man. Oh, can't you come back later? It's Saturday. And this time, it brought its mother and or father, which is admittedly terrifying in its introductory scene because this thing just swallows like a ton of kids whole and then spits them out like toothpicks. Like seriously, as if a giant eyeball rising out of the water isn't enough, proceeding to be swallowed by this massive creature for a brief moment before being spat out has gotta have like lifelong mind paralyzing effects on these kids. It's dark, and the episode only gets darker from there. Try as the girls might, they're unable to break through the fish balloon's thick blubbery hide, allowing it to crush them between its fins and send them plummeting down to the ground below. Another concept that was pulled directly from that Monster Trouble short, by the way, the girls being unable to bludgeon the monster's flesh. Honestly, it makes me happy knowing that, in some way. Craig eventually got to see the short fully realized, even if it was presented in a different, and truth be told, better, contextual narrative. Not only that, but these shots that succeed the girls falling to the ground are amazing, with the fish balloon standing there and walking into the city while it rips up buildings and the city starts to ignite on fire while the girls just lie there helpless in the foreground. It's such a neat perspective that really gives this sense of an imminent doom that just befell Townsville now that the girls have been beaten. And finally, after a week of disappointment, the professor sees his opportunity to encourage, and by encourage I mean force, the girls to use Dynamo, and they finally agree realizing that they couldn't seem to beat the monster with their fists alone. And so, with a speedy transition that when slowed down you can see spells out Dynamo that you'd otherwise miss in the blink of an eye, we're introduced to the girls using it for the first time, and I just gotta say that I love Dynamo's design. I really like the red and gray color scheme and the giant yellow eyes and blue bow that just further accent that deep red. Plus, what else is cool is that the hairstyle of the robot essentially represents all three of the girls between Blossom's bow, Bubbles' pigtails, and Buttercup's bangs, which is a small but appreciated touch. Oh, and I also love this little theme that plays when Dynamo takes off, and I wish it got used more in the series because it is such a catchy tune. leading us into the second half of the episode, one of, if not the, most action-packed segments of the entire show here. Honestly, I don't even think words can do it justice. It's just the crew of the show indulging themselves into the action just as much as they did with Rowdy Ruff, and this has Gendy's name written all over it again. Go figure. It's just non-stop spectacle, and what's even cooler is how I mentioned all of those set pieces that were established at the very beginning of the episode. Yeah, they're all seen during this fight sequence at various points. At one moment, the balloon fish monster picks up the bullet train and uses it as nunchucks. In another sequence, Dynamo gets sent hurling straight through the museum and colliding into the city's capitol building. At one point, the monster shoots its spikes through this fancy restaurant and Mojo's lab. Oh, and probably the most memorably disturbing shot in the entire episode, the blimp over the stadium. Yeah, that's the sound of real people screaming as the blimp, fully ignited, goes crashing down onto the stadium below, presumably killing most everyone inside. This episode, uh-oh Dynamo, got away with tons of violence and killing. I mean tons of killing. It's completely unreal to me. I mean, say what you want about the adult jokes and even some of the other violence we've gotten to this point, because in my eyes, that stuff is either pretty tame or few and far between. But watching a blimp full of people get shot down, burn up into a giant fireball like the Hindenburg, and crash down onto a stadium full of people below that had no means of escape while you hear their ear-piercing screams? What the fu- And that's not the only case of this. The fish balloon monster literally eats this elderly woman alive. There's no shot afterwards of her being spat out like the kids were. No acknowledgement of her being okay. No, that's just it. We never see her again. So by all means, she was straight up eaten. 
but that one's not so bad. There is another moment, however, where the crowd boos the fish monster for beating Dynamo's attempt at using the bow as scissors to attempt to pierce its body. And so what does the fish balloon monster do? <laughs> But that's not so bad compared to the fish balloon monster literally shaking a building full of people, causing them to fall out of windows and plummet to their deaths because the Powerpuff Girls are too restricted within the dynamo to be able to rescue them in time. This moment in particular has always stuck with me, more so than the blimp scene, although both are incredibly dark fates for these poor victims to meet. Apparently, in my experience, this detail isn't even ever noticed because I've had to point this out to a ton of people about this shot with the people falling out of the building as it's something I've never really seen anybody ever talk about. And that's probably just because of how brief of a moment it is. It lasts for maybe a second and a half, if that, so you're not likely to notice it at first. But now that I've pointed it out for you, you're never going to unsee it. Dynamo also contains a super memorable moment that most diehard Powerpuff fans would instantly recognize in the form of the talking dog advertisement. It's good. It's good. It's good. <laughs> Talking Dog has appeared in several episodes before this that we've already been over, but this is pretty much his most recognizable role in the entire series' run, so I wanted to bring it up. Another moment from this whole battle is when the girls enter the missile sequence. It's this absolutely insane, like, 20 second long moment of the Dynamo setting up all of these missiles in this over-the-top build-up sequence that actually just leads me to draw major parallels to Samurai Jack. Again, I said this fight has Gendy written all over it, and this is the clear-cut case, because the way the shots are edited are very fast, the sound effects are timed to match these rapid cuts, the camera angles are frantically swapping from here to there to there to there, sometimes the same portions of the body are repeated from different angles, it's almost like peering into the beginnings of a style and method that Gendy was working on at the time before fully utilizing it in Samurai Jack. Also, that dun-dun jingle to end off the sequence is great as well, but that's still not even the best part. That was all just build-up. The payoff is even better. Because they all miss. Even in the most climactic, action-heavy battles, the show still finds a way to make it silly and over the top. The fish balloon monster's face is like that realization of, oh my god. And then after it's over, he's just like, that's it? Really? And this ties into a subtle detail that I love that the show never really makes a point to acknowledge, but if you pay attention, you'll see it's abundantly in plain sight. Every single action or maneuver taken by Dynamo results in the city being destroyed, sometimes even more so than what the monster does on its own. You got the time where Dynamo enters safety mode because the professor didn't turn it off. I was worried. Love that line, by the way, which results in all these buildings getting smashed. When it jumps and strikes a pose against the monster, the monster doesn't destroy any buildings, but Dynamo does. The bow scissor sequence is another great one where the pigtails become these giant spinners that just take out an entire city street's buildings on both sides. And then of course that missile sequence just eviscerating everything except for the threat itself. Yeah, I mean, I love this episode, but I totally could see parents back then watching this and thinking that all cartoons are mindless violence, because at the end of the day, there is a lot of violence in this episode, and I'm never gonna deny that. But, it's so masterfully well-crafted in such an exciting way that, again, it's all spectacle, and sometimes that's all an audience is looking for. The sheer number of explosions in this episode are through the roof, probably more so than any other episode of the series. And honestly, uh-oh Dynamo, does Michael Bay better than Michael Bay? In the end though, Dynamo does end up beating the fish balloon by piercing its lip with the stars from the bowling alley, sending it into a deflating spiral where it ultimately lands on, of all places, Mount Rushmore. So even that iconic United States landmark found a way to be brought back here in the final act after having been established at the very start of the episode. And to celebrate, Dynamo does this little victory dance, almost like one you'd see out of a video game. And then the episode ends with the mayor giving his concluding thoughts on the battle. Thank you for destroying that evil giant fish balloon, but you also destroyed my beautiful city! Never use that, that, monstrosity again! Yeah! 
Yep, and like I said, if you paid attention to everything Dynamo was doing throughout the action sequences, you can see exactly why the mayor would be so frustrated. It's actually quite a serious moment for the mayor in all honesty. You seldom ever see him get this seriously upset about something, but given this context and the fact that he does take his job seriously, I think that just makes his stance here that much more meaningful towards the severity of the issue. And this all ties back into the title again. Uh-oh, Dynamo. You know, it makes perfect sense. But with that, that ends off the final episode of Season 1. Holy cow, I can't believe we made it. Well, admittedly, looking at the final runtime, this video ended up going on longer than I had initially anticipated, but hey, I guess I can't really help myself when it comes to talking about the greatest animated series of all time. That being said, while I don't really want to rank all of the episodes in a particular order or anything, I do at least want to highlight my absolute favorites again for one final round of recommendations here. So, not in terms of favoritism, but in release order, my top favorites of the season would consist of Boogie Frights, Ice Sore, Bubble Vicious, The Bear Facts, Just Another Manic Mojo, Mime for a Change, The Rowdy Rough Boys, and Uh-Oh Dynamo. Noticeably, all of these, except for Boogie Frights, are in the second half of the season. Needless to say, I feel the second half is where the show really figures out its tone and style, although I definitely attribute Boogie Frights and Abracadaver as really being the start of that. Every episode before them, aside from Insect Inside and Powerpuff Bluff, are basically just introductory episodes that set up the villains, whereas the second half is what follows after that setup occurs, which really allowed the team to start exploring some unique ideas instead of having to build up the foundation, you know? And the best part is that this is only the beginning. The next three seasons that follow season one are all seasons I greatly enjoy, and I cannot wait to dive into them. So that being said, logically, season two is the next season to come, and I hope you're all looking forward to it when it does. As always, feel free to share your thoughts on which episodes of this season are your personal favorites, and your thoughts on my video as a whole. If there's anything you feel I could do better, feel free to point it out in a comment below. My goal with this series of videos isn't just to praise the show, but to reinvigorate interest and hopefully provide some new insight on a lot of the episodes of the series. I feel that the Powerpuff Girls, while fondly remembered, is underappreciated in a lot of ways, and I hope this video helped people come to appreciate new things about the show they hadn't really noticed before. Of course, I don't ever expect everyone to agree with my stance on every single episode. As I explained in the beginning, that's just basically impossible, but disagreements can totally be harbored correctly if they're maintained within a healthy discussion. Out of everything that exists, Powerpuff Girls has, and always will be, number one in my eyes. And now, after many years, I finally achieved a dream I've had ever since I came up with the idea all the way back in 2013. I've begun reviewing every single episode of the Powerpuff Girls and sharing my love for the franchise with the world. As a final note, I just want to say thank you very much for watching this far, since I know this would have been a huge time sink if you watched the whole thing from beginning to end, but I sincerely appreciate it. At the end of the day, I'm just one guy making these videos as a hobby, and so any joy that I can bring to the lives of others as a result of that is all I can really ask for. That being said, I'll wrap things up here. So with that said, thank you all for watching, and until next time, Shadow Streak signing off. So once again, the day is saved, then destroyed, thanks to the Powerpuff Girls. Well, actually the professor, just because you're a genius doesn't make you a smart guy.